cameras start their cameras. And microphone check. Great. We are, Judy Clark is ready? Ready. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon and welcome to the 12.30 p.m. public portion of the closed session of the May 10th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. And please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or your streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Present. Golder. Present. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruno. Present. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda? If you're attending virtually, please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or select the raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. If you are in person, you can line up to the right of the dais and uh, sign in at the front there. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement. You have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to three minutes and you may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. Let me go out to our virtual attendees in this hybrid format here. Okay, we have, I'm not seeing any hands raised in our virtual attendee list. Are there any members of the public here in person that would like to speak to any closed session items? Okay. Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned and council will now go into its closed session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to our 2 p.m. session of the May 10th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Currently absent. Um, Cummings? Here. Brown? Currently absent. Myers? Present. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. Oh. Oh. Anybody? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And Mayor Bruner. <laughs> Present. Thank you. We will begin today's agenda with presentations. And our first agenda item is a mayoral proclamation declaring May 15th through May 21st as National Public Works Week. I'd like to invite our public's work, public work staff to come to the podium, please. May, uh, welcome. Can you introduce yourselves? Yes, hi, Nathan Wen, Assistant Director, City Engineer for the City of Santa Cruz. And up here I have with me uh, APA, APWA uh, board member, uh, Philip Edwards. Welcome, Nathan and Phil. I'll stand up. This is always uh, an annual tradition for the city and um, there's also a currently a, a tour of construction sites that one can sign up for. There's information on the City of Santa Cruz website. Let's see if everyone can see me okay as I stand up. All right, here we go. Uh, whereas, 
public works staff keeps the city of Santa Cruz strong by providing an infrastructure of services and engineering design and construction supervision, traffic engineering and maintenance, infrastructure and fleet operations, resource recovery operations, wastewater system operations, flood control, stormwater management, environmental compliance, and parking management. The focus, whereas the focus on infrastructure, infrastructure facilities and services is of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Santa Cruz. And whereas these services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of the City of Santa Cruz Public Works team who provide essential services and thus continue to work hard each and every day to keep our community functioning. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz Public Works staff are always ready to serve and are resilient in completing their work even when encountering additional challenges created by the impacts of the pandemic. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department continues to be recognized as a regional leader in innovative and forward-thinking services and projects that include energy efficiency and sustainability, active transportation, infrastructure, wastewater treatment, water reuse, waste reduction, and environmental compliance. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Santa Cruz to gain knowledge of and maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs. And whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week, sponsored by the American Public Works Association, and this year themed ready and resilient, honoring the professionals who perform regular public works duties and are ready at a moment's notice to react as first responders during national disasters and overcome trials seen in the field. Now, therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, the mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 15th through 21st, 2022, as National Public Works Week in the city of Santa Cruz, and I urge all citizens to join me in celebrating our public works superheroes and recognizing their substantial contributions in protecting our health, safety, and quality of life that help to make the city of Santa Cruz such a great place in which to live and work. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you want to add anything regarding construction site tours? Yes. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, and thank you, uh, Public, for recognizing Public Works and uh, all that we do. So we really do appreciate that. Uh, next week, we do have some construction tours that are happening next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So up on the screen right there. Um, uh, next Tuesday, uh, on West Cliff Drive, we have a storm uh, repair project uh, tour. So please come out. And uh, the following Wednesday there, we have Highway 19 project, and on Thursday, we have the Trevathan Storm Drain Project. So uh, we welcome the community and, and the public and all council members to, to join us. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Congratulations. Next on our agenda is an update on the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project, and I'd like to welcome Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, members of the City Council. I have with me today, Abe Jason, um, with Jason Architecture, and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Abe in just a second to kick off the presentation, and then he'll turn it back to me briefly to talk about the sources and uses specifically for the library budget and sort of component of the project. 
but Abe's going to kick it off and he's going to give you an update and overview of the recent community outreach meeting on the schematic design phase and um, and just sort of an overview of a summary of that presentation and then some of the survey feedback that we received from that as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Abe. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, it's great to see each of you again. Thank you for having us here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get this presentation queued up. So uh, it's great to be here again uh, with me here tonight, uh, uh, or this could be this afternoon, is uh, Katie Stewart, uh, project manager for Jason Architecture. Uh, Yolan, Yolan Wilburn uh, is the library director, and then Bonnie Lipscomb will be participating in the presentation who you just heard from. We have uh, three components of the presentation. Uh, we're gonna present to you the schematic design update the community feedback we received on that schematic design, and then Bonnie and I will uh, uh, update you on budget and schedule. This is a uh, summary version of the presentation we gave to the community recently. Uh, so if you are looking for more information, that presentation is on the city's website, uh, both the slide deck as well as the recording. So, Diving into the schematic design, I'm going to first orient everyone via the bird's eye view, the site plan. You can see here uh, the, the project site, which you're all familiar with, uh, bordered by Cathcart, Lincoln, and Cedar Streets. I'm not going to go into a, a deep dive on each of these items, but I'll point out a couple key things. Uh, number one, off Cedar Street, that's the primary entry into the library, and the library is uh, primarily fronted on Cedar Street. Number five off, off Cathcart is the automobile entry to the parking garage. Number eight is the solar panels that uh, power this zero net energy library. Number nine is the large living roof on the, on the top of the library. And number six is the library patio and roof deck. Now we're gonna go down to the first floor. The uh, two primary entries to the building, number one off, off Cedar Street, and then number three off the parking garage, bring you into the lobby. The lobby is indicated in orange and has adjacencies to the restrooms, the main stair, the elevator, uh, self-check, the information desk, and other uh, kind of primary access uses. In blue, you can see the public meeting space the large room on the right is the large community meeting room, which will be available uh, for public use after hours. The uh, medium-sized room on the left is the multi-purpose room. So this is a room that could be used for story time events, art classes, and other types of activities. In yellow is the children's area. The children's area has a prominent location on the corner of Lincoln and Cedar Street and ample daylight because of that corner location. And uh, in green is the staff area, uh, which also has access to a nice large window off Cedar Street. Moving upstairs, you can see uh, the kind of large end, uh, opening between the floors uh, that brings daylight down to the ground level and the lobby, that's number two and then the main stair between the floors, that's number one. This level is primarily the uh, adult collections and lounge areas, the fiction and nonfiction, um, and other types of collections. Uh, I'll point out a couple things in particular. In blue, you can see the small group study rooms uh, immediately uh, off the main stair. In yellow is the teen area, which is a, a dedicated area surrounded by a glass wall. And then we also have the life literacies, which is number nine. That's an area for lifelong learning and a variety of programming activities. And then number 12 on the right is the local history and genealogy collection. That's a dedicated room surrounded by a glass wall. And that's a really wonderful, unique collection that the library has. Moving up to the top level, uh, the number 13 is the stair that takes you up to the mezzanine. 
So now up at the mezzanine level, what you can see here is the uh, kind of adult uh, collection and, lo and lounge seating in orange. That's the mezzanine level. This mezzanine looks out over number four, which is an opening to the grand reading room below. And it also looks out across the living roof, which is number 10. So it's actually the same at the same height as the living roof. And then has immediate access to the outdoor roof deck and patio, which is indicated in orange. A couple other little fun features on this level. We are thinking that there would be an area for uh, local art, a gallery space, that's number five. And then the library has had a piano uh, donated to it. Uh, they have a program called uh, Munching with Mozart that would continue. Uh, worth noting that piano will be locked so uh, kids can't get up there and bang on it at any time. <laughs> So kind of zooming out uh, to speak about the sustainability goals for this project. The, uh, the city has set some really uh, wonderful sustainability targets. First, the, the project will be all electric. So there will be no natural gas or fossil fuel type energy going to this project. Second, it will be powered by solar energy on the roof of the library and the affordable housing. And those two combined will allow it to be a zero net energy library. That means the library will produce the same amount of energy it consumes over the course of a year. It will also have a large living roof, a green roof, and uh, that's a, a wonderful feature that serves uh, several functions. It helps mitigate uh, stormwater flow. Uh, it really uh, uh, improves and uh, reduces the urban heat island effect from uh, kind of surface uh, paving and uh, kind of other roofs. And then also it's an opportunity for a kind of massive native habitat in downtown Santa Cruz. Lastly, there is uh, ample daylight through the building, uh, through large windows that uh, front on the street. And th this kind of ample daylighting will really reduce the dependence on artificial light during the daytime, which is a major contributor to the energy use of a building. In terms of the design approach to this project, as you remember, we have taken inspiration from the natural beauty of Santa Cruz. In particular, the cliffs of West Cliff and Wilder Ranch and the geological striations of these cliffs that are topped by uh, greenery and plants kind of spilling over the edge. We've also taken inspiration from the textural qualities of the ocean we have a very simple material palette, three materials. Wood, and in this case, we're looking at pre-weathering the wood so it has a driftwood-like quality, and then applying it in uh, different textural applications. Glass, and we're thinking about glass, uh, you know, with a textural quality as well, uh, taking inspiration from those images of the surface of the ocean. And then you wouldn't typically think of it as material, but in this case, planting is actually one of the materials of this building because we have such a significant living roof that it actually becomes a part of the aesthetic and the facade of the building. Our first view is from Cedar and Lincoln. And what you can see here is how the project really kind of steps gracefully up from the pedestrian level uh, as it moves back towards the affordable housing beyond. There's a nice kind of tiering effect that gives it a, a, a quality of, of human scale. Uh, at the ground level, we have uh, wood uh, siding and wood uh, shading that, that uh, goes over some of the windows and that gives it this really kind of warm, natural quality. And then the second floor has the grand reading room kind of looking out over the street. Uh, we love the idea of the living roof grasses blowing in the wind on a breezy afternoon. Moving around to Cedar and Cathcart, you can see here a couple things. One, we have a dedicated staff entry, so staff is able to ac access the building before and after the public is uh, uh, open. Uh, also, a nice large window for the staff area and ample greenery down at the street level. You can also see how the kind of angles of the building uh, play off the, the daylight and how the sense of the sun moving around the site will create these kind of wonderful plays of light and shadow on the textures and materiality. You can also see us uh, adding texture and character to that glass 
through this ceramic frit pattern that we have on the surface. And once again, you can see how as you move closer to the building, the scale really steps down and uh, you know, the affordable housing is, is visible beyond, but it has a quiet presence in the background. Looking across the street from Cedar, you can see a couple things here. In particular, a large prominent sign drawing your eye and interest to the main entry of the building. We're envisioning this in maybe a bronze or a copper material with a green and rough textural patina to it. So something kind of artistic and really befitting kind of the character of Santa Cruz. You also can see the kind of textural, almost um, kind of filigree-like quality of that ceramic frit on the glass above. And then these sort of peaks of curiosity to draw you into the building, the main stair beyond, some graphic elements inside the main lobby. Stepping in the front door, you can see the impact immediately of that opening between floors and that Clara story above. The fact that your eye immediately goes up, it really has a civic uh, scale. There's also easy visual orientation within this main lobby space. Uh, the information desk, the elevator, uh, clear access to the garage beyond, as well as understanding about how to get to the upper level. There's new books. Uh, this could be a new books collection, popular titles, potentially staff picks, and uh, you know, sort of, again, clear visual orientation about how you navigate the space. For the children's area, we have taken inspiration from the idea of a fallen coast redwood within the forest and the idea that this, this uh, hollowed out tree is occupied by gnomes and fairies and maybe some small children. And so we've created an element in the children's area that kind of mimics that a little bit. The idea of the tree canopy above uh, with these acoustic light fixtures that uh, add some color and add some warmth but also add a little mystery to the space. And then uh, within these uh, kind of little fun little discovery zones, as we're calling them, uh, sort of toadstool-like seating and then cutouts of native species. In this case, we're showing a bobcat, a banana slug, a fox, and a coyote. Moving up to the second floor, uh, the grand reading room, you can see kind of this wonderful scale, the amount of daylight in this space, and also the really clear visual orientation as you come to the top of the stairs the local history and genealogy room beyond, the mezzanine straight ahead and the stair to the mezzanine, uh, a clear navigation directory. Working on libraries, we know it's really important to have a variety of different types of spaces, those big grand spaces as well as the more intimate ones. We like to have spaces for two to four people to gather, have a conversation, a small study group, read a book, but we also need individual spaces, individual study carols that uh, have some acoustic properties, but are also supervisable by staff and have access to technology, as you can see on the left here. Moving up to the mezzanine, uh, a couple really wonderful things about this view. One, you can see how the view down over the grand reading room below is this wonderful perch. And then the idea that you are actually standing at the same level as the living roof, so you're looking out on a native meadow beyond. Uh, we love the idea of sitting in one of these chairs and watching a butterfly go by or a, a bee buzz along looking for a pollinator. Also note that we're looking at a uh, reclaimed wood floor uh, to give it something of a, a boardwalk feel up here, uh, something that feels a little rough and worn and well-loved already. Uh, so it's not too new and shiny. It has a little bit of character to it. From the mezzanine, you can walk outside to the roof deck, and the roof deck patio has two distinct areas. On the right, you can see the shaded area, and in this case, we've got uh, cafe lights strung up above, and you can see how that could be a really wonderful place to host an event in the evening. And then on the left, we have uh, the open area. This is the spot for the sun bums out there who really like to soak in the rays. And you can see that uh, we have planters that are big enough to support some lush planting as well as some small trees. And then this uh, roof deck looks out over the living roof beyond and to the Santa Cruz Mountains in the distance. So this is just gonna be a really wonderful place to hang out, read a book, socialize, or maybe even host an event. So we, we reached out to the community for feedback uh, about a week or two ago. We asked four questions of the community in survey form. 
The first question, number one, was about the use and functionality of the building. So how would you use it? The second one was about appearance, design, aesthetics. How does it look? Does it, does it kind of meet your image of a library? The third was about sustainability. And the fourth was really an open-ended opportunity to receive feedback about questions that they still had for us. There were a couple key themes that came out of these survey responses. We uh, heard that you know, there's a lot of excitement about the diversity of use within the building, but in particular, there are two spaces that we were repeatedly heard enthusiasm for, and that was the study rooms and the roof deck. Regarding appearance, uh, we, we did hear uh, that there was appreciation for the abundance of daylight and the contemporary design. And regarding sustainability, although there were comments kind of about appreciation for many of the aspects of uh, green design, in particular, zero net energy was the most cited uh, uh, target that people were inspired by. And then lastly, uh, we got a variety of questions, but the, the two questions that we did see repeated were some variation of when does it open and how can I help? So that was really uh, inspiring to see that people took away a real enthusiasm and an excitement about the project. We also received some constructive feedback uh, regarding specific design features. Uh, in, uh, in particular, we had some questions about afternoon glare. It's a totally reasonable question. The building faces west. Uh, as any of you who have a west-facing window in your home know, uh, that you need to draw shade or deal with that west-facing uh, uh, sun in the in the late afternoon. So in this case, uh, we would have motorized shades that would run the entire length of all the windows, and with a click of a button, the shades could be dropped. We got questions about green roof maintenance. That's another valid question when you have a large living roof. And in this case, this is not like a rose garden on a roof uh, that needs lots of tending. This is really more akin to an open meadow. So it's a native and uh, drought tolerant uh, planting strategy that will need minimal maintenance. And then lastly, we did receive uh, lots of comments and questions about collections. Um, they, they varied widely, um, but generally uh, it expressed an interest in uh, how kind of books will be displayed to the community and the types of uh, books they can access. And while we're not at a point in the process where we have a specific layout and specific information about that, we are working actively with the library uh, to create a collection that really best serves the public. So with that, we're gonna transition to talk about budget and schedule. Uh, Bonnie, I'm gonna hand it off to you for these this first slide here, okay? Thanks, Abe. Um, so just as a way of overview again, and just putting this in context to some of our past updates, um, the update that we're going to go into detail with you today on the budget, and then Abe's gonna go a little more into uh, the latest cost estimate are based on schematic design. So our earlier cost estimates were on conceptual design, and then prior to that were based on the renovation um, model versus a new model back in 2019. So those, those cost estimates were dated, and Abe's gonna go into that in a little more detail. I think what you see today and what I'm excited about is that where we are right now is the, you know, a 21st century library that from our perspective and the feedback that we've received from the community engagement thus far, it really exceeds the expectations for what the majority of our community were expecting um, for a new design um, and a new library in the downtown. So we're excited about that. Um, we're excited particularly also about some of the sustainability features of the project. Um, this delivers a sustainable resource that um, will serve our community for decades to come. So we're really proud of the work that adjacent architecture has done to date and really feel like this is a library that time and time again during the feedback we heard, we want something that people come to Santa Cruz and they go downtown and they go to the library as part of this like special special elements and trips that they go to Santa Cruz other than just the beach, you know, and some of the, the iconic things that we're known for um, in our community. So this, um, this is where we are today, the schematic design. We still will have one more cost estimate. Actually, we'll probably have several, but we'll have another one in the design development phase. So this will 
continue to be to evolve as we go forward. But I will say that the estimate we have today is the most realistic estimate um, so thus far. And just to clarify what's different from the earlier estimates and the one that we provided, which was just a very um, basic overview of sources and uses last December, um, this estimate today does include the full cost of delivering the library portion of the project. The soft costs, which are typically um, roughly 30 to 35 percent of the budget, are included as well as the project contingency, as well as the furniture for uh, furniture and equipment, um, fixtures, furniture, and equipment, which I had not included in the previous update, was, which was based largely just on construction aspect of the library. Um, overall, the schematic design of the library has evolved and is now approximately 3,000 square feet larger than the conceptual design. So as Abe mentioned earlier, it's now roughly 38,000 square feet. While this does come at an additional overall, um, additional overall cost, we are recommending at this time keeping the larger building in the project as we move forward and we um, move forward on securing additional funding sources for the project. Um, as I mentioned, estimates on costs and sources are still evolving. They'll continue to be further refined as we go forward. It is easier to secure funding overall, both on the library side of the project and on the project, and particularly is true for the housing component of the project. When the project gets closer to being entitled, what is considered shovel ready? Many of the grant opportunities, we need to have the project entitled to have our permits um, in order to apply for many of our funding sources. So this is a snapshot in time and we will be working with the overall project team um, to continue to refine these um, numbers as we go forward. Okay, so jumping into the project sources and uses. Um, on the, I'm gonna go through the left-hand side first. Um, our first source is the Measure S funding, and I specifically want to note, we originally had 27 million um, earmarked for the downtown branch. Um, we did go to council, um, earlier and allocate 1.5 million to the completion of the Garfield and Branson 40 branches. Those projects um, are still in sort of the wrap up phase um, of their budget. We are anticipating um, and with the most recent update having at least 500,000 that is likely to return to this project budget. I'm not showing that at this point because I wanna make sure that's all wrapped up. Um, but our construction manager for the overall project is, is making that estimate at this time. It's actually a little bit larger than that. So I'm anticipating we'll probably have closer to 26 million of Measure S funding. Um, the second funding source that we are anticipating at this time is the Building Ford California State Library grant. As, as you are all aware, and we've reported in past updates to council, we did submit um, we had a really quick turnaround, uh, uh, basically a month um, from when they issued the app, uh, opened the application and when the project, the actual application had to be submitted. But we did submit for a full ask of $10 million for the project. Um, we expect to hear later this spring or early summer on this. Um, we do believe based on feedback that we are a really good fit for this grant and that our application is very competitive. Um, we're also anticipating roughly a $2 million um, funding source contribution from fundraising efforts of the Friends, Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Library. Um, this is primarily for the uh, fixtures, furniture, and equipment, and this is something that has been an ongoing sort of placeholder in the budget. So that gets us to roughly $37,500,000 or $38 million if you include the additional five hundred dollars in Measure S funding. So we do have a gap. We have a gap of anywhere from roughly between two and two and a half million based on our current sources that we're identifying for the library portion. Um, we also have a few alternates. We've looked at the budget and there are two elements of the project that could be added. Um, we wanna add them right at the beginning, but if we needed to, we could add them a little bit later. They could be phased and that includes um, the um, zero net energy, the photovoltaic system for the library, as well as some of the roof deck patio tenant improvements, you know, the planter boxes, the lighting, um, some of the landscaping and irrigation for the roof deck could come at a later time if needed. And so those additional cost um, is uh, roughly uh, two, two and a half million. Um, so we do have identified some gap sources for the library. This includes some of our major affordable housing funding sources and grants, including the ASIC, which is the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Grant, 
IIG, which is the infill and infrastructure grant and our EPIC grant for some of the electric sustainability components of the project. We have received all three of these grants for our other uh, mixed use affordable housing projects in the downtown. And we do believe that we would be equally competitive for this project due both to the proximity to transit, the mixed use elements of the project and some of the sustainability features. So um, in talking with Eden Housing and for the future housing, um, they're both feeling very, very good about our ability to secure additional funding for the project. And that is part of their, their um, anticipated funding sources. So there will hopefully be some additional funding sources that could help close this gap. On the project uses side, um, I'm going to briefly go over this, and but Abe is going to really go into some of the detail and the cost estimate. I just kind of want to break that out of what is the budget for the library. The shell and core is what the developer is delivering as part of the overall project of the library. That's roughly the hard, hard construction cost of that is about 8.3 million. The tenant improvements, the TIs um, for the library itself, those are all the interior finishes, you know, the mechanics, everything inside the library is roughly 24 million. Um, and then the soft costs and uh, some of these um, sources uh, specifically as we look on the soft costs include all the pre-development work. Um, it includes architectural design, um, ff &E, and a contingency for the tenant improvements are anticipated roughly to be the 7.6 million, which gets us to that base library cost of 39.9, um, the alternates I already mentioned. So the total of everything we'd like to deliver on for a 38,000 square foot building is roughly 42 million. Um, we, I just briefly want to mention before turning it back to Abe that some of our gap strategies um, beyond the grants, and I have a footnote on the bottom of the slide, in addition to fundraising um, and value engineering is ultimately if we're not successful securing uh, any of the anticipated grant sources or even the building forward grant, um, we could come back to you with some value engineering. There are some very high end finishes in the library. We really like them and don't want to eliminate them at this point. Um, but if we're in that position where we need to reduce the overall budget, we will come back to you um, with some options as well as ultimately decreasing the size of the library. As I said, it's a 38,000, a little over 38,000 for the interior space of the library plus the roof deck. So there are some options there as well. And with that, I will turn it back to Abe to go into more detail on the cost estimate. Thanks, Bonnie. All right, so I think it's always good to put an estimate into, com into context. And that's really what this slide is for. So I'm gonna kind of orient everyone to the slide before I walk through the details. So on the left, the numbered column, these are basically the cost components of the project. On the top, you can see there's five columns. Each of these columns represents kind of essentially a budget unto itself, a, a budget scenario. And we have, I'll, I'll list out each of these five and then explain what they are. The first is the 2019 renovation study that was our renovation study that we prepared on the existing building. The second is the renovation study, which has been escalated to a current construction date based on new timing and includes the cost of a temporary library, which would be required because the library would be taken offline. The third is the mixed use project that we are currently working on, that's the base. The fourth column is the mixed use project with alternates. And then for context, we have a comparable ground up if you just built a, a project from scratch. Okay, now I'm gonna kind of walk through each piece of these. So first, uh, what I'm, I'll, I'll first kind of briefly say on the renovation study as a, as a reminder, um, you know, when we go into kind of a process like that, our goal is to get the best possible project we can get for the budget. And as you probably recall, what we found after going through that study is that to kind of work within the budget at the time, we had to take off, remove nearly 25% of the building and bring it down to 30,000 square feet. And even then, as was kind of outlined in our uh, uh, executive summary, we were delivering a low quality building. We then had a series of alternates, which brought it up to a moderate quality building. 
So those series of alternates, uh, things like ceilings, acoustics, um, you know, graphics, exterior planting and landscaping, uh, all those things are included in the mixed use project. We have ceilings, we have acoustics, et cetera, et cetera. So the best point of comparison is the base plus alternates of the study. Now the study was done in 2019. It assumed that uh, there would be a uh, sort of relatively quicker transition to starting construction. Uh, that's no longer accurate, so we need to add escalation into that renovation study. In addition, uh, to make the renovation work, the main downtown library would have to come offline for several years. That's not really feasible for the kind of hub of the system, so you need to provide a temporary library space. So I'm going to kind of walk through the renovation study in 2019, and then I'll walk through each column after that. So as a reminder, uh, 30,000 square feet, hard cost of about 23 million. Because it's a renovation and the nature of the project, the, the soft cost percentage is high. It's about 49%. And this is what uh, our study showed at the time. So about $11 million in soft costs uh, for a total construction hard plus soft of about 34 million. And uh, you can reference our study that 34,295, that's exactly the number in our study. At the time, temporary library costs were not established. Corn shell costs would be included. So that has a total project cost, again, of about $34 million and a cost per square foot of about $1,100 a square foot. Now, to kind of bring it into kind of a full budgetary picture as a point of comparison, we have to add escalation in the temporary library. So what you can see is the escalation raises the construction hard costs to about $26 million and the soft cost to about twelve point five. million, the construction hard plus soft cost to about thirty eight, And then we've estimated the cost of a temporary library, which is the cost of building out a temporary library space at a very basic level, so carpet, paint, ADA, code required ADA upgrades as necessary, basic telephone data, um, and internet infrastructure. That would, that would mean saving all of the furniture, all of the shelving, um, very, very minimal code compliant low quality. Also a much smaller building, so this would be a, about a 10 or 11,000 square foot uh, facility, uh, is about 2 million. And that also includes the lease costs at a, at a rate that we discussed uh, kind of is appropriate for downtown Santa Cruz on a monthly basis based on that square footage. That brings the total project cost of the renovation to in the range of 40.5 uh, million and a cost per square foot of about $1,300 a square foot. So the mixed use project now, a couple things to point out. It's a 38,000 square foot building, so 8,000 square feet more. The construction hard costs are a little bit lower, about 24 million versus 26 million. And the other big kind of thing to note is that because of the efficiencies of the mixed use project, the soft costs are significantly lower, about 32%. And that's about uh, 7.6, 7.7 million. So the construction hard costs are, hard plus soft costs are about uh, 31.7. Temporary library is not required. However, we do have to uh, include the cost of the corn shell for the overall mixed use project. So that's about 8.3 million. So what you can see that the, is the total project cost of the mixed use project is just under $40 million. And the big thing to note is the cost per square foot is significantly lower at about $1,000 a square foot. So you're getting a kind of an immense bang for your buck with the economy of scale and efficiency of the mixed use project. So moving over to the next column, I'll go through this one a little quicker. This is the mixed use project with the alternates included. It raises the total project cost, as you saw on the previous slide that Bonnie shared, to about 42.5 million and raises the cost per square foot to about $1,100 a square foot. Still an incredibly good deal. The last thing which I think really emphasizes kind of how good of a deal this is, is we did run a cost model on a comparable ground up project. And what you can see here for a 38,000 ground, ground up project, 38,000 square feet, you'd be talking about a $50 million hard cost, give or take, and a total project cost 
of close to $70 million and nearly $1,800 a square foot. And this includes escalation to, uh, you know, the, the current construction schedule. Um, so I think, you know, that's a demonstration of kind of the fact that the mixed-use project is effectively a new building and the comparison of the ground up new building really shows the efficiency of kind of coupling this with other project components. Can I pause you real quick? Oh yeah, please. Yeah, um, sorry. I have a request if we can move the the panel there uh, the on the screen so that it's not covering the last column. Thank you. Panel. Um, Thank you. We're good. Okay, sorry. Apologies. Can everyone see now uh, there? Yes, thank you. Okay. So only one last point on the slide. I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A portion of, of this uh, presentation. The, one of the things you'll note, uh, you can see the little uh, cross symbol next to the renovation total project cost, uh, line eight and the ground up. Um, those costs do not include the encumbered costs of money spent to date or through the end of 2022. Now, while the, those aren't really attributable to, to a ground up project or a renovation, the reality is those that cost would have, that encumbered uh, cost would effectively increase the projects by another about $2 million. Okay. I'm gonna uh, just sort of briefly go over the schedule. Uh, you guys are familiar with this. But what you can see here again is the community has put an immense amount of kind of inspirational work into this project. This has effectively been underway since 2012 when a master plan was done for the library system all the way through Measure, measure S and the various studies that the council and the city has done to determine the best path forward. Uh, we are currently in the design and engineering stage. We are now into the design development phase of the process. Um, we will be looking to start construction around the beginning of 2024 and wrap construction around the end of 2026. The last thing I'll note is each of these yellow dots on this line represents a point of community process, community feedback, community workshop, community input. There's been nearly 40 points of community engagement in this process. So it's a pretty inspirational uh, engagement with your constituents and with the community of Santa Cruz. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to questions. Um, so, Bonnie, I don't know if you want to come back online so we can field questions together. Thank you, Abe. Appreciate the update. And to Bonnie Lipscomb, thank you for the visuals and the updates. And uh, it's made quite a bit of progress. I would like to bring it to uh, council members for any questions on the update and any specific. Okay, so uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Well, that was just absolutely beautiful and um, inspiring to see. So thank you for your work. I have a question and I, I think I know the answer, but I just wanna confirm in regards to the childcare facility that's proposed as a component of the mixed use space, is that, in, in, is that encompassed within the work of Eden and the affordable housing uh, contractors? Is that right? Yes, uh, Council Member Watkins. That is part of the overall affordable housing um, component of the project. And um, the developer is pretty excited because um, childcare facilities are actually give them additional points on some of their funding applications. So that definitely is solidly on, on the housing side of the project budget. Okay. Great, thank you, that's what I thought. Yeah, well, very exciting. Thank you. Council Member Myers. Um, I was wondering, uh, speaking to some folks who were out of town, out of towners uh, this weekend who were uh, showing your some of the drawings to, have you done um, work with, actually with like families and kids in terms of your outreach, in terms of, you know, I mean, I, your spaces are beautiful. I'm just curious, you know, did you talk to little guys at all? I'm just, you know, I mean, it just looks like such a cool, fun space. But, I, you know, it's more a, 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 something out of interest than I think that you need to go do that. But I'm just curious if, if you've done outreach or if kids have involved their kids in this or if parents have involved their kids in some of these some of these workshops you've held. Thank you. 
Yeah, we did. Um, uh, if you recall, we had a series of stakeholder meetings, kind of very early in, very early in, in our process, not early in the overall process. Obviously, uh, that process dates farther back, but uh, that would have been fall of last year. And we did have stakeholder groups with families, um, and I would say there were uh, a handful of. Uh, you know, families that actually had their kids. Uh, so if you remember those kind of sticky notes boards mm -hmm. um, from that that stakeholder group, many of the comments actually came directly from kids. Um, I, I think, it, you know, we could discuss with Bonnie, there may be value in kind of another round of outreach. I, it's always tricky in the era of Zoom. So, uh, you know, that's sort of a, a, a layer to the process. But we did do a round of outreach at the early stakeholder phase. We haven't done a round of outreach since the, since the schematic design has been established. Outreach to kids specifically. Okay. And I have one more question. I just remembered. Um, will we be able to, in the soft cost and sort of the building planning, um, be able to accommodate at least you know Spanish as another piece? Uh, you know signage, all of that. Have we thought about that, Bonnie, in terms of trying to make as many spaces as bilingual as possible? I know that's finishers, finishing, but, you know, just curious about whether or not we would be able to do a bilingual approach to community room, signage, those kinds of things. Thank you. I think that, and Abe probably can answer to, to this as well, I believe that's included in a lot of the signage for the building. I know it's on the exterior, but I'm assuming it, uh, based on some conversations, that it's included in the signage um, for the interior spaces as well. Yes, that's correct. And it's actually in the hard cost of the building rather than the soft costs. Oh, it is Hartford. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for the presentation. I'm so excited to go and use this space in a couple of years. Um, just to pick up the thread that Council Member Myers was bringing up around youth. Um, Feedback: we, The city is now working very closely with Youth Action Network, and we'll have um, youth liaison as part of our efforts with the Children and Youth Bill of Rights. So, uh, when it's appropriate, I'd love to connect the project to the youth liaison that we're working with. Thank you, Councilmember um, Kalantari Johnson. That's great. I will say we had a specific, you know, family and focus group for family and children. We did have a hard time getting specific children to sign up for that focus group. We were more successful with the family focus group. So yeah, any targeted approach, and particularly if you have an ability to get them at the table with us, we welcome it. So thank you. Thank you. I was able to pop into one of those focus groups, family focus groups, and it was um, very, very sweet to hear the comments from the children and their imagination from swinging ropes from the ceiling to you know tree houses and all kinds of suggestions so um, thank you and the teens as well I know that was also um, part of the, the outreach uh, council member Cummings thank you mayor thank you for that presentation um, I had a number of people reaching out to me with questions, some of which were answered in the presentation, um, so thank you. Um, but I did want to ask um, a number of other outstanding questions. One, <clears throat> um, just for clarification, so this is going to be one building uh, instead of two. I know initially the parking was going to be separate, I believe, and so I'm just wondering if you could clarify that this is going to be one entire structure or is this going to be multiple structures on the site? Um, I, I can start that answer, and then maybe Abe, you can you can add to this. But um, it is a it's one project, and there are many of the elements of the project that have a shared elements to it. So shared foundation, shared shell and core for the the majority of the project. Um, we also have um, the um, podiums and utility connections are shared across the project. Um, and then additionally, we're still working through um, the library sort of site plan as it relates to the parking. There may be an element of the um, mechanical for the library that actually sits in what we originally were expecting to be the parking structure. So it's definitely a very fluid um, on design and some of the elements, but it is, there is, it's not two separate buildings by, by any means. Thank you. And then I know, it, I don't know if it was the last time, but one of the previous meetings we had, <clears throat> the heritage trees came up. And so has there been any effort made to either alter the building to accommodate any of the heritage trees 
in accordance with the city's heritage tree ordinance or incorporating those into you know some of those green spaces um, I will say we still have the arborist um, report and analysis underway um, and Abe can specifically respond to the overall design. Obviously with us maximizing every square foot of the overall site, it would be hard to accommodate any of those interior trees in the project successfully and certainly not um, cost efficiently. Um, there are some of the perimeter trees that may still be um, a, a possibility uh, but uh, definitely the interior trees, you, you cannot accommodate those in the existing design, not at a reasonable cost, not actually at delivering the library and the overall project as envisioned. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Abe to really, uh, you know, specifically look at them. Yeah, I, I, as Bonnie's described, uh, that is kind of, you know, a appropriate framing. And I think what we are trying to be very thoughtful of is that we want the site to feel alive and green. And so uh, we have more trees planted on the site than currently exist as part of the proposed plan. And I will say some of that, it speaks to the overall project, which is uh, sort of, Bonnie can certainly elaborate on the, the mixed use project rather than the library specifically. But then in addition to that, there will be trees on the uh, roof deck and then we have this living roof, which is uh, nearly 12,000 square feet of native habitat on the roof. So uh, we are, I think, giving back, uh, you know, sort of in a significant way to habitat and green space. And then just to follow up with the living roof, um, some of what the discussions that I've had, because I've, this has come up at previous meetings, and there were some head nods with consideration for uh, the living roof to be used instead of as kind of native grasses, but for growing food. And I'm just wondering if there can be any discussion or explanation as to why that might not be in consideration right now, because uh, perennial grasses can be expensive and they do require some maintenance for establishing, having worked in community gardening for multiple years. It's not, you know, just planted in and it's going to take care of itself. There's a lot of maintenance to getting those grasses to establish. They can be heavy. And this would be an opportunity for people to grow their own food if we're going to have low-income housing. Um, we could offer classes on nutrition, which would address food insecurity um, and educational opportunities. People from the buildings could actually, or people who had access to those gardens could maintain them to help with maintenance. And it would still reduce the overall heat island effect. And so I'm wondering, if, the, and, that, and that's something that fits within health and all policies for the city. And also, you know, if we're talking about, you know, applying for grants that address poverty, that's something that could be an additional benefit as well in addition to child care. So I'm wondering if there is that opportunity and kind of, um, you know, what the opportunities are for us to explore that as an option. It seems like a good fit. I'll speak to you briefly then, Bonnie. I think there's an overlay with the kind of overall project. Um, I think it's a really wonderful idea, council member. Um, I think the, the more likely location where there is uh, sort of a place for that could potentially be in the significant residential roof deck, which we didn't really speak to, but you saw on the site plan, there's, uh, you know, sort of as we've got about 3,500 square feet of library roof deck, um, and then there is significantly more area dedicated to residential uses. Um, and there's certainly room for community garden type space there. And Bonnie, I don't know what types of conversations you've had with Eden or for the future regarding that. Uh, that is something we've talked about and it, and you had given us that feedback before as well. And that did resonate in some of our discussions with the affordable housing team. Um, there are like, I'm gonna call them open space sort of rooms um, envisioned for the, um, the housing podium level. And I believe, and I don't have the number exactly in front of me, but I believe it's close to 16,000 square feet of open space on that level for the housing. And so there's like a community general sort of family open space area. There's the children's and the teens area, you know, some play equipment. And there is some vision that there could be an area where you could have the raised planter beds that could be for, for food um, and different different you know, gardening uses um, for the residents of the housing. So that is something that's been part of the discussion. Yeah, um, a couple other questions. Um, so I'm wondering if, if and when we'll get an update on the kind of parking structure and affordable housing, because some of the questions that I have, and since you know, this is the mixed use project, um, we didn't get this information today. Um, I'm just, the questions that I have 
are related to, you know, what's the cost projection for the affordable housing and the parking. Um, and then, you know, what are the funding sources for those, um, for the parking and affordable housing? What's been secured? What are we still waiting on? So I'm wondering sure. if you can speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah, um, I'll briefly just give a, you know, a, a, a few sort of comments on that at this point. I will say today's update really was focusing on the library because that's where we've been focusing and we had the, the largest number of questions from our last update is those, that's the area where we actually feel like we have a gap. And so we really wanted to do a deep dive and get really firm, as firm as we can in the schematic phase numbers on what those costs are and really work towards what are the sources we have for closing that gap. I'll say for both the parking and the housing, um, you know, those will predominantly be paying, you know, the parking specifically will be um, really based, paying for itself in effect. It's, we have an existing parking district and um, we're anticipating um, either issuing parking revenue bonds where the um, actual debt service is based on the income from the parking district. So even factoring in sort of this, you know, post pandemic environment, um, we've been running numbers and modeling and have started um, conversations um, with our financial consultants that actually issue bonds in this area. We're feeling confident that the parking element of the project will fully be um, affordable and fund and be able to be funded with either parking revenue bonds or um, potentially direct loan financing. You know, as we get a little closer to finalizing the actual parking number, we still have some movement on that. Um, we'll be able to provide more accurate numbers on that, but the full range, um, I think in the last update, we showed around 20 million. So, um, you know, give or take a few million for the cost of the project, um, we have sufficient uh, anticipated debt, debt service to be able to fund that for the parking. So the parking will pay for itself as a component of the project and it will pay for, um, you know, a share of the foundation and all the related costs. The housing, um, and I mentioned this a little earlier, the housing component of the project, the library is really in the lead right now. A lot of our focus has been on the design of the library because that's the most public facing element. The affordable housing, we do have a developer and a developer team. We've submitted a pre-application for that and to planning. And so once we get some of those um, preliminary feedback, we'll be able to refine the housing number. Right now we're sitting at roughly, we think we're gonna be able to maximize the housing. We've definitely gone up to um, current heights and what we can exceed on those and the downtown core and have 124 units. Um, so we're excited by that. So the next step is once we get a little closer to entitlements, we can really then start applying for some of these major uh, affordable housing funding sources. And um, similar to our success on Peck Station South and North, um, some of the grants and funding available will have funding that can also offset some of the costs of the library, which is a major benefit of us being able to apply for these, for these funding sources for the, the housing. So Eden Housing and for the future, you know, at a, at a future update when we have a little more concrete um, numbers a little further along in the design process for those, we'll have both of them um, available um, to council to give an update on kind of what is the overall funding picture. And as, as you know from past projects, it is a complicated layering. You know, sometimes you have eight to 10, sometimes even more funding sources in an affordable housing project. But both of them feel very confident that the housing, um, particularly the nature of the project with the sustainability features and its proximity to transit and the addition of the library is very fundable. So they're feeling really good about where they are at this point in time with the funding. Great, and then uh, my last question, and then I have one comment. Um, so it sounds like based on some communications I've had with community members that uh, this ballot measure put forward by um, Downtown Forward, uh, it sounds like that there's a good chance that it's gonna qualify for the ballot. And so I'm wondering if that passes, how that's gonna impact this project. Because if that goes in the ballot in November, there's gonna be you know, potential consequences if it passes. And so I'm just wondering if th that's been taken into consideration and what that could look like. Well, I think our current direction is a council direction to move forward on the project. So, you know, we are continuing design. We have um, existing contracts with um, Jason Architecture and the developer team is moving forward on their design and application stage. So 
you know, currently we're moving forward on the project. That is the direction that we have. You know, if the um, initiative passes on the ballot in November, obviously, you know, we'll have to regroup and, and come to you. Um, we will have, um, as Abe indicated earlier, there will be a portion of the funding um, for the project that will have been spent on this one um, per our current, our current direction. So we'll have to see where we are at that point with what we spent on the project, what's remaining of both the Measure S funding and the other project elements, um, funding elements um, for the existing library site. Great. And then I guess my last comment would just be, I think it would be great if these slides could go on the mixed-use library webpage so that people can have access to them. So Absolutely. You. Yeah, we put each of the presentations to council, all the updates on our project page. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, just for quick clarification, the ballot measure, I believe, was brought forward by our downtown, our future, um, instead of downtown forward. I know there's uh, several groups that have formed around this library affordable housing project, and um, it's a little confusing to keep track, but um, is that correct that you know of? That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Council Member Golder or Kalantari Johnson, did you have any other questions for? Okay. And Vice Mayor Watkins. I don't necessarily have a question, but just sort of one suggestion to get at um, students or seniors or other special populations. I know during the pandemic in our alternative education programs, students were looking for quiet, safe spaces to to learn, right? And so part of the outreach strategy, you know, I found that works best for special populations is really just going to them. And I know we know somebody here on the council who's got a good uh, <laughs> handful of folks that she could access, but even, um, you know, the senior center and, you know, visiting the teen center or others, um, it, I, sometimes you'll, you'll find more success with their input if you go to them. That's just the only suggestion I have. And happy to help if it's an education group or constituency you're looking for. Great, thank you, Council Member Watkins. Okay, that concludes our update presentation of the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project. Thank you so much, Bonnie Lipscomb and Abe Jason of Jason Architecture uh, for that pr presentation. Uh, thank you so much for incorporating so many beautiful elements and community benefits thus far. I look forward to the next update. All right, next up on our agenda, we have our um, <coughs> brief presentation. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring May 11th through May 17th, 2022, as National Police Week. And I'd like to invite up any of our police staff, Deputy Chief of Police, Jose Garcia, John Bush, and any other officers that are present here in person. Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Welcome today. It was uh, very nice to uh, learn of this week and to put this together. So, whereas the police officers of Santa Cruz have worked unselfishly and with commitment on behalf of the people of this community including intentionally de-escalating violent incidents in spite of personal harm or hazard to themselves. And whereas these officers have safeguarded the lives and property of all in Santa Cruz through community policing and problem solving. And whereas Santa Cruz police officers have consciously worked towards inclusivity and advancements in racial equity by purposely seeking community engagement and updating policies. And whereas by their service 
and their dedicated efforts, these officers have earned the gratitude of the city of Santa Cruz. And whereas in 1962, President John F. Kennedy was authorized by Congress to proclaim May 15th of each year as National Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of all peace officers who have been killed or disabled in the line of duty. And whereas the presidential proclamation also designated that each year the calendar week in which May 15th occurs or precedes shall be proclaimed as National Police Week in recognition of the service given by the officers who day and night uphold public safety in our communities. Now, therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 11th through May 17th, 2022, as National Police Week in the City of Santa Cruz, and I encourage all citizens to observe this week with law enforcement officers, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities have rendered a dedicated service to their communities and proclaim May 15th, 2022 as, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm getting choked up. <coughs> as National Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of those law enforcement officers who through their courageous deeds have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community or have become disabled in the performance of duty. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm humbled. Uh, I'm, I'm certain we're all humbled uh, by the proclamation and your comments. It's important uh, that I tell you, uh, myself and my partner, uh, Deputy Chief, Acting Deputy Chief John Bush, while we are here to accept this, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge the women and men that are out there doing the work, the day and night work that you talk about are taking calls for service now and they can't be here uh, to see this. But they do an important thing, and they work really hard, and, and times are tough. So uh, I think it is, it is very valuable uh, to hear what you have to say, and we'll share this with them. I want to acknowledge a couple of those folks that are here now, uh, Sergeant Mark Eveleth and Sergeant Josh Trog out there supervising uh, during those night shifts that you talk about. They do a, an incredibly tough job and they do it incredibly well and we're grateful. But these are the folks that are most deserving of, of the comments. Uh, you know, John Bush and I are, are just the folks that are here and we're grateful to have the opportunity to give them what they need to get their work done. But thank you so much. Uh, we very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Next item on our agenda, item number six, is scheduled for 4 p.m., Hans Christian Anderson Contest Awards. So we will return to agenda item six at 4 p.m. Moving on to our, through our agenda. This is the part where I'd like to ask council members if there are any statements or disqualifications today. I forgot I was gonna ask Tony about this, just with the circles project and my house, if it's close enough or not. Yeah. To ask, you wanna measure in the next minute? I'm gonna come back to that because I was gonna 
uh, what agenda item is that? Item number 17 is um, getting looked into. Okay. Uh, I, will, so, I will have an answer to that before the consent calendar. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to that item. And um, are there any items of disqualification, statements of? No. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. Um, I don't have any, but the city attorney does have. Thank you, city attorney. Yes, we, we noticed a slight um, inaccuracy in the description of item number 28 concerning district elections. It refers to adoption of a seven district map and an ordinance, whereas the ordinance actually adopts both a six district and a seven district map. It's not a big uh, concern, but out of uh, an abundance of caution, I'm recommending that that be put over to the next meeting uh, for uh, considering final adoption of the ordinance um, and, and district maps. Thank you. Uh, does that require a vote? Uh, the chair can. I can move can that, that to the. Okay, so item number 28 is moved to our next council meeting, I believe, is May 24th. Thank you. At this time, uh, we have a city manager report. I'd like to call on the city manager to see if there are updates and a report. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to provide a brief update. Uh, I believe Elizabeth Smith on my team is going to pull up the presentation. And while she does that, I will also be tag teaming uh, this afternoon's presentation, Rosemary Menard. Our water director uh, will also provide a, a brief update on some recent polling they did of the community related to our securing our water future uh, planning effort. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and jump into it. Next slide, please. So as the council knows, um, our departments collectively have been putting a significant amount of effort um, leading up to the enforcement of our new sidewalk vending uh, regulations. That includes um, a significant amount of outreach over the last several weeks uh, with, uh, with our local businesses as well as um, our existing uh, sidewalk vendors both along uh, Beach Street as well as uh, Pacific Avenue. And that work was conducted both in English and Spanish with uh, one of our uh, Spanish um, community engagement uh, outreach um, folks that we work with and wanting to ensure that we uh, help all of the vendors be prepared for the new regulations as they roll out. So as part of that work, uh, permits are now available um, and, and can be accessed through our planning department. Um, we are also planning and moving towards um, enforcement of the new regulations beginning uh, this Friday on May 13th. So uh, this has been a major push uh, across multiple departments. I want to thank our code compliance team as well as um, Elizabeth Smith and in, uh, in my office, um, the police department and our, our planning and comm staff uh, for all contributing towards um, what is a, um, a major lift as we uh, roll out this new program. Next slide. As part of the Highway 1 and 9 intersection improvement uh, projects, uh, we had removed the uh, River Street sign um, with plans of actually rehabilitating and reinstalling the sign. Uh, unfortunately, the sign was in significant disrepair and no longer usable, um, uh, keeping us from being able to reinstall it at its original location. So <laughs> as a result, we're planning on retiring the sign and we will be updating um, that corner with updated wayfinding signage consistent with our citywide wayfinding uh, program. So just wanted to alert the council and the community to, to that change. And we look forward to, uh, to the updated intersection improvements as well as the updated signage. Next slide. 
So as uh, Bonnie had mentioned earlier today, uh, we have a number of very exciting affordable housing projects that are moving through the pipeline. And on May 19th, we hit a major milestone as we celebrate the groundbreaking of the Pacific Station South project, as well as the Cedar Street apartments. And collectively, these two projects will yield over 130 additional affordable housing units in our downtown. Uh, they have been really decades in the making, and I want to applaud the work of our economic development and housing team uh, for helping to get these projects over the finish line. Uh, there'll be very exciting improvements for our downtown. Uh, the ground groundbreaking will be a bit of a uh, tour. We'll be starting at uh, the Pacific Station South uh, project site and then heading over to 525 Cedar Street and then a final stop at the site of the library and affordable housing project that uh, you all received a very exciting update on today. Next slide. As we move into the summer months, I wanted to take a moment to also highlight a number of our summer construction projects. We always have a lot of interest from our community members as to what's happening and when. Uh, so I'll run through these very quickly. Uh, the Highway 1 and 9 project will be moving through July of this summer. We also have the West Cliff Path Storm Damage Repair Project uh, running April through July. Uh, the Trevithan Avenue Storm Sewer Project. This will be phase one of that project moving March through July. San Lorenzo Riverwalk Lighting Project is underway. It's already some great improvements happening um, along the, the Riverwalk path there. And that project is um, slated to be completed around July of this year. We also have the San Lorenzo River Lagoon Culvert Project running May through October. The Murray Street Bridge Project, we've uh, had a lot of interest in, and that is running September through October of 2025. That is a, a massive infrastructure improvement project. will certainly have some impacts on traffic, and our public works team will be continuing to update the community proactively so that they can uh, plan their, their routes um, accordingly. And then lastly, we have the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 7, and that'll be May 2022 through May 2023, and really excited to continue building out our, our rail trail uh, corridor. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Rosemary Menard, and she's going to run you through some feedback we received from the community in response to a recent poll that the uh, Water Department conducted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matt, and um, hello, Commissioner or um, Council Members and Mayor. Um, we are, as you know, from a FYI that I sent out a little bit ago, we, we're ramping up a process to really kind of bring the bring to a head and have some com community conversation about uh, supply alternatives for the future. So we had not, not talked to a, the community in a sort of a a standardized survey for quite a lot, long time. And so we decided that now was a good time to get their feedback, particularly on some of the topics of uh, the different kinds of supply alternatives. So we completed the survey in March actually, and we just presented this information to the Water Commission um, at their meeting on the 2nd of May. Um, and so, I'm, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth, please, the next slide. So the first question really had to do with asking folks what they thought about um, how, whether there was a need for water today, a great need, a some need, you know, no need at all, a little need or additional water supply for the future. And you can see that as a very strong uh, recognition in our community that we do need additional water supply to um, make sure that we have an adequate supply to meet our needs, uh, particularly in light of climate change. Next slide, please, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is uh, there's a significant recognition from this data. And these are a number of questions that were asked over time about the degree to which um, you know we're going to need new sources of supply versus that we can just use water conservation or demand management to solve our problem. And the number of folks in our community over time and went who believed that you know just using less was a solution in 2010 and 2014 and then in uh, 2022 has really declined quite rapidly as a number of people who recognize that we do need supply augmentation uh, has increased and I think that is aligned with uh, what I would describe as 
reality of the kinds of efficient water use practices that people have adopted and recognizing that there are, um, you know, there's no way to really very significantly additionally cut their demand and continue to meet their needs. Next slide, please. One of the things we did is we asked folks, um, you know, what kinds of things do you think would be an excellent idea uh, for, uh, or excellent and good idea for a ways to solve the water supply problem? And you can see here, this is data from this, this question from 2019 and then um, more recently, that a lot of folks are still quite interested in the idea of using uh, available winter water when we can and storing it underground aquifers. This is work that's already going on in our community in the Mid-County Groundwater Basin. We're making some good progress with that idea. We also had asked about um, purified recycled water and for potable and non-potable uses. And you can see that there's growing interest in this as a strategy as well. Uh, not so much on mandatory water conservation, whether it's in restrictions as in, uh, you know, curtailments or in additional sort of regulatory strategies as part of long-term demand management. And a little bit of an increase in uh, people's interest in desalination, although that's a, a very challenging uh, project to put forward on a scale of a, just a community as small as we are. Uh, it's not off the table, but I think there are many challenges associated with desal that um, we would want to think hard about before we sort of automatically went down that road. Next slide, please. Um, this was a question that was asking folks to talk to us about what they thought as it related to what were the causes of why we needed additional supply. And you can see that uh, in the top couple of graphs, that there's a pretty strong understanding in our community that climate change is really presenting some additional challenges for us in managing and planning for supply. Uh, quite a lot of people, 82%, are saying that they think that climate change is a big driver of our need for additional supply. Um, the growth question, which we hear uh, on a routine basis, also has a strong you know, resilience or, or um, you know, sort of connection to folks, how they feel about what's driving supply. And we are talking about how we plan for growth and build it into our planning in a way that, you know, recognizes that that's an important thing for us to be planning for. Um, and so there's a strong thing, uh, you know, recognition of growth as a factor. And when you put them, which has the greater effect, climate change is uh, slightly greater, uh, resonates with folks than uh, the growth and development argument. But these are really important statistics for us to understand as we, you know, think about communicating with our community and also solving the ultimate problem and explaining to people why we're doing what we're doing. Um, next slide, please. So one thing that we we have not pulled on historically with any level of detail is purified recycled water. And this time uh, we have a lot of information from previous polls about. Uh, aquifer storage and recovery using treated drinking water from winter availability and also from desal. And we really wanted to know some more about where the community was on purified recycled water. And you can see here the um, they're strongly favoring the various kinds of uses for purified recycled water uh, as uh, all of these laid out here, um, watering for landscapes and playgrounds, uh, commercial and industrial facilities, which I think is an application that's being used in many places. We don't have so much uh, high water using commercial and industrial facilities here in Santa Cruz, so that's obviously a, you know would be a, it would be good, but we don't have that necessarily that use. Um, home uses, uh, you can see here, replenishing groundwater, quite a bit of interest in that, supplementing other water sources, and then sort of more uh, indoor sort of sanitation, personal uses, there still is some willingness and interest to um, pursue the, that idea um, in uh, developing this as a particular source of supply. Next slide, please. Um, and we did the thing that often uh, happens in these kinds of um, polls, which is we asked people a question about how they you know, what was their response to recycled water? And then we gave them additional information in the, in the process about 
how the water is treated and uh, in order to make it available and usable for recycled water. And then we asked them their favorable question, you know, their, the degree to which they favored that uh, technology. And you can see that uh, sort of what we've seen elsewhere also is the case here that when people receive additional information about how recycled water is developed for use, uh, additional potable and non-potable uses, the, the uh, favorability to that idea increases. And that's what this slide shows. Um, I looked at the cross tabs myself, and I think that it's not surprising that a lot of the younger population in our community, uh, both owners and renters are in favor, more heavily in favor of this technology in general and get even more in favor of it once they understand what's, what's involved with it. Um, okay, next slide. And then finally, we asked some questions that we've asked historically uh, about the, the degree to which people think the water department is doing a good or excellent job. And you can see the, the results here. You know, it's been a pretty challenging year for all government agencies over the last few years with the pandemic and the economic downturn and just the general sort of, uh, you know, stresses that we're all experiencing through the, you know, the national, international climate. And it's very gratifying to have um, our community be giving us such a great report card. So we're happy about this, in particular in asking the further, you know, further information about uh, why they thought we were doing a good job. They did respond to positively, very positively to the uh, cust level of customer service that our staff provides. And I'm very proud of those folks and really appreciate the hard work they do to work with folks who've been struggling with their utility bills as the rates have been increased and as the economic conditions have changed. Um, and also, you know, working on helping people to solve their problems in ways that work for them. Among the other factors that seem to be of great interest to our community is the kind of accessibility of water using information that are going to come with the new meters. And so we're also looking forward that process is underway now. We're about a quarter through the, uh, the implementation of the system-wide meter replacement project, and we're getting uh, great results from people who are you know, really happy to be able to start to get access to being able to manage their water use by understanding how much they are using. And I think that unless you have questions for me, that's what I have for you today. Thank you, Rosemary. Happy to answer any questions related to the overall CM update. If there are any, Mayor? Thank you, uh, City Manager and Water Director Rosemary Bernard. Uh, very good polling. Uh, it, very good data and information, and, and congratulations on the good report card. I'm looking to my council member colleagues if there are questions, and I see council member Myers. I just wanted to um, also just recognize the work of the water department. I think that's really important information as we move ahead. Um, did you do any testing on I know we've already kind of basically adopted the rate structure, but did you do any polling on sort of how people are feeling, whether our rates are, you know, affecting the mechanism? You know, I know one of your, really one of your goals is to try to really acknowledge that at some point, you know, even our utilities are going to be difficult for some folks. So yeah. just curious if you did any polling on that. Thanks. Um, we asked folks uh, in one of the slides, and I didn't share the whole deck with you, but I'm happy to send that out to you because you know, it's available, but um, we asked folks to uh, what what they thought about um, our efforts to modernize the system and also to keep rates affordable. And I, um, I can look at the data here. Um, I think that on affordability, there was a recognition that um, we were, you know, that we still got good, good marks on that. About 45% said um, excellent or good. But it's obviously a big challenge, right? And and I do I have been continuing to engage with um, other sort of regional partners and and others in the sort of state and national level about the affordability challenges that were coming. I think that the good news on that topic is that that I'm not the only person talking about it anymore. 
um, that it's becoming an issue. And I, I don't know if you noticed from the, the um, Coastal Commission staff comments related to the desal plant in the uh, Huntington Beach area that got quite a bit of press coverage in the last few weeks. One of their comments was their concern about the affordability of the water that was produced from that plant. Um, so that's not a surprise. Although if the water is needed, um, you know, the choices between having water that's more expensive and not having water doesn't seem to be a, you know, a good choice. But I do think that the affordability issue is one thing that people are starting to really talk about. And I am continuing to talk about that um, both regionally and at the state and national level. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Golder. So I just thought Rosemary would appreciate this. A fourth grader at Bayview asked me what the uh, water bill at Bayview is every month. And I said I didn't know, but I'd get back to them. And um, then the class was very surprised that actually the water portion was fairly low. It was, I don't know, under 400, between three and 400. And the, the trash was around, I don't know, 1,000. So they were so surprised that, that they were such good water savers um, right. at school. So uh, that yeah. was cute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I wanted to just express um, my congrats on the Cedar Street and Pacific Station South projects moving forward. You know, and I know a lot of people in the community want us to build more affordable housing, and it's coming. So I think it's really great that we're able to celebrate the groundbreaking of these two projects. I did. Um, I have a question about the Cedar Street project. So that's the uh, parking lot that's across from Cavalry, that's adjacent to Cavalry Church, correct? That's correct. And um, I could call on Bonnie if you have uh, more specific questions, Councilmember Cummings, but yes, that's the location. I just had, a, I'm, I'm just curious about how that's gonna one, impact parking at that lot. So is that gonna be like coming up, like when is that parking lot coming offline completely? And then also I know that there's some RVs and cars that are in the safe parking program that has been kind of utilized by the Cavalry Church in that lot. And so I'm wondering what's gonna happen to those um, RVs that are utilizing that program. Council, Council Member Cummings, I don't have the exact answer about the RVs, um, but I can reach out and I'm looking to see if um, a couple folks from our parking team are, are on this call. Um, but I see Lee is also um, on, so he may have an answer. But I will say that we have been working um, with just on the lease portion of a termination of their current lease, but at the same time, we want um, to be able to extend that as long as possible. So we're having the groundbreaking day, you know, next week, next Thursday at 11. But they're going to we're going to continue to use that as a parking lot until they they absolutely need it um, to break ground. So we we are working working on that. Um, and I'll turn it over to oh, and Brian's on um, Brian and Lee for the other parts of your question. Sure, I'll kick it off. Um, good afternoon, Council. Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And um, <clears throat> we have um, the building permits um, essentially ready to issue. We're working on some uh, of the final details. And as Bonnie mentioned, um, we do want to keep that lot, that parking lot in um, operation um, while we can. So it'll take a little bit of time for them to mobilize their construction crews and so forth. And um, that's the specific timing that Bonnie was referring to there in terms of when it will be coming offline. We don't know the exact time, but it is imminent. And um, you know, within the next, um, uh, it's, it's a matter of weeks, right? Um, you know, one month, uh, two months, uh, in that kind of time frame is what I would say. Um, with respect to the safe parking program, we do have, um, we have three spots um, that are currently being utilized in that location. We do have um, the ability to move those over to um, lot four, and um, that would be directly across the street. We currently have three spaces that are in operation there, and um, we've got the uh, excess capacity that's um, uh, able to be accommodated on that adjacent lot. The team has also worked on, and you'll hear more about this tonight, the team has also worked on a plan to um, scale that up once we have additional demand to scale that up to the 30 spaces that council has directed. 
And uh, I think that covers it, but if you've got other questions, I'm happy to address those. Nope. That's Member Cummings. I would uh, also just add, and I appreciate both Lee and Bonnie's responses that you know, as, as we tap into the potential of these lots that have historically been used for public parking to really try to achieve highest and best use. And um, you know, obviously these affordable housing projects are, are exciting and welcomed. Uh, we do anticipate that we are gonna have a parking crunch downtown. And so the, the parking component of the library and affordable housing project, I think is another just great example of with all of these moving parts, ensuring that we're planning ahead and being prepared for that. Great, thanks. And I was just, um, I guess the next question I had was related to water. So I'm just curious um, if there is any kind of update on the Pure Water Soquel project. I, I know that there's been a lot of construction. I believe it's the construction to um, build kind of the pipeline for the water transfer. And I'm just curious about whether or not, um, or what's kind of happening with that project as well. Yes, so that project uh, is under construction at, well, both at the Chanticleer plant for the pure water, the advanced water treatment plant. And also um, the, the pipeline is on Broadway now. It's heading, I don't know that it's across Seabright yet. I haven't seen it as I've been in, you know, going in and out of that neighborhood myself. Um, but uh, we'll go over to Frederick Street and then turn and go up Frederick to SoCal. And um, we'll be running on SoCal till it reaches the, the Chanticleer site um, on the south side of the freeway. That, that project has probably got at least another, I would guess, roughly a year to in construction. Um, I think that by the time the Murray Street Bridge is under construction, that project will also be in construction on SoCal. It should be a fun time, I would think. <laughs> Great, thank you. Does that conclude your questions? Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. A lot of really exciting stuff happening. Um, as you mentioned, Rosemary, I, I was going to kind of comment on the on the Murray Street Bridge project, and and then now hearing it also potentially being further impacted, or our community being further impacted by the SoCal project. Um, September's around the corner, and I know it's a three-year project. I I guess for those who are um, regular users of that bridge, and or we also know that is a major. You know, bridge and overpass for a lot of our tourists. How are we thinking about planning for outreach and awareness and traffic management when that's underway? Particularly thinking it's going to be underway for potentially three years. You yeah, thanks for the now. question, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, we have Nathan here to, to speak to some of the plans that are underway. There will most certainly be impacts, as, as you're pointing out. And uh, I know that Nathan and our Public Works communication team have been thinking through how best to, to help mitigate that. So I'm sure Nathan has some some thoughts. Yeah, hi, uh, <clears throat> Malka, Nathan Wendt, Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, thanks for the question about Murray Street Bridge. We are working on getting a couple more permits uh, before going, uh, being able to take out to bid later this summer. So we're still holding on to the September date as of right now. Um, we are working with the Regional Transportation Commission. So they also have a project on Highway 1 and we are talking about looking at the 511 dot um, org website as a way to help put our projects cities as well as rtcs and and uh, counties projects on there as well to to help with um, providing information on the latest uh, traffic impacts uh, you know countywide and so there is a coordination that's happening in the background and as these projects uh, move forward with um, bidding and, and once we get contractors on board we'll have more specific information uh, with regards to those impacts Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions from council members regarding the city manager's update or the water director's update? Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Okay, now I'm moving to uh, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Brennan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the city council. Uh, this uh, afternoon at 1230, the council met in the courtyard conference room to discuss two 
closed session items. The first was a conference with labor negotiators um, involving all bargaining groups. Second item was uh, one item of anticipated litigation. Council received a report from and gave direction to the city attorney's office with regard to that one item of potential litigation. There was no reportable action. Thank you for that report. Is there an update on item 17 on the consent agenda regarding statement of disqualification? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Brunner. Um, I've, I've reviewed the FPPC regulations and the, um, the distance between the project site and the council members' uh, residences, and there is no conflict of interest. Great, thank you for that update. Moving on to agenda number eight, the city council will review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda and revise it as necessary. I'd like to call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Thank you. Now we've come to the consent agenda portion for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you'd like to comment on consent agenda items number nine through 23. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and you can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature on your webinar controls of your computer. If there are any members in the public who would like to comment on consent agenda items 9 through 23, you may sign in at the front podium to the right of the dais. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Council member Cummings. I have a comment on nine, a question on 13, a question on 14. Hold on, let me Sorry. write this <laughs> Sorry. down. Sorry. Nine, comment. Um, yep, question on 13. Question 13. Question on 14. Question 14. Comment on 16. Comment on 17. And a question on 20. Question on 20. Are there any other council members? Council Member Brown? Thank you, Mayor. I have a question on 14 as well, and uh, question, any comments on 16? 16. 16. Thank you. Council Member Myers? I just have a comment on 14. Okay, and then uh, for myself, I had a comment on items 12 and 20. Okay, so we'll start. Let me get back to my notes. I will start with item agenda item number nine, which is resolution extending the emergency declaration in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic by 60 days. And um, there's a comment from Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just wanted to um, bring this item up because uh, I've heard from a number of small business owners that you know there's been attempts and discussion about removing some of the outdoor dining areas um, and also just um, some frustration around being able to operate outdoors. And I think that it's just worth us recognizing that, um, you know, we're starting to see upticks in COVID again. Um, Santa Cruz County in particular is one of the areas in California that's seeing an increase in COVID. 
and there's other states. Um, I was reading an article about how Maine and Puerto Rico are also seeing, even though they have high vaccinated populations, that they're starting to see people who are being um, infected with COVID-19. And just wanting to for us to keep in mind that um, we're still in this um, pandemic, and we really need to be facilitating businesses to operate, and also making sure that we're um, keeping the community safe as best we can, because we don't know where this is heading. And as we saw last winter, we had the biggest spike um, you know, a year after the pandemic had first started. So I think just trying to keep in mind that this is gonna take time and we need to be supportive of our community as we continue to grapple with this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, let's see, the next comment is agenda item number 12. Minutes of the April 26, 2022 City Council meeting. And I just wanted to um, address a member of the public who had emailed a concern about the minutes reflecting in um, our last meeting correctly uh, regarding Santa Cruz Police Department's AR 15s being added to the AB 481 military equipment list and that was indeed the fact the revised list does include ar-15s in the military equipment list and um i just wanted to confirm uh that i was able to confirm that as well with the city attorney's office so thank you for for reaching out with that our next item is uh Council Member Cummings with a question on number 13. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this item is fees associated with sidewalk vending ordinance administration and enforcement. I'm just wondering if um, maybe the Parks and Rec Director, if someone's available to just speak to what uh, those permit fees would be and what we're anticipating in terms of um, how much those permit fees would be. I know that you know the intent of the law is to try to facilitate um, local vendors or street vendors to be able to vend. Although, you know, we're seeing impacts, negative impacts on the community and we're trying to address those. So I'm just wondering if we, if someone could speak to what the anticipated costs of those permits would be. Uh, hi, uh, Council Member Cumming. Um, I will be able to answer that question. Um, Truman Hinton Jones, Administrative uh, Services Supervisor for the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, the parks, a permit fee um, will be an annual fee. It's $50, it's a flat fee. Um, and it's used for making reservations for um, the various areas that um, folks will be able to vend in parks or um, downtown. So it's not a per reservation fee, it's a flat fee for the annual rate. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we had uh, two questions and a comment on item number 14, the California State Library Building Forward Library Infrastructure Grant Resolution. And I will start with uh, Council Member Brown. You had a question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and this is a question that I did send ahead to Bonnie Lipscomb, and I think I got it answered, but I just want to make sure that I um, get it out here. So the, um, and thank you, uh, thank you, Bonnie, for responding. Um, so the, the state grant program, I had some questions from the uh, members of the public about this under um, SB 129, the state grant program is, seems to be uh, focused on, uh, in a couple of areas, um, and one of those is uh, renovations and so I just wanted to so there's a low income priority category um, which it sounds like we're fitting into in um, some ways um, but the on the questions around what the, the purpose of the the grant funding um, it appears that renovation is a big focus and so I'm just wondering, I wanted to ask, and members of the public were um, curious about how that might affect our competitiveness for this round of funding because we are looking at new construction. Um, thanks for that question, Council Member Brown. And, and I do appreciate you sending, sending the question um, by email as well. 
Um, so we were actually encouraged to apply for this grant by the California State Library, and they did give us feedback both through the application process and this middle that our application was very competitive and was a good fit for the program. So specifically new construction is an eligible category for the grant, particularly if it is more cost effective than repairing or rehabilitating an existing facility, which applies to this project based on both the 2019 cost estimate prepared uh, by Jason Architecture and MAC5 and the updated cost estimate um, just prepared in this last, last few weeks um, by the cost estimator. So. And having these, we did share uh, these cost estimates, you know, the information from them with with the um, with the state library, um, uh, California State Library, and they did give us this feedback that absolutely what we were doing, some of the features in the old one were, were not cost effective to um, from a safety perspective, um, were not cost effective to for a renovation, and that this is exactly the type of project that these funds are are made for. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings, you had a question as well. Yeah, this um, part of it was somewhat answered in the last response, but um, one of the things that came up in the agenda report was how this grant is for high poverty areas. And so I'm just curious how Santa Cruz fits within that criteria and how competitive are we for that grant? And maybe you can speak to how they base, you know, what a high poverty area is. Um, I am not looking at that part of the grant. You know, remember my grant uh, team and, and ED did pull together some of those elements of the project. I will say overall for typical grants, um, particularly when we're looking in uh, low income areas, the downtown is, is, in, is considered a low income area that extends and includes the area of the beach flats and lower ocean. So we typically, when you're looking at from a census block perspective, we fit right in there with this area in some of the lowest income areas of Santa Cruz. So um, that is based on census tract data. Um, I will follow up after I touch base with my project team uh, from that element of the grant if, if the analysis was different than that, but that is um, what I believe was used as the basis for this. Okay. Yeah, I was curious because I wasn't sure if it was, you know, the um, high poverty area was the city as a whole or if it's just the neighborhood where the library is located. So just trying to get some clarification around that because I think the idea was, you know, how competitive are we for this grant? But if they reached out to you and said you should apply, then obviously there's high potential of, of success. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Myers, you had a comment on item 14. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the staff. Um, and I also wanna recognize um, our new County Library Director, um, Yolanda Wilburn, she is also, I know, working with our staff so on this grant. Um, so this is an amazing opportunity and I'm just thrilled that, you know, we are working collectively to bring these dollars back to build a state-of-the-art 21st century library in our downtown. So um, Bonnie, I just wanna recognize you and your staff. You guys do a lot of these grants and um, I'm just uh, thrilled that we're going for it and also just excited that the state of California recognizes that Libraries are the most important institution a, a community can build, and they wouldn't be putting these grants out if that wasn't the focus of what we should be doing to accomplish all kinds of things in our community. So thanks for your work. Thank you, uh, Council Member Myers. And I will say that uh, Library Director Yolande Wilburn is watching this meeting, and if needed, she could jump on to the panel, but she is watching, and she has been and her whole library team have obviously been a huge contributors um, to the library portion of the project. And Yulon particularly has connections with this grant and was involved on some of the original sort of grant eligibility, you know, uh, don't have all the details of her involvement other than I know that she was very um, intrinsically involved in the early stages of even developing this opportunity for libraries across the state. So she has a lot of firsthand knowledge of the grant, the eligibility, and um, the overall process. So she's been our go-to in both guidance and in following up with specific questions that we had during the process. Thanks for mentioning that, Bonnie. I mean, I think her guidance and her, um, really her uh, knowledge of, you know, this, this opportunity that the state really wants to offer to communities around California is 
I'm not sure that in recent times we've had this kind of money that would be available. So again, you know, this is just great, and I've just been so impressed um, in watching the two organizations working together so closely to try to try to bring this grant home. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Next uh, comment, we have two comments on consent agenda items 16. And this is uh, uh, to award a construction contract for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, segment seven of the rail trail. And um, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> thank the staff and congratulate them on all the hard work that they've done to help us get to this point. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has been making significant strides towards building the rail and trail, and this is just another example of good work paying off to be able to get the funds necessary for us to move forward with this next segment that's gonna be really critical in helping us provide a continuous trail uh, in our community along our rail corridor. And so I just really wanted to express my thanks and appreciation for all the hard work. Um, we've made a lot of progress since I've been on council, and I know that this is decades of hard work um, you know, finally paying off. So just wanted to thank you all um, for all of your efforts and also let the community know that we are moving forward with building our trail and maintaining our rail. And so I hope that uh, we can continue doing this as we move into the future. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Brown, you had a comment on agenda item 16. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions. My comment has already been made, so I'll just... Um, <laughs> They uh, ditto. Uh, thank you for all of the hard work to get us here. And yes, we can do. Uh, we can build our build out our rail uh, uh, trail and get that trail built um, alongside the rail line. And um, we're sh the city of Santa Cruz is really leading the way in showing our community that it can be done uh, countywide as well. Um, so my questions are one. I had a question about the. Um, Kind of, well, there's, there doesn't seem to be a fence um, in the plans between the railroad tracks and the lagoon itself. And so there, I heard from some members of the community that they um, were interested in, in understanding why that is. Um, there is, you know, some concern about encroachment on into the lagoon um, with more activity along there, which in many ways could be a positive. Um, but just kind of wondering what um, fencing, yes or no, and what the constraints might be around that. Um, so that's one question. And then I have a few others on lighting and some other things that someone wrote in about that I want to try to get answered. Uh, sure. Uh, Nathan Wen, uh, Assistant Director of Public Works. I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, there is a smooth wire cable fence that is required uh, as part of the project that separates the uh, trail from the rail. It's uh, the exact same fence that we have installed on the first phase of the coastal rail trail. So it's the core 10 steel posts with that smooth cable fencing uh, wires. About, I think there's about four or five of them. And that bottom wire is actually at a height of about, I think it's 14 to 16 inches to let little critters kind of cross the trail there. Thank you. Um, but nothing on the rails on the other side, not in between the trail and the rail, but between the rail and the um, lagoon itself? Is Not specifically as a part of this project, but there is a, we, there is discussions working with Parks and Rec as well as our wastewater team around um, trying to get some additional fencing around Neary Lagoon and the wastewater treatment plant to reduce impacts that, um, um, that are occurring in that area. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, so these are uh, the, the next questions I'm going to ask are from a member of the public who uh, wrote in and wrote in again today and hadn't had those questions answered. So I just want to see if I can get them out there. Um, one, um, and first she said that the, the charts, when you enlarge them or you're zooming in, are kind of hard to read. They get blurred is because of the, the pixels, I guess. I, I didn't have that issue, but um, it was a comment. So if I don't know if we can get higher resolution. Um, charts in uh, yeah i can work on getting working with the rtc i, I received those uh the charts yet. when working with the rtc but i can work on getting some um a more higher resolution charts for the for the final agreement 
I'll make a note to work on that too at the RTC end of things. Um, so uh, there, the um, some of the charts make reference to light posts and uh, lighting and security cameras. Um, there isn't a plan attached to that to show where they would be. I imagine that's going to take time to uh, sort out uh, what the details on that would be. Um, but just wondering um, kind of what the thinking is on how those are going to be mounted. Uh, I think the concern is um, one that I share related to the potential effects of lighting on wildlife um, in that in that space. So um, just anything you could say about uh, lighting and how what kinds of um, uh, considerations we made to um, keep our skies dark. <laughs> Yeah, happy to speak to the lighting on the on the coastal rail trail project um, it, on our city of Santa Cruz dot com uh, slash coastal rail trail web page. Uh, the plans for segment seven phase two are on that are online and the uh, they do include lighting. So uh, on the sheets, the construction plan sheets on that plan set um, does show the uh, light posts as well as the type of lighting that's going to be installed. It's going to be very similar or actually the same fixture as what you see at Aranya Gulch uh, Trail, but it's going to be a little taller. And then the security cameras right now, the project includes the infrastructure, meaning the boxes, the conduits um, for future security cameras to be installed um, on the rail trail. And those cameras are gonna be installed on every other light post. Uh, again, that is shown on the, on the um, plan set uh, that you can find online. And that was the at the request of, um, you know, uh, fire and safety as far as having those additional um, cameras as well as having lighting uh, in that area. Uh, with regards to the specs um, of the lighting, um, it, it is dark sky compliant. Um, I know that there was additional comments about um, potential glare, um, you know, facing up into residents. And that is a common thing that we get with some of our roadway lighting projects or crossing improvement projects we have in neighborhoods. Um, we do have the ability to install shields on those lights to help reduce that glare or reflection into people's, whether it's bedrooms or, you know, front living rooms or front yards, et cetera. But we do want to make sure that we're maintaining a, uh, lighting or having lighting on the trail itself, uh, you know, making sure that we have that feature um, for the community. Um, so um, one more question. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this a lot myself, so I want to make sure I, I get this one asked. Um, related to environmental mitigations for work on along this rail line, um, a, a related to testing uh, and any levels detected for arsenic and hexavalent chromium in particular in this case, but just in general, um, you know, envir the environmental mitigations um, and, and what you've found so far in the process. Yeah, as a part of the implementation process of this project, we've had to work with County Environmental Health Services um, and uh, in doing that, um, we've done additional boring and sampling along all of segment seven. So from natural bridges to, um, you know, the Pacific Avenue roundabout. Um, and of course, this is a rail line out there. And over the years, there have had some weed abatement. So the, the thing that we're finding as far as the highest level of contaminants out there is arsenic. And in working with the County Environmental Health, um, what we're proposing, what's being uh, done as we did on phase one is providing a protective cap. So that is placing, I think what we have is four inches of asphalt, another four inches of base rock um, as part of the trail section itself. So the, the trail itself actually acts as a protective cap. And the fact that we have um, a retaining wall on one side and then this new wire fence that I mentioned earlier on the other side, we're really kind of keeping trail users um, on the trail itself and not necessarily directing them to um, the, the railroad, which is, you know, we want to keep, we want to keep the public actually off the rail line itself and on the trail. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Brown. I'm going to pause where we're at right now. We still have a comment and a couple of questions uh, on our consent agenda, but we have a time certain presentation for four o'clock. And that is the Sister Cities Committee presentation, the Hans Christian Anderson Writing Contest Awards, and the award winners in Sister Cities. We're pleased to have a special presentation of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities 
Committee, Hans Christian Andersen Writing Awards. This is such a wonderful writing competition for children, for teens and adults, and it's sponsored by the Sister Cities Committee. I'm pleased to introduce Anita Wood, who is chair of Sister Cities Committee, along with Isabel Twinsar, chair of the subcommittee for our sister city of Siestre Levante, Italy. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. All right, Santa, Santa Cruz Sister Cities Hans Christian Andersen Essay Competition is presented as part of the Hans Christian Andersen Fables Bay Competition held in our beautiful sister city of Siestri Levante. Hans Christian Andersen lived for a short time there and is considered a favorite son. This is the 55th year of the Siestri competition and is part of a larger celebration of childhood and youth. Over 800 submissions have been received worldwide this year, making this writing contest one of the most popular in Italy. The winners will be announced on June 11th during the Anderson Festival in Italy. The competition is open to writers in four age groups, four age categories, three to five years, six to 10 years, 11 to 16 years, and 17 plus. The essays, essays can be about any subject that must be an original folk or fairy tale. A committee of readers determines first through fifth place winners in each age group and these winning entries are submitted to the Sestri competition. We're so pleased to be back this year presenting in person and are joined by our fantastic writers. Without further ado, I would invite Mayor Bruno to join me to present the awards. Thank you. Thank you. It gives me such pleasure today to acknowledge these creative and talented writers and winners of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee Hans Christian Andersen Writing Contest. We're really proud of your efforts and we wish you the best of luck in Siestre competition. We ask that you please hold your applause until the end. <laughs> so I'm going to announce the winners. For ages six to 10, the winners are in fifth place the Humble Little Woman by Marianne Hammer. Is, is Marianne Hammer here? Please come forward to the podium. And in fourth place, Kalozar the Dragon Slayer by Lohi Vandermeer. Please come forward. Welcome. Congratulations. Third place, The Mystery of the Borrowing Witches by Jasmine Harris Schenken. Is Jasmine here with us? Okay, second place, The Two Legos by Liesel Hildebrand. Congratulations. First place, drum roll, The Rich Farmer and the Poor Man by Sai Zachariah. Sai is not here with us, but congratulations to all of the age six to 10 winners. Okay, for ages 11 to 16 to 17, the winners are first place, 19 by Stella Kukuza. Is Stella here with us? Congratulations, Stella. And in the division for adults, ages 17 and up, the winners are third place, The Big Old Farm, The Dutch Dog, and The Little Baby Chicks by Kotra Downs. Second place, Finding Friends by Colleen Douglas. <laughs> we'll save the applause to the end. <laughs> it's very exciting, I know. And we have a tie for first place. The first winner is Jumping Jaden by Sylvie Patience. And the second winner is Windfall by Joan F. Prebolich. Okay. Congratulations. 
congratulations. Thank you to all the participants in our Sister Cities Committee. We are really lucky to have such an active committee and such a talented group of young writers and adult writers in our community. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. We will now return to the consent agenda portion of today's meeting. And we are currently in the uh, comments and question stage of the agenda. Let me return to those notes here. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we had a comment on agenda item number 17 from Council Member Cummings. That is Circle of Friends Community LLC. Uh, it's approving the final map. Yeah, I just wanted to um, make a comment on this because this was something that um, we had an extensive amount of feedback on, and, um, and I've still been hearing from people in the community about. Um, what's happening at this site and just wanted to highlight that um, you know there's been some people who have been saying that there's going to be a massive apartment complex and I just want to be clear to members of the public that these will be single family homes on these lots um, and you know unfortunately the city does not own this property it's private property um, and when the transaction went forward um, the private owner, the people who bought the, the property have decided to move forward with <clears throat> creating residences there. And so we're not in a position to, you know, really legally stop this from moving forward. And um, just want to acknowledge all the work that's been done around that the city, you know, did for the community with looking into uh, historic preservation and a number of other different items. But we are here today to, um, you know, um, ad approve the final map of this project. And um, while I know there's a lot of strong feelings around the circles, and the Circle Church, um, you know, this is um, a part of the public process, and um, and today we're here to, to approve this final map, which will be for uh, single-family homes built on on lots on that property. So, just wanted to acknowledge that this has been a very long process, and I just want to acknowledge all the work and feedback that we've been hearing to get to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, the last item with uh, is item number 20, Cayuga Street Striping Improvements Budget Adjustment. Uh, Council Member Cummings, you had a question on that. I did. Um, f for members of the public, um, and I know that there's been some concern around safety on this street. Um, it's a pretty wide street, as many of us know, and there's been speeding. Recently, there was an accident where a member of the public was killed. Um, and so I just think that um, in addition to the Cayuga Street improvements that um, I hope we can consider other streets in Santa Cruz. I know that there's excessive speeding on Almar, there's excessive speeding on Beach Street, especially in the early morning when there's no cars down by the boardwalk. Um, so just wanted to express that, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a need for us to look at many streets in our community and, and look at improvements to reduce speeding. Um, but the one question I did have, I know that, um, you know, striping is one way of kind of bringing to the attention um, where bike lanes are and, you know, trying to keep people to kind of stay within their quote unquote lanes, pun intended. But um, having visited other cities, I know that there's been um, other ways that have been used to address kind of safe biking and, and safe streets. One is moving parking, for example, off of curbs so that the, the space between where cars are parked and the curb can serve as a protected bike lane and it also reduces the um, width of the streets that ultimately slows traffic. And I'm just curious if that has been taken into consideration 
and because you know Cayuga Street could be a good example of a potential implementation for that kind of safe um, bike lanes and, and slowing of streets. And so I'm just curious if there are other um, ways that have been taken into consideration around how we can create safer streets for um, pedestrians, um, bikers, and also people who are driving cars. I see that Assistant Public Works Director Nathan Ewan is here, and um, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Sure, happy to answer that question. Uh, yes, you know, we did look at some uh, different kind of initial designs or concepts, I'll say, on Cayuga Street. I think what you're referring to is considered a, a parking protected bike lane when you move the bike lane off the curb and the bike uh, riders are in between the parked cars as well as the, the curb. Uh, so, you know, so there's definitely uh, pluses and minuses to a lot of the different types of designs. And, you know, that one being that there's a lot of driveway approaches that you would cross. And so um, that makes it a little bit more challenging for sight distance as far as getting in and out of driveways and the turning radiuses that you need when you move the car, um, you know, in this case, maybe seven feet off the face of curb. Um, on Cayuga, um, most of the street is, uh, while it feels wide now, it is going to be considered a, a really a kind of a standard width street um, in the sense that the bike lanes, where they will be generous at six feet and the travel lanes are going to be reduced down to 10 feet. In the southern portion of Cayuga, we do get to get some buffered bike lanes. So there's some new treatments there and um, that will give you some more space and uh, to make it a little bit more uh, low stress uh, as far as riding in the bike lanes further south on Cayuga. And I will say, uh, just add one last thing that this is really, you know, a uh, what we consider more of a phased approach to that. And over time, uh, we'll be looking at evaluating the bike lanes and see how they operate over the next year. And as you mentioned, there are many streets in the city that um, have been asking for this. And um, it, uh, that is part of the challenge as far as is trying to find and uh, trying to find funding and priority and, and, uh, and um, dedicating staff to this type of work. So appreciate the comments, though. Thank you for that clarification on, you know, why certain um, protected bike lanes and bike lanes are better options than others. And, you know, the issues with the driveways wasn't something that I'd thought about or had been brought to my attention. So thank you for that. I did have one follow up question um, on. I'm just wondering, um, because I know that sometimes for construction sites, um, temporary um, speed bumps are brought in or rumble strips that kind of, you know, make people want to slow down. I'm wondering if there's any opportunities to implement some of those strategies on certain streets where there's constant excessive um, speeding and yeah, if there's any opportunities for those to be implemented in the interim. Yeah, you know, the, the challenge with having traffic calming, uh, doing pilot programs is finding the, again, the staffing, the funding to kind of dedicate to that. Um, in developing a neighborhood traffic calming program, putting out, uh, you know, potential, uh, you know, like you mentioned, temporary speed bumps, um, things of that nature, is, you know, building the consensus and having, uh, again, the staffing and resources to apply towards that. Um, if in the future we are awarded a potential um, quick build grant, is what we'll be looking at maybe the following year, uh, an ATP Cycle 6 uh, grant where we can try doing some of those more, um, I don't want to say experimental temping uh, traffic calming measures, but being able to pilot them to see how effective they are and then determine which path we want to go for next as far as finding funding to do more permanent uh, traffic calming solutions. And so, um, but we're, again, what we have here is a kind of a phased approach towards that to making Cayuga, you know, and some of the other streets in our city, you know, a neighborhood greenway. Great. Thanks. And yeah, I'll just say that It'd be great to see if we can, you know, if there might be some consideration of some of these um, intersections uh, with the rail and trail, because oftentimes people will be biking and those kind of bike out into traffic. And if there's a way to slow um, cars on some of those streets, it could help so that people are more aware that they're coming up on those intersections and should be cautious of pedestrians crossing on bikes and, and walking. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, I also had a comment on item 20, and uh, I just wanted to really call out all of the work that staff has done um, to this point, working with the neighbors, um, including uh, uh, on our police department, our traffic lieutenant, Maury, coming out uh, to the neighborhood meetings and 
uh, setting up the radar trailer and collecting data on speeding on the street and um, uh, assistant director Nathan Ewan also engaging um, extensively with the neighbors and their concerns and addressing public safety uh, concerns and looking at um, the phased approach for um, this street as well as other streets in our city and how we can implement the best traffic calming measures for each location. Um, so thank you so much for prioritizing safety on um, our streets. Appreciate all the work. Okay. That concludes our comments and questions from Council on Consent Agenda Items. Now I will bring it back to my notes. This time, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, now is the time to do so. If you're a member of the public and have signed up, please line up on the right of the dais. And if you are a member of the public joining us virtually, please raise your hand by pressing star nine or raise hand feature in your uh, webinar controls on your computer. You will have three minutes to speak. And I will begin with our uh, in-person member of the public. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruna and council members. Gillian Greenside, I have to say, uh, it is very nice to be back here. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Uh, I'm going to comment on um, item 16 and specifically about the Measure D funding for the construction of segment seven, phase two of the rail trail. In 2016, Measure D was very controversial and some of the strongest supporters of the rail trail were urging a no vote. And the feeling was if it failed that a much stronger ballot measure could be put forward that didn't have some of the features that a lot of the rail trail people didn't support. Um, I was conflicted about whether to vote yes or no. Um, I did not want to have uh, that money spent on constructing a trail. And so when I read the ballot measure language and the fact sheet this is what it said, and I'll read it. The 8% from Measure D going to the rail corridor was for infrastructure preservation and analysis of options. Analysis including environmental and economic analysis of both rail transit and non-rail options for the corridor. Rail line maintenance and repairs. On the basis of that, I voted yes. So today, to see that Measure D monies is putting, being used towards the cost of building the rail trail, I feel is a violation of public trust. The public, I feel, should expect with your, when your ballot language is clear, and based on that, one decides how to vote, and then to look ahead, what, six years, and find that the money is being used for what it was not intended for, that that does not feel good. The library measure S was the same issue. The word relocation was buried in the fine print, and I know many people besides myself voted yes on the assumption that the downtown library would be renovated where it stands. This, I feel, is a disservice and leads to a lack of trust. I'm not one of those people who does not trust government, but this sort of bait and switch leads to a feeling of, I don't think I would support any other measure if this is how it's going to play out. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, at this time I will go out to hands raised in uh, the virtual attendees list. And the first hand raised is David Hart Trails. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Uh, you know, I think most meetings would uh, benefit from timeouts for essay awards, just to uh, remind us what it's uh, actually all about. So uh, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, in your efforts to work for the public good, uh, most of the time we members of the public, uh, you know, we stay home because everything is, is just fine and silence, I guess, means, you know, thanks all y'all. And uh, then, you know, we only show up to comment when we're outraged about something. Uh, so just for variety, I want to actively say as a citizen, thank you for all you're doing. And of course, especially for the several steps forward on the uh, rail trail related items, thanks. Uh, and the new library looks uh, super exciting too. And that's all, signing out. Thank you. Our next name with a hand raised for consent agenda item. I wanted to look at the numbers. Nine through 23 on today's agenda. And the name is Whitney Ramos. Good afternoon. Good My name is Whitney Ramos. As policy manager for the Santa Cruz County Business Council, I'm here to express strong support for the library mixed use project. We respectfully request, request your I vote authorizing the submission of the California State Library Building Forward Library Infrastructure Grant Program application and the acceptance if awarded as described in agenda item 14. The Santa Cruz County Business Council was founded in 1996 to provide a collective voice for countywide business owners, executives, and members of our local workforce. Today, we continue to practice informed advocacy for projects, policies, and practices that will make the county a better place to live, work, and do business. The Library Mixed Use Project is one of these projects. The many opportunities for public participation has resulted in a robust community engagement and led to a project design and site program that exceeds our initial expectations. As the project gets closer to its final steps, we continue to see the city's thoughtful and proactive approach to designing the library mixed use project has paid off. We thank you for your continued leadership on moving this project forward and look forward to supporting the implementation of the final design. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public has the name I am watching you. No, thanks. Uh, are you aware Measure D is on the ballot in June? Uh, why are there rail trail spending items on this agenda at this time? This seems fiscally whoopsie risky at this time. What's the rush? As to item nine, you seem to prioritize and always list as the first order of consent agenda business, the extension of the COVID emergency based solely for two reasons. First, the state's agubitator uh, hasn't lifted his two-year-old emergency declaration so he can enjoy more of those dictatorial 47 executive orders and his suspension of 200 state laws and also maybe the something worse could maybe maybe happen fear monger reason i don't believe he gets it yet covid will persist in less than emergency levels but so many of the covid mandate narratives have been so thoroughly discredited by courts and by those who look at all the real science and dare to publish it the powers that be have stopped pushing it and are going to let those vaccine and other COVID mandates slowly sink into the abyss of silence without admitting to the atrocities of their mandates until they need them again. Perhaps you haven't noticed, but the national narrative has moved on to World War III and about face on a corrupt Western puppet Ukraine turned into a proxy war that could care less about peace and the leaked abortion debate ruling in an attempt to divert attention from about a dozen massively failed policies in crisis of the Biden administration, including failed borders, Biden inflation, supply chain disasters, interest rates rising into a recession, bear markets, food supply issues, energy issues, and the negative real standard of living affordability and creating a ministry of misinformation, 1984 style free speech assassination, just to cite a few. Uh, they know getting eight or 10 vax doses into everyone isn't going to happen. Getting young children vaxxed against their parents and any sensible notion of real risk to them isn't flying anymore. Masks are a joke. I cannot think of one benefit to me personally. State one if you can, but I can think of several reasons to be done with it. Emergency is used by some to continue their unjustified vaccine apartheid venue admissions. 
Uh, it perpetuates a climate of fear. It renders the state assembly useless and powerless. It circumvents the separation of powers. It's become nothing but just plain abusive to the rights of everyone everywhere. It still exists because I suppose the power to abuse it seems irresistible to some. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public to speak on consent agenda items 9 through 23. Peter Behir. Hello, City Council. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to reiterate uh, the City Council member Justin Cummins' um, comment on the the improve on the on item number 20 and uh, also his mentioning of beach streets and several members of the community uh from beach flat has also uh given me lots of uh, uh worrisome about the speeds on beach street just this morning a car almost crashed and also took over someone a member of the community last night yesterday was also a skid um, and just some uh, several members of the community also have mentioned maybe the possibility of having sp uh, speed bumps in that area. So I've also I know of a cat and a dog from the pets community have been killed by speedsters throughout the, that area. And uh, so they also just uh, not only in Cayuhoga, but also in Beach Street, the speed is definitely getting out of control. And I'm just sharing what the community at this time is working. So I'm speaking through their voice. Thank you for your consideration and good work. Thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak to our consent agenda items today? Items nine through 13. Nine through 23. Thank you for the correction, Council Member Brown. Okay. I'm not seeing any, so um, I'm now bringing it back to Council. And I'm looking for a motion. I'm happy to move the consent agenda. Okay. We I'll have second that. Vice Mayor Watkins. And a second by Council Member Golder. And Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I just wonder if someone from staff might be able to um, respond to the comments that were made by Ms. Joan Greensite about the Measure D funds. Um, she brought up some good points, and I think that it'd be worth us having staff respond to some of what was brought up. Sure, uh, Nathan Nguyen, Assistant Director of Public Works, City of Santa Cruz. I'm, I'm happy to kind of make a, a comment or response to that. You know, the 2016 Measure D uh, approval um, was a countywide measure. Um, it did um, dedicate 8% for the rail corridor, um, but 17% actually was for active transportation, which included the coastal rail trail. Um, staff, whether it's the, at the city of Santa Cruz as well as uh, Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission, um, is leveraging that 2016 uh, Measure D funds um, in order to do local matches for um, active transportation cycle grants, uh, highway safety improvement grants, and congestion corridor grants. So we are using the funding um, as we uh, stated back in 2016 to use these local dollars to leverage them for additional grant state and federal grant dollars to um, you know get the coastal rail trail constructed as well as uh, you know do maintenance on the rail corridor um, and do some neighborhood projects so just wanted to give you that background great thank you that's helpful because <clears throat> I, I think it's in our best interest to ensure that we're spending public dollars appropriately and so having a little bit more um, background on where that funding fits into the Measure D funds, I think is helpful um, for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Okay, so we have a first by Vice Mayor Watkins and a second by Council Member Golders. May we have a roll call vote on the consent agenda? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. 
Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Next on our agenda is consent public hearings. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on items 24 through 27, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Council Member Brown? I have a comment on 25 and 26. 25 and 26, comment. Okay, and uh, I had a comment on item number 26. Or, um, go ahead, Council Member Cummings. Um, I was gonna, um, I had a question on 27. Question on 27. And I was gonna pull 26. Okay, so we have item number 26 pulled. And so we will come back to that and we will continue with comments on uh, item number, agenda item number 25, Council Member Brown. Yeah, just uh, real quick, I, I wanted to just um, make a statement that I will be voting no on that item, um, even though it's part of the consent public hearing agenda, I wanted to register my no vote. And I, I just wanted to say um, why. Uh, for the record, we, we talked about this in, uh, pretty extensively at our last meeting, so I won't go into detail. But I, I continue to believe that eliminating the prohibition of development on slopes of 50% or greater represents uh, what I believe to be a significant retreat from the city's longstanding um, environmental concerns that have continued to be expressed as a high priority for our community. Um, it's a prohibition that is one of the only objective standards, uh, environmental standards the city has left available to us and eliminating it is going to open up uh, every steep hillside essentially in our community to development. Um, it's I think that I'll just leave it there. Um, I, I can't support uh, that element of the proposed changes. I was willing to look at the other, the, the rest of the ordinance revisions, but um, I'm not gonna support that. So I'll leave it there and I'll save my comment on 26 for since it's been pulled. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Okay, our next item is count, uh, Question on uh, item number 27, Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Um, this item is the HUD Action Plan in 2021 2022 Home ARP Plan. Um, well, you know, earlier today we heard about the Pacific Station South, and it looks like there's about $3 million from, for the Pacific Station North project in the home funds. I'm just wondering if there's any. Um, any uh, estimate estimate on the total project cost and how much in tax credits being applied for and kind of when we'll hear more about the final decision on that project. Yeah, so it's a work in progress here in that, um, you know, we've had inflation, we're having supply chain issues, um, mortgage interest rates going up. So we're, we're juggling a lot of moving parts. Um, but right now the project is uh, on a per unit basis, it's, it's north of 700,000 a unit. Um, and again, remember we're doing a lot of 
uh, green building features that are being added. In addition, we're working on Maple Alley here, as well as the Metro Transit Station is a part of this. So there's there's so many more complex parts that are associated with Pacific Station North as compared to Pacific Station South, uh, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to push to get Pacific Station South going, um, because we knew Pacific Station North would be a little more complicated. Um, it, but with that note, with this home ARC funding and home funding being applied to this project, we're closing the gap and basically down to just affordable housing tax credits at this point, which has to be the last in committed funding source. So every other source has to be committed before applying for affordable housing tax credits. Um, so we are moving forward, um, working with the building department on, on getting plans ready um, but we also need to be a little bit further down the road in order to apply for those affordable housing tax credits. Um, and again, this is just a much more complicated project in terms of we need an interim bus operations plan going as well as, you know, all the, all the complexities with the ASIC funding and the IIG funding and, and the improvements that are going to happen on Front Street and around that, that general area. So um, we, we are super close and with the home ARP and home funding that will help close the gap to make this the last source before affordable housing tax credits. Great. Thank you very much. That concludes all my questions. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Since uh, agenda item 26 was pulled, at this time I will... Um, go out to members of the public who would like to speak on items 24 through 27 with the exception of 26. You can uh, follow the instructions on your screen if you're joining us virtually and press star 9 to raise your hand. Members of the public joining us in person, you can sign in here at the front podium and uh, line up to the right side of the dais. Let's go out to members of the public joining us virtually. And I'm not seeing any hands in our virtual room. Okay, are any members of the public here to speak on items 24 through 27, with the exception of 26. All right. Please step forward. Hi there. Which item are you speaking to? I'm going to speak to 24, but I'd like to be able to comment also, since I can't bring it up during the consent agenda, is my motion. Um, so we've passed that part of the So just portion. commenting on 24. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I find it very interesting how the County of Santa Cruz supervisors and the City of Santa Cruz with the items that they choose to bring up and talk about, it's kind of like this race course. Um, so I made public comments twice with the County of Santa Cruz regarding the small cell towers. Um, I'll submit some stuff in writing, and I can't comment on eight or nine. I wish I could. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have our next member of the public joining us in person. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruno, City Council members. Um, just briefly on item um, 25. I'd just like to express support for the comments made by Council Member Brown. Uh, seems we're um, more and more um, encouraging development in areas that are problematic in terms of erosion, fire, and uh, view sheds, etc. And uh, I think the main point that I would like to support is the comment that uh, when we're looking for objective standards, we seem to be having some trouble getting to a place where we have objective standards so we have some local control, which has basically, over development, 
been taken over by the state. So I think that this is a bit hasty in this climate to uh, um, amend the slope ordinance, which has uh, stood us in uh, good stead for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it looks like that concludes our in-person public comment. I will bring it back to council for a motion. Let me bring back my notes. I'll make a motion to move items 24 through 27 with the exception of 26. I'll second that. Okay, we have a first by council member Golder and a second by Vice Mayor Watkins. Council member Cummings. Yeah, at the <clears throat> I wasn't sure when the best time to do this was, so I, I was going to wait until uh, this point in time. But I'm also going to register a no vote on item number 25. I made comments at the last meeting related to environmental impacts and my concern with that, also um, related to the objective standards. And so, um, for the same reasons as the last time we voted on this, I will be vote, um, registering a no vote on item number 25. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Okay, with that, it looks like we are ready for a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Kellen Tory Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Cummings? Aye, with a no on 25. Brown? Aye, with a no on 25. Meyer? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruner. Aye. That passes with two no's and five yeses on item number 25. Now we return to our public hearing, consent public hearing item number 26, which was pulled by council member Cummings and I had a comment um, and this is Item 26 related to the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2022-09 AB481 military equipment use. And we have um, uh, staff here from our Santa Cruz Police Department for any questions. Um, but my comment was related to um, some of the uh, public comment we've received and some of the comments received uh, from our last meeting uh, regarding standard, uh, standard issue equipment. Um, specifically, we discovered that AR-15 assault rif rifles were part of standard issued equipment and was um, included. We had decided to include that in uh, the military equipment list. And so um, I'm wondering if, and perhaps this is um, what you may have pulled it for, if there could be some direction in, in um, listing uh, standard equipment on the transparency portal. Yeah, I'll just, I guess I'll follow up to that. <clears throat> um, at the last meeting, um, just given what we had heard, there was also additional feedback that we received um, wanting for the community to want to know what that, what standard issued equipment was out there and um, wanted to see that listed on the transparency portal as well as the mayor just mentioned. And so um, I provided some language and it would be great to hear feedback on it, but the direction would be to also have staff list standard issued equipment for the Santa Cruz, Cruz Police Department on the transparency portal by no later than December 31st, 2022, and provide council with an update when that list is made public. <clears throat> this is similar to the military grade equipment would have um, standard issued equipment just listed on the transparency portal as well, um, so that the public could understand what is uh, technically considered standard uh, issued equipment. And so that's the intention of this just to provide additional transparency. And um, I don't know, Bonnie, we could have that on the screen for members of the public to see as well.
Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Just to confirm uh, that would be separate from the AB 481 and the uh, matter at hand today. All right. Thank you. So since we're bifurcating both issues, uh, would we want to talk about staff time and, and what standard issued equipment is by definition at some point between now and then? I guess my answer would be that I think that that would be, personally, I think that's okay, and I think that's a, a question for the council. I think the intention was to try to make it pretty simple, um, but I do recognize, you know, having needing to define what is standard use equipment, and I think part of the reason why we were providing the timeline of December 31st, 2022, is to, to provide that space and time for uh, staff to be able to work on it in not a very rushed manner. Um, so I'll... I'll defer to my colleagues on this one, but I'd be happy to, um, if we want to have something come back for discussion about what is standard use equipment, how it's classified, I think that would help for transparency as well. Sure thing. I think we can put something together that does define it, and then we can attach staff time to that, and I think that's extremely reasonable. We appreciate the time allotted for that, and uh, we'd support that for sure. Yeah. I guess, can I, can I ask another question? Yes. Council um, member coming. I'm just wondering if we wanted to have um, that item come back where we can have a discussion around standard use equipment and um, staff time. When would be a good time for that item to come back to council? I, I think we could accommodate having, you know, all that information. I think 30 days is reasonable. So uh, fairly quickly, I think we can turn it around. Okay. And, uh, council Member Cummings. <clears throat> If I could chime in, um, as we move into May and June with having some heavy agendas around the budget hearings, um, I might suggest that we have time to bring that back after the summer recess um, so that we can fully explore the request and ensure that um, if it's the council's desire to move forward uh, with the proposal that we're really meeting the spirit, of, spirit and intent behind it. Uh, so, is there language? Are you making a motion no, um, or well direction? Have, this, this has to go out to public comment first. Yes. Um, but, I, you know, given what um, the police department staff has said and <clears throat> the thoughts around bringing something back um, before this gets implemented, I'm just wondering if there's any discussion around timing for that. And personally, it sounds like it can come back soon, but, you know, if we say before the second meeting in October, that provides flexibility, and then we can provide that further direction, but I'd, I'd love to hear from other members of this council. Council Member Brown? Uh, yeah, I, I was just gonna say, um, I think uh, given what we're hearing from uh, the RPD representatives, that whenever it is, you know, you feel that you're able to accommodate that, and also with our schedule, that after the break makes sense, um, and have, putting some you know, by no later than date makes sense. So that seems reasonable to me, um, looking out at the folks who would be um, responsible for uh, implementing that, and I'm seeing, okay, great, thanks. Um, I think from uh, my perspective, from what I've received in feedback is um, uh, posting the list of what is standard equipment for Santa Cruz Police Department to the transparency portal um, and notifying us with an update is sufficient. Um, and there is a um, input, questions, comments, complaints area on the transparency portal um, so that if the list was posted, onto the transparency portal, there is a mechanism for the public to contact and comment um, or, or have any input to that. So um, at this point, I think it's, um, I, I'm not feeling it needs to come back to council. I think it's standard issued police equipment that as long as it's posted on our transparency portal, I think that that would show transparency. And as long as that mechanism is there for folks to um, comment and give feedback, 
that that would be fine. Um, I'm open to anyone else. Council member coming. I just want to see if there's any um, response from our staff from PD on that. So I'm happy to move in either direction. But I just wonder if there's any comments. If I may, the, the only thing I could add is that with the Public Safety Committee, that's something we can have come to us if we need to have further discussion or an update at that time, too. And if it really warrants the need to bring it forward to the full council, we can make that determination um, with you, Mayor, in terms of scheduling. So maybe as part of the direction that um, that uh, it can come to the Public Safety Committee for review before posting. Would that be? I don't know if it needs, I mean, it seems like it just needed to be posted, is that correct? Yeah, I think it just could be, you know, if there's an update or any kind of thing that needs to be brought to our attention, it could come to the public safety. But I think if you want to post it, um, I think that's pretty uh, tr clear. So I don't think it needs to be coming before a review or for before posting. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it's clear. So um, I'm happy to, to, you know, when the time comes, provide that additional motion language, but maybe if we can get it on the screen so that other people can see what that is um, in case there's any public comment. Okay, so at this point in the um, item number 26, which um, let's, let's start with that, and um, this is uh, the second reading and adoption of AB 481 military equipment use and um, I'm going to bring it out for public comment. <clears throat> At this time, we have one member of the public that's present to speak in person. Go ahead. Good evening, it's really nice to be able to speak on various items. I appreciate what was reiterated from the previous time when this item came up. It seems like you guys did a very clear job on answering those all of those questions, so I thank you for that. I don't really expect much comments or support from many of the other subjects I bring up, but uh, our executive branch has a really important duty in this country. And executive branches have really important duties in all countries because uh, they they hold accountable the judicial the legislative system. So it, it is directly about the AR-15. It, it's such an efficient um, tool. And I think it's really important that law enforcement is, is given the proper tools. Um, but so much was not really discussed as far as the other items in this, which the county went through much greater length in describing. And I've spoken in this room before about this and several times with the um, county supervisors. There's a lot of dual use technology that's just not even being discussed, like the technology is already in use and has hypnotized more than 50% of the population. Um, so there were just several items that weren't repeated that were standard issue, and that's all the small cell towers and the large cell towers. There's a lot of powerful ones here. Uh, so I thank the support of law enforcement. Um, and I'm just kind of concerned about issues that people seem to not discussing, discussing like they're hypnotized. And I wish not so many people that I observe were hypnotized. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will look out to our virtual attendees. If there are any hands raised, if you'd like to comment on agenda item number 26, you can press star nine to raise your hand or choose the raise hand webinar feature on your computer. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to council for a motion on item 26. Council Member Cummings. I'll move the, um, the, I'll move to adopt ordinance number 2022-06, adopting the final, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. 
Sorry, motion to adopt ordinance number 2022-9, adding chapter 9.90AB481, military equipment use to the city of Santa Cruz Municipal Code, and also direct staff to list standard issued equipment for the Santa Cruz Police Department on the transparency portal by no later than December 31st, 2022, and provide council with an update when the list is made public. I'll second. Okay. I'll second, thank you. Okay, we have a first by council member Cummings and a second by Mayor Brunner. And council member Cummings, you have uh, one more? Yeah, one comment I would just like to, to say is that I think it would also be good um, with this list, if there's any information on how um, specific pieces of equipment become standard use. I think that would also help members of the public understand that process because um, I think met many people were shocked to see AR-15s as standard issued equipment. And many people have asked how does, how did an AR-15 become standard issued equipment? And so if there's any information that can be provided to help the community better understand the process by which certain pieces of equipment become standard use um, versus some other process where there's special use I think that'll be helpful for people to understand. Having some background lies in the development. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right. May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Cohen Terry Johnson. Aye. Silver, <clears throat> aye. Cumming, aye. Brown, aye. Myers, aye. Vice Mayor Watkins, aye. And Mayor Brunner, aye. Uh, agenda item passes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we're going to take a, let's do a five minute bio break and we will return in five minutes. It's now 5.05 .05 at 5.10, thank you.
Okay, if council members can turn your cameras on. We will return to our agenda in this meeting. Next up on our agenda is item number 28, which has been continued to our May 24th uh, City Council meeting. So that moves us straight on to item number 29, Transportation and Public Works Commission. <laughs> Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. We will begin with questions from council, if there are any. Then we will take public comment and return to the council for nominations and voting to appoint someone to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Okay, so I will bring it to our city clerk, Bonnie Bush. Thank you, Mayor. If anybody has a nomination, or we could start um, from left to right or right to left and just get a nomination. There's one opening. Say that again, please. Uh, does anybody have a nomination? Okay, so Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yes, I'd like to nominate Zenon. I'm pulling up his last name, sorry. Oyate Crow. Oyate Crow. Oyate Crow. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Golder. Council Member Cummings. Council Member Myers. Oh, your mic. John McKelvey. <clears throat> On this, right? Who? Oh, sorry. Okay. Never mind. Sorry. All right. Council Member Meyer, did you have someone or no? Okay. John McKelvey didn't apply for this. Okay, does that conclude nominations? Okay, so the process now, we have um, three nominations. We have two, right? Two nominations, Zenon Yolate Crow and Joy Schendeldecker. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Do we go out to public comment at this time? Mm -hmm. I'm going to look to our audience, and we have one member of the public present. Welcome. Hi, all. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm a first year at UCSC, and I'm applying to be a member of the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Uh, I really wanted to kind of use this time to talk about where I hope to bring experience to this position and what positionality I hope to bring. I literally finished class 15 minutes ago, and I biked down here. And as I was biking down here from campus, I noticed 30 kids that didn't make it on a bus. The bus just pulled away because it was full. And there's nothing they can do. And the next bus for those students that are going to all different parts of the city won't come for another 30 minutes. That's another 30 minutes that they're going to be stuck doing something when they could be studying. They could be going to a job. They could be studying. You know, there's, there's so many different things that transportation especially affects people with. And so as a student, I, we are 55% of Santa Cruz Metro bus riders. And we are one of the most significant mode shares when it comes to especially non-auto dependent transit. And so as a student, I really hope to bring that perspective of someone who is a transit user, someone who is a bike rider, someone who also owns a car and parks it downtown. Having all of those perspectives is what I really hope to bring to the table 
and being part of the City Transportation Public Works Commission and really kind of beginning to figure out how we can make sure that that demographic of students, which are a third of our city, begin to feel that representation, especially on our city commissions. And so with that, um, in terms of some personal background experience, I've worked at the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit District for a few months. Um, I have been a lifelong transit advocate and cycling safe infrastructure advocate since I was 15. I even came up with and proposed and instituted a bus route for my high school. <laughs> um, and so these are all things that I've had experience with and I've been really passionate about. And I really hope to bring that passion to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. So thank you. I really hope you guys will encourage uh, my appointment to the position and I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. I will look out to our virtual audience and see if there are any members of the public joining us virtually. I have one hand raised, Joy S. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome. Hi, uh, this is Joy Schendeldecker. Um, hi, Zenon. Um, I do uh, appreciate Zenon's um, enthusiasm and that he could bring a student perspective to the commission. Um, I also think that I have a lot to bring to the commission um, as someone who uses all different kinds of um, transportation, biking, walking, driving. Um, I've lived in Europe where I you know, love to take trains everywhere. Uh, my kids bus, uh, my teenagers, which is great to save me from driving them around so much. I also have a uh, a chronic illness that's sometimes disabling and sometimes I've it affects my mobility, not to the degree of other people that I know, but it's really um, helped me to be more aware of accessibility issues um, on a from a personal perspective. Um, and I have friends who do use mobility devices. So that's a perspective that I think that I can bring to the commission. Um, and uh, I applied last year as well. So I'm applying for a second time. It's it's something that I would still like to do. And I would uh, uh, really appreciate the chance to participate in this way. Okay. Um, and if anybody wants any more information about me and my application, uh, it's attached in the agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on the Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment? We have one member of the public and one member virtually. Go ahead and thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. I'm glad I made it just in time to comment on this item. <laughs> um, we've already had time to read all the applications, but I just wanted to make my case uh, for this opening on the Public Works Commission. Um, can you speak into the mic? Oh, sorry. You can move it as well to fit your height. I'm used to Zoom. It's all very new to me here. Um, but yeah, I've been a resident of Santa Cruz for the past five years, a student for four, a full-time employee for one, um, recently more involved in the political sphere. Um, but I've seen what this commission has been able to do and the ability of the Transportation Department and the Public Works Department to really make the city more accessible and uh, friendly for everybody. Uh, I've been a member of the San Lorenzo Park Neighbors, which has been working to help beautify the San Lorenzo Park, the playground and the park, in collaboration with the Public Works Department, which has been a great experience. And I'm glad to see the changes that have been made there. Um, as somebody who's car free, I am uh, very familiar with what it's like to live in Santa Cruz without a car and get around only on a bike. And I think that this is an option we should make more um, possible for a lot of the members of our community and something that I would work towards. Um, I'll just leave it there. Uh, thank you for your time. Can you state your name? Brian Meckel. Yes. Thank you. All right. I will bring it out to uh, virtual. There's a hand raised Marina Mays. You go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi all, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, uh, my name is Marina. I just wanted to throw some support behind um, Zenden as a candidate. I think it would be really useful to have some UCSE representation on the board, uh, especially because they are the ones that use it so frequently. So I just wanted to provide some support there. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Okay, it looks like that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to council and city clerk. If we could do a roll call vote, and there's one opening, so you would just vote for your option. Palantari Johnson? Zenon? <clears throat> Councilmember Burke Golder? I just want to say thank you to all the applicants and I encourage you to keep applying um, if this one doesn't work out for you, but Zenon. You said Zenon? Zenon. Cummings? I'd also like to thank all the applicants and Joy. Brown? I too want to thank all the applicants and encourage you to uh, keep your applications on file and current and um, hopefully we can uh, find a place for you. It sounds like you've got a lot of great ideas and you've done some great work. Uh, I'll, I'm supporting Joy. Myers? I also want to thank all the applicants and um, look forward to having you keep your name in the in the application pool for, for our committees and commissions. And my vote will be for Zenon. Vice Mayor Watkins. Same. Thank you. And continue to serve or want to serve our community. But I, I too vote for Zenon. Mayor Bruner. Uh, thank you uh, for all the applicants for this volunteer position on one of our advisory bodies, and my vote is for Zenon. Zenon is appointed. Zenon uh, is five to two. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Joy. And thank you to Marina for calling in and to any other applicants um, that applied. Our next agenda item <coughs> is item number 30, re-envision Santa Cruz interim recovery plan update and draft citywide work plan. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from council, and then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. And at this time, I will hand it over to our assistant city manager, the wonderful Laura Schmidt. Well, well thank you, Mayor, for the adjective. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I'm here to uh, present our quarterly update for re-envision Santa Cruz, our interim recovery plan that was born as a result of the impacts of the pandemic. And then I will also be bringing forward to you a draft two-year work plan that will help us bridge between the interim recovery and a, an updated three-year council strategic plan. So we'll talk about the accomplishments related to re-envision Santa Cruz and do a brief overview of the metrics and then transition over to the proposed citywide two-year work plan. So on the re-envision Santa Cruz front, um, our focus areas, just to ground you, were our three. The first one is fiscal sustainability, basically rebuilding our financial foundation and making sure that we have a secure financial outlook moving forward and rebuild our reserves. The other second focus area is downtown and business revitalization, investing in our diverse locally owned businesses and focusing on the downtown as a center for housing, especially affordable and workforce, um, commerce and transportation, and then ensuring an equitable recovery for our community. 
And finally, infrastructure. And this is where the council did something, I think, unique, uniquely Santa Cruz and amazing. Um, included in the infrastructure piece is not norm just the normal facilities and systems, but also our open spaces and parks areas. So the focus on resiliency, climate adap adaptation, and supporting a high quality of life for health and equity as well. Our accomplishments for the quarter under fiscal sustainability are the De La Viega golf course. And this is just a subset of what is in the full attached report in on base um, on the this golf course. Uh, we've made strong progress of putting together a memorandum of understanding to put together a pay for play feasibility analysis for the disc golf course. Uh, we developed a citywide grants inventory and targeted grant application areas for the city overall. On the Sky, Pro uh, Sky Park property, um, staff has developed an environmental characterization working with a consulting form, firm and have, has a draft report, report prepared. On the cannabis front, um, there's progress on enforcement of illegal cannabis activities and staff is targeting fall of 2022 to bring that back to you. For the downtown and business revitalization focus area, there's been amazing work done by economic development on Pacific stations south and north, both putting together agreements as well as winning millions and millions and tens of millions of funding dollars um, throughout various channels. We've also made progress on baseline housing policies, such as the housing element update, as well as an update to our objective standards. And then on the permanent outdoor expansion program, uh, we are working, staff in economic development is working on developing pre-approved parklet design models and bringing back the overall program structure with the permanent revisions back to council shortly. On the infrastructure side in the workforce development area, we have a funding proposal put to, together for the Congressional Community Projects Program, and that's um, informally known as the earmarks process. So we have a workforce development proposal in that group of items. On Climate Action 2030, staff has made really great and significant progress working with the community and various groups in our city. And we're anticipating bringing back that to you for adoption in August of 2022. And then finally, an, another highlight is fleet electrification and implementation plan and um, a mobile vehicle solar battery charger and our first uh, electric refuse truck operational within the next three months. On the metrics front, and remember that the quarterly report for the metrics lags one quarter because there are certain reports that we get back and um, numbers that we get back, especially on sales and use tax that lag a quarter. On the business front, we're still experiencing mixed results. Um, our business licenses are down as compared to year over year, the previous six months, two years ago. And, um, but we are stable from the last quarter and business related utility terminations continue. Uh, I forgot finish the thought <laughs> they continue we're still having terminations for utilities for our businesses on the construction and building front our permits uh, our applications for permits in that construction space are relatively stable our valuation if you look at the report looks um, significantly lower uh, for the six months as compared to the six months two years ago but that's largely attributed that the La Bahia permit was in there in fiscal year 2020, and that one was a substantial number. On the revenue front, recovery, uh, where we're doing a really great, um, if you look on all the different major revenue sources, our recovery is getting back to the pre-pandemic levels, but um, we need to offset that with what's going on in the larger economy as it relates to inflation and our growth in anticipation of growth is not um, going back to pre-pandemic yet levels yet. We're not quite there. As it relates to health and all policies and our metrics in that space, uh, there's a, a smattering of items here that the staff's been working on. 
on the parks and recreation front, there have been logged about 2,000 volunteer service hours related to park adoption. So that's pretty amazing that the staff is coordinating and working with our community organizations and volunteers to do that. On the demographics front, staff is working um, with information technology to include as part of the new land management system, business licensing attributes as it relates to health and all policies, as well as demographic information for building permits and the new land management system. And then you will see included in your agenda report um, the first draft maps that overlay business closures with our identified opportunity zones as well as the capital investment program major projects for fiscal year 22 also overlaid with our opportunity zones. <clears throat> the second part of the conversation with you today is related to our citywide work plan. So the timeline for an updated strategic plan, the interim recovery plan re-envision re Santa Cruz ends at the end of this fiscal year. So what happens at that point? The proposal that we have in front of you is to uh, plan in October for a fundamental update to our city's strategic plan and then do communities, a community survey in the November, December timeframe, as well as a departmental citywide survey, um, including all of our departments in the same two months of November and December. And then as we get a new full council seated, begin to have council interviews um, and have individual sit downs with council members with all of that converging to a um, publicly noticed Council workshop in January with the newly seated council, and then put together a draft updated three-year strategic plan for the city, and then go through um, a conversation and edits and finalization, have it come back to council for another round of reviews in February, and then um, finalization in March. So that's where we want to go for an updated strategic plan to replace re-envision Santa Cruz. What do we do in the meantime? Our proposal is that we bridge a citywide work plan. And I tried to get two pictures, like the Bay Bridge when it was being built, and then the other one, and they were both out there, but it just didn't work. It was just like, okay, that's just not working. So that was my intention. So this is the new Bay Bridge, which is kind of the city through your strategic plan. So the, the work plan, the two-year work plan would be our bridge. And the focus of the two-year work plan are the projects. And this is an illustration that we often use when having conversations amongst the departments because um, the stuff that you see and the stuff that you prioritize in this project space is what sits above the water line. There's a giant part of the iceberg underneath the water line. So all of the... Um, staff and the resources that we have aligned to deliver ongoing services to one another and then more importantly to the community, that's what sits below the waterline. And the projects that we prioritized for the citywide two-year work plan sit above the waterline. And in reality, that's probably about 75 to 80 percent sits below the waterline and 20 to 25 percent sits above the waterline. Even given that, there were a ton of items that we wanted to put on the citywide work plan, but we couldn't get them all on there because we also wanted to keep the list manageable and consumable in um, two to three pages. And we managed to whittle it down to two pages. So the process that we went through is working with all the departments, um, going back to what you guys have identified as priorities throughout the conversations with you and, and applied a risk-based analysis to all of those as well as other aspects like health at all policies. And we whittled down the list to consolidate and summarize it. That is the bunny that we whittled. <laughs> um, we also took liberty to update the categories. So our three categories and focus areas for re-envision Santa Cruz our fiscal sustainability, downtown and business revitalization, and infrastructure. And then we went further as we identified the projects and all the different things ba based upon risk-based analysis that kind of came to the top as we did the whittling. We also said, 
what have we heard from the council and the community as far as priorities and tried to listen to that and and basically the body of work that we've been directed to, to go about in the last few months in the last year. So based upon that, we broke out development and other foundational policy updates because there's some critical ones there that really are going to drive the future of Santa Cruz and we thought that let's make that and highlight that and put those into a section of its own. We also heard a lot of um, priority from the council and the community and the work that we're doing related to health and safety. So our homelessness response work fits in here. A lot of the prioritization around equity and diversity fit in here as well. And then finally, there's a lot of great uh, ideas and thoughts and priority related to employee and organizational vitality. We just had a really neat conversation about managing stress and opportunities for employees in our workforce in this space, and it is one of the additional categories that we've added to the two-year work plan. Oopsie. Some additional details that you'll see in the draft work plan, um, we considered the impact and the consequences of um, doing the project. We also considered health and all policies and what the main driver area was as it relates to health and all policies and our three pillars, equity, health, and sustainability. That's not to say a lot of these projects in the list hit all aspects of health and all policies. We just tried to pick the one that had the biggest skin in the game, essentially. And then finally, we categorized the service. And in a lot of cases, that, that's mixed as well. But we had mandatory regulatory, so that's a must-do service. We have to do it. And then essential is related to public and health and safety. And then it's something that we have to do. And if we avoid to do it, we're going to have a failure of a delivery system. Our water system would be an example of that. And then discretionary, they're not required by law or um, other mandate, but we are in that business to deliver that service to the community because it provides some level of value or high value to constituents. So that's the first part of the first page of the two-year work plan. Um, I'm not gonna go, go about it in any level of detail each of the color lanes represents one of the categories. There is the actual lead department, the impact and consequence, so that's the risk if we do it or not do it, the relationship to one of the pillars of health and all policies, and then the service category, the outcome that that project aims to achieve, the start date and the end date, and in these um, Gantt chart, you'll see the start date and end date graphically with certain highlighted milestones related to them. So that's the draft of the two-year work plan. Hopefully it gives you and the community a flavor of as we transition out of re-envision Santa Cruz and await the final three-year strategic plan, these are the top priority project areas that city staff is working on as it relates to council direction and community needs. And these are the major milestones that you can expect and the um, trajectory of the timing of how we're going to get there. So that's the proposed draft. Um, our recommendation for council is to accept the most recently quarterly progress update on re-envision Santa Cruz and provide us feedback, and then review the two-year citywide work plan that will act as a bridge to transition us from re-envision Santa Cruz to the new city strategic plan that um, we are anticipating having uh, delivered back to council for final adoption in early calendar year 2023. And that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you, Laura Schmidt, uh, for that presentation, and thank you so much for the visuals. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's very helpful um, amidst all the text. So there were some great updates here. I know I, um, the re plan did come about before I joined council, 
and um, it's great to see at this point a lot of the progress that has been made to date in, in very specific areas and the ratings of the health and all policy and the three pillars. Um, I'd like to bring it out to council for any questions. Many of my colleagues have questions for, okay. We have a couple comments. Okay. Uh, so one of the items in the list was the downtown plan expansion. And so I just, and I know that was heard at the planning commission. And I'm just wondering if um, we have a sense of when that might be coming our way. I kind of see it in a window, but I'm not sure <coughs> when it might be coming to the council. And there pops on Lee Butler. Thank you, Laura and Councilmember Brown. Um, we anticipate having the um, alternative land use scenarios come to the council at the first meeting in June, that is uh, June 14th. And so then council will provide direction at that point. Um, that kicks off the next phase of the project that um, has us developing policies and doing the environmental analysis. And um, then it will be roughly a year of that work before we're back in front of the council for final adoption. Welcome. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Okay. Council Member Myers. Um, I just have a question, Laura. Sorry, I'm looking at the video here. Um, <clears throat> on the on the work plan, there's the capital investment program financing, and then there's also the revenue sources. And so it looks like those are all queued to find out if, you know, Item A gets, you know, you know, if these get approved, and then is the is it envisioned that the capital investment program sort of builds off of off whatever those sources may be? So I'm looking at page one <coughs> under fiscal sustainability. Uh, yes, Council um, Member Myers. Yes, but it also builds um, just above the capital investment program. You'll see a long range financial plan right, okay. project. That long range financial plan is um, a process where we will go through working with a consultant to put together a long range plan for us. And part of that is also how do we systemically fund capital in the city? Because as you know from your experience with the council, we always intend in our budget, we always intend to fund the capital mm -hmm. CIP from operations in the general, from not operations, but from the general fund. And with the backlog of triple digit millions of dollars of deferred maintenance, we will never have that type of funding to be able to do that. So the long range financial plan, part of that output is to determine what is the funding mechanism for us in the city for capital. Okay, that you answered my next, the next question I was gonna ask was how does that relate to the long term financial plan? So thank and, you. Uh, and then the, Kind of related to the two top items on the new revenue sources, we, um, you all formed the budget and ad hoc revenue committee, and we continue to work with that committee on additional sources of revenue for the city. And that um, they recommended the current item that is now measure F on the June ballot, and that's the sales and use tax. And then we're also exploring other revenue options that could come forward as a recommendation for the council to consider for the November ballot. Okay, and that rolls back up into the you know, the interim recovery report, which still just shows a constant of deferred maintenance, basically deferred um, capital maintenance. I mean, it just sort of keeps rolling forward. So yes. all of that gets tied together. Once we know the revenue sources, we do a long range financial plan. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. I know people care about um, all of our buildings and our and our parks and everything else. So that's important for the public to understand yes. that unless we plan for those things and we try to reduce, you know, identify and secure revenue sources, that number is just going to keep rolling down the hill, be more expensive. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see. No other council member questions. I will bring it out for public comment. 
and I will ask if any members are in person to sign in at the sign in sheet at the front on the right of the dais and I will look to our virtual <coughs> attendees and if you are attending and joining us virtually you can press star nine on your phone or choose the raise hand uh, webinar feature on your computer. So the first hand raised is the name I am watching you. Yes, hi. I have regard for the work of the city manager staff and uh, I know they're mostly just doing their jobs very well while accommodating your directives as they must do. It's not just this item, but I do usually feel a bit of mental gagging while reading some of these items. I think it's a defective leftism ideology of HIAP creeping into everything and every plan. For example, I question the priority rationale behind cannabis event privilege permits rewarding someone with a prior cannabis conviction, even weirder, their mother, their sister, their daughter, or someone who is merely low income. If nothing else, start calling high up social justice warrioring in all policies. This is sideloaded with trash leftist equity logic. It's more of chopping some people down, actually unfairly discriminating against them, usually for no other reason than they belong or not belong to some group identity you define, then assigning privilege to others of some other group identity claiming justification exists without real common sense proof of reasonable justification of either action that actually applies to the specific individuals involved and then blithely call it equity. The majorities of the plans contained here do have considerable independent validity in spite of your strange beliefs, but probably contain equity contamination flaws. I find it amusing you regard the maximized chasing of every single source of new funding, creating an unchecked ever bigger government is somehow creating sustainability. <coughs> Nothing is more unsustainable than a government that continually outgrows our economy. As I've always said, one government purpose is to provide what the pervasive majority of the people want, need, and are willing to pay for with ballot challenge to the mixed use library, ballot challenge to the rail trail, making major commitments to unfunded ever more new projects galore. And although I respect your right to ask for more money, I haven't seen a whole lot of normal people saying, yeah, I want my taxes raised. It is entirely possible you don't get the basic nature of government purpose as I have simply explained it. Getting funding alone or signing high up doesn't make whatever a good idea. If the funding isn't local, it's possible you're doing what someone else wants, needs, and is willing to pay for it, not us. Making commitments without funding can be a bad idea. Making all decisions based on social justice dogma can most definitely be a bad idea. Tying the wa waiving of business permits and code upgrades to the timeline of the current COVID emergency declaration isn't needed, although for the purposes of economic recovery due to the COVID government response damage, those restorative ideas stand on their own. Similarly, the dogmatic leftist utopia of equity is itself a farcical injustice, but while an economic recovery for all affected is not, they don't need coupling. I'm saying we need economic recovery, but none of the worst of the leftist equity beta sigma re envisioning. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Let's see if there are any other members of the public who would like to comment on re envision Santa Cruz interim recovery plan update and draft citywide work plan. And seeing none virtually or in person, I will bring it back to council for deliberation and action. And Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Laura, for the presentation and for the work. Um, I think this might be like truly the smallest chart I've ever seen. You could have snuck something in here and I wouldn't, no, I'm just kidding, I saw it online. But I just, I really appreciate your thought process as it went into identifying these and their priorities. It really is very transparent and clear completely disagree with I am watching you. I think um, health and all policies is a really great thing for us to integrate into our decision making, sustainability, equity, and health and well-being is really critical. And I know that um, the various departments have really taken on what that means for them. And I just want to applaud them for what they're doing. And I saw even the equity and budgeting. I mean, a, a really true shift and um, really appreciate hearing that that's coming forward in this interim approach, as well as the metrics to identify success along the way. So with that, I'm happy to move the recommendation 
um, which is to accept the city's most recent quarterly re progress report on re envision Santa Cruz, um, a 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan. And my feedback is great job, check. <laughs> and two, um, to review a draft two year citywide work plan to bridge the transition from re envision Santa Cruz and a new city strategic plan to be developed in early calendar year of 2023. So that's the motion in the recommendation. We have a first by Council uh, Vice Mayor Watkins a and a second by Kalantari Johnson. Council Member Cummings. I had a question slash comment. Um, I'm just wondering the timeline for the three year strategic plan. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit because um, <clears throat> kind of looking at the timing of that and since that's right around the elect the November election also knowing that you know there could be a, you know a shift on the council depending on the outcome of that election um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to that and then have a, co a follow-up comment on that sure council member Cummings this is very like I feel like a tennis person because I need to look over here to look at the slide and then <laughs> over here and then I miss over here. Um, so the intention was to do the community survey in November or December because we are reaching out to the community at that point and not necessarily mm -hmm. the council members who may be running for office and who may be elected. And that was also why we were targeting the department input during that cycle. In, in the fall, late winter. And then once we had the uh, um, election results and we knew um, the makeup of our council, we could start to schedule council member interviews because that's, council members um, should be seated in December in our first meeting in December before we recess. And we'll be able to start getting on their calendars at that point to work with the consultants to do the interviews and then be able to mash the inputs from the community, the departments, and the council members. Okay, and then that, <clears throat> and then the three-year strategic plan in terms of putting all that together, that would happen in that kind of like mid-January to like kind of early March phase. Exactly. Got it. That's okay. probably the, um, that's the kind of work that you'll recall that we did on the interim recovery plan when you were mayor. It's that whole process of going to count, doing the offsite, coming back to council for um, discussion of the draft, going back and getting feedback, doing an edit and coming back again. Got it. That's yep. much clearer. I think yep. when we were going through this in the presentation, it kind of was going in different ears, but that makes total sense. So that, thank you. And um, that helps with all my questions. Great, are there any other questions? Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Just some comments. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for the presentation and report and all the work. This is quite impressive and it's provided to us in a really succinct way. So I really, really appreciate that. I really appreciate the infusion of the pillars of the health and all policies and the connection to all the metrics that we've developed for the health and all policies. Um, just a couple of the pieces in there. I would love to see the grant opportunity matrix and provide any support that I can there. It's really exciting that we have that in place. Um, and I noticed in the work plan that we may be pursuing the illegal cannabis enforcement ordinance. And if that's the case, there's a community group called Community Prevention Partners that has extensive experience in addressing these types of policies. So when and if we get there, I'd love to connect with them. And just again, thank you, Laura, and everyone on your team, and everyone across our city, because it takes, it takes all the departments to do the work that we're doing. So thank you. You're very welcome. The, the departments were amazing as far as giving time and input to the process. And um, we had an interim at the time. Our now chief, Odie, participated. And then we also had acting water department uh, Director Heidi Uvenbach help out and Lisa Murphy from Human Resources. There was a small subset of us that really went off and did a, line, a lion's share of work to be able to propose back to the departments. So we had a lot of fun working together and that was, we called ourselves the Brain Trust and we had a, a lot of fun putting everything together. But um, I really appreciate comments and I know the team will as well because we did really want something to be um, simple, even though I know it's an eye chart exercise, um, <laughs> print it out on 11 by 17 or plotter paper. It looks great. Um, so thank you. Thank you. 
All right, Council Member Myers. Just bring poster boards from now on, okay, Laura? <laughs> Um, I just want to, um, yeah, just also compliment you guys. And I, I just um, also just want to recognize the metrics. You know, like we went through COVID and all the unknowns that was, you know, and who knows what's ahead of us financially. And, you know, um, it's really hard for people to grasp the scale of, you know, as individual people and businesses and others have collapses in their lives. That, of course, will affect the city and then that affects services and some of the long-term goals of the city, including trying to create more affordable housing is a good example. Um, so it's this whole kind of, you know, house of cards, you know, and once it gets unstable, it, it really spreads very quickly. So I think those metrics are really great because, you know, they give you some hope that things are turning around. Um, and, you know, I think the, the, as we move into um, the next phase of strategic planning, you know, really being thoughtful about the metrics and tying it back to health and all policies. Um, you know, hopefully that will stay the standard, you know, and that, that way we can really chart long-term, decade-long change in the city. So appreciate you just continuing to bring a lot of information in a very readable way and also just to be able to do those quick checks on how we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things that this has engendered within the departments and in, in the city is that balance of the narrative and our accomplishments <coughs> and achievements and the work that we do in a qualitative way and then the quantitative piece of the metrics and having both because sometimes the metrics um, bear out one story and then the qualitative impact that we have working with the community and our businesses um, that that has a different story and it's the combination of those two and the council really pushed us to have that balance and I think it will be long living even beyond the interim recovery plan we've already talked about like, what are we going to continue with on and moving this forward but we've really appreciated the balance of it and, uh, and it sounds like you have as well so that narrative piece of it and the qualitative this is what we've been doing versus these are the numbers, and both of them tell the story together. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to accept the staff recommendation in the agenda, uh, and I'd like to ask for a roll call vote. Thank you. Council members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Kame? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will recess and we will return at 7 p.m. for oral communications. Oral communications will be for any item not on today's agenda. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. And if council members could turn off your cameras. There we go. Okay, good evening. Welcome to our 7 p.m. session of the May 10th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. We have just returned from break, and I'd like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Mayor, Council Members Kalantari Johnson? Present. Golder? Present. Coming? Here. Brown? Here. Meyer? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Brunner? Present. Thank you. This is the part of our agenda 
Oral Communications, which is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. For members of the public who are joining us via streaming <coughs> virtually, if you would like to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, you may raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand webinar controls on your computer and you will have three minutes to speak. Members of the public who are joining us in person, welcome and please line up to the right of the dais. You will have three minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name. However, it is not required. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue in this portion of the agenda with each member of the public. But when we are able, we will address questions raised after oral communications has completed. All right, thank you. So I will start with our virtual panel. I have two hands up there and in person it looks like there might be a couple of folks ready for oral communications as well. So um, I will begin with the first person in line. Go ahead and step to the podium please. Welcome. Members of the community and city council, every day increases the unthinkable threat of nuclear war. The US regime wants to crush the Russian regime. Two psychopathic bullies are prepared to sacrifice all of us, the Ukrainian people, the American people, the Russian people, in a conflagration with no winners. Biden floods Ukraine with weapons. He blocks support for diplomatic solutions like the Minsk Accords and Ukrainian neutrality. Do we sit silent while these privileged psychopaths raise escalation to its nuclear conclusion? Do we wait for the blast, the fallout, and the nuclear winter? The imperialist Russian invasion of the Ukraine has prompted legitimate outrage in the world community. But what about NATO's wooing and arming of countries adjacent to Russia. The US government spends more on preparations for war, its military budget, than that of the combined military budgets of the next largest nine governments combined. The, sec the Santa Cruz community, that's us, must speak now, loudly and clearly, every day, every hour, until this war is stopped. Ukrainian nationalists have warred against the eastern Russian-speaking provinces since the U.S.-supported coup of 2014, a civil war with 14,000 dead in the last eight years. We must demand real peace negotiations, end the sanctions against the Russian people, change the phony narrative, stop the war by shutting off the weapons spigot. Only the arms sellers and their hawkish politician stooges benefit. We call upon the Santa Cruz community to begin visible and sustain protests immediately against both these governments, particularly ours. Stop this suicidal escalation before its likely fatal outcome. Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, calls for the withdrawal of all Russian troops and the neutralization and demilitarization of Ukraine before the first nuclear use produces the inevitable and unthinkable outcome. Each dollar spent to fund the killing denies housing and support to someone here at home. Huff calls for, will support, and will join any community demonstration. Please don't wait for the city council or the legislature. Any community demonstration demanding this madness stop before it consumes all of us, housed and homeless alike. <clears throat> Thank you. I will now go out to one of our virtual attendees, the first name 
with hand raised is Steven Svete. Press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? I just. Yes, clearly. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Um, good evening, members of the City Council. I'm Stephen Sveek, and I live in Santa Cruz. I'm not speaking to an agenda item, but to a broader issue of governance as it relates to Measure S and the mixed use project. The Our Downtown, Our Future initiative was submitted one week ago today. The initiative forwards a sustainable, creative, and fiscally responsible vision for Santa Cruz's urban core. The city clerk determined that a total of 5,051 valid signatures, including mine, were received. A number that is currently being verified by the county elections clerk. The number is certainly far more than the 3,848 required to qualify for the November ballot. So we very much expected to be something we'll see in November unless the council chooses to fast forward this. And therefore it's responsible to take a pause and allow the voters of Santa Cruz to decide the fate of the library and of lot four. Many who signed were deeply offended by the supremely questionable ethics surrounding what happened at city hall after measure S passed in 2016. It has been reported that 70% of the city's yes on S voters had assumed they were funding an artful renovation of the Church Street Library, a site where a library has served citizens for over 100 years in its verdant civic center site. Apparently, city officials were quietly developing alternative plans. There are several problems with the bait and switch activities that ensued whether technically legal or otherwise. Foremost, voters will begin to doubt the honesty of intentions of future bond measures and begin to reject them. By practicing this form of bad faith local governance, this city council is gambling with its own credibility. Rather than ramming the current concept through full speed ahead, as the political machine is apparently hell-bent on doing, the right thing to do now is to pivot to respect all citizens, acknowledge the genuine community engagement project that is now certain to come through the initiative. A public vote is coming and I believe it's time for the council to take a pause on any further action on, on the lot four and allow for the better vision of downtown to be presented to the voters. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next member of the public, I will uh, in person, please come forward to the podium. Thank you. Mayor Bruner, I'll try to look around a little more this time when I speak instead of like boring into your eyes, but um, don't count on it. <laughs> I'm up here uh, during public comment today because I want to speak on the issue of truth telling. And um, as much as it seems like a kind of theme for Catholic school first graders or kindergartners or mothers, trying to school their children, I really think that we can't have any kind of functional society if we don't have a basis in truth-telling. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about um, truth-telling and abuse of power in times of national emergency. And so um, it was back in about 2001, I was an activist in San Diego, and the Bush administration was beating the w drums of war um, after the Twin Towers had been um, bombed. And the argument came down to weapons of mass destruction. They were never, ever, ever, ever found in Iraq. And anybody who wanted to educate themselves about nuclear 
weapons and weapons of mass destruction, I argue that that would be the conclusion that you would come to. There were never any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The drumbeat was to involve the United States in an aggressive attack upon another country that was basically not founded, although there were terrorists who, of course, attacked our country, not trying to forgive that. What we need in this country desperately is debate and truth. We need a lots of debate for people to present their sides. We need for people to respect each other. They can be heated debates. They can be fierce arguments. But we need debate and we need truth telling. And we're not getting this. The concentration of power has now resulted in a plutocracy that is also arguably already pretty deep in a fascistic type of governance where big wealth can win all the time. They don't need to be violent most of the time. So I want to bring this back to something that's been really concerning me since it started, which was the COVID scare. COVID was actually real. I, I believe that. There is a real threat. It was a threat to our health, and it was an epidemic. The questions remain, and they have not been able to be aired in a public forum where hot, fierce debate, truth-telling is respected so that we can come and form our own conclusions. I ask people to look at the results. Millions of businesses are gone. I argue that this was the result of an elite abuse of power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next member of the public is joining us virtually with the name Helen Ewan Story. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council members. I'm Helen Ewan Story with the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. As you know, CAB has been the county's designated community action agency tasked with eliminating poverty and creating social change through advocacy and essential services since 1965. We're also part of the national network of over a thousand community action agencies across the country who are celebrating Community Action Month this month in May. Community Action Month is a time for us to reflect on our mission, our partnerships, our values of equity and inclusion, and the difference we make in the community. In 2021, this looked like serving over 10,000 low-income people in our community by providing services such as rent assistance to nearly 2,000 people to avoid evictions, food assistance to over 1,000, job readiness support and placement assistance to over 500 youth and adults, COVID information to over 1,300 people, including indigenous language speakers, and impacting over 7,800 immigrants and their families with immigration legal, education, and advocacy services. And we sincerely thank the city for its partnership, um, as well as current and we hope a future funding support that helps CAB make this type of impact in the community, including our hope for expansion of immigration legal services in the city of Santa Cruz, um, hopefully with core funding in the future. To celebrate and raise awareness of Community Action Month, CAB is co-sponsoring events highlighting housing issues, immigrant voices and experiences, and climate resilience in the month of May. We'll also be posting highlights of our work on social media on Impact Wednesdays weekly in the month, so look out for a post tomorrow. And if you want more information about Community Action Month or CAB, please follow us on social media, visit our website at cabinc.org. Thanks so much for your time and support. Thank you. Our next member of the public is in person. Welcome, please step forward. My name is Ann Simonton, and um, I know a lot of you from being on the commission here for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Ann, I can recently, you speak into the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry, please. yes. Thank you. I recently attended a Santa Cruz Together meeting, and I saw four of you there. And um, I was very distressed, actually, by what happened at that particular meeting. Uh, because I found that the majority of the council was present, former Mayor Donna Myers, Martin Watkins, Member Kalantari Johnson, and Council Member um, Renee Golder. Um, city business was openly discussed, and specifically the redistricting plan supported by the council members. That is clearly a violation of the Brown Act, in my 
as I understand it, as the commissioner. What's worse was uh, made, uh, when Council Member Kalantari Johnson was openly campaigning. As the head of Santa Cruz Together, Lynn Renshaw, discussed to donors how to get around campaign contribution limits imposed by the Santa Cruz County Code. I'm providing you tonight with a letter that I've sent to the Santa Cruz County District Attorney. I didn't do this easily. It was something that I had to really think about, pointing out that I believe that the four council members that I've mentioned, and particularly Council Member Myers and Kalantari Johnson, have violated both state law and our local county camp campaign contribution ordinance. And I have this letter for you to look at. Just to, I'm, I'm asking the district attorney to investigate, to prosecute if he finds legal violations. I don't know whether they will find that. Um, and it's really, maybe it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I hope that it would matter. I'm going to do what I can to let people know that this happened and to prosecute those who participated in that meeting. What you did was illegal and was done with impunity, which was more surprising to me than anything, it was as if you all four get together a lot, or and they wondered, where's Sonia? She's normally here at these Santa Cruz Together meetings. Where's Sonia? And you know that was something that you all seemed to do uh, openly and brazenly. I see that as being brazen misuse of your, our uh, electorates. Uh, when the four of you met without any public notice and discussed your plan for district elections, and Shebra, the uh, last meeting was pushing a map that's used in the June election that's not the map that the city staff recommended. And you, th what you've done by doing that with that map that you have put before the, the electorate in June is, has split up vital minority areas in our community. As sounds, sounds more like you're acting like Republicans, actually. And I think the sea change in how districts are elected is uh, being done without ample time to understand and discuss the implications. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that we can have better representation in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is joining us virtually, hand raised, is phone number ending in 2174. Go ahead and unmute. Yes, um, I believe I am. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. It was much easier to be in person this afternoon. Gillian Greensight um, calling in because I was very concerned and disappointed that there was no public comment allowed for the presentation, uh, this presentation, the one on the update on the library. Um, I, I had uh, participated in that before, so I listened again, but I expected that we would be able to make a comment. Now, the issue of whether members of the public can comment at something labeled presentation rather than being on the uh, regular agenda that was um, raised as an issue and clarified a long time ago over PG&E and they were wanting to cut down trees over gas lines. And they came to council and made it as a presentation and no member of the public could comment. Well, as you can imagine, some of us, including myself, were very disturbed about that and we followed up. And I believe it was clarified legally that members of the public can comment on anything that's on the agenda, obviously not closed session stuff. Um, the mayor, of course, can decide to give little time, but to just not allow comments, and I did have a comment about the trees, which I appreciated um, Council Member Cummings raising that, but the response was totally inadequate. In fact, it was avoided. Um, so I obviously can't comment on that now because that would be considered an item that was on the agenda. But I, I ask, not now obviously, but I ask that you look further into the question of whether the public can legally make a comment after a presentation to council. And I believe you'll find the answer is yes. And if the city attorney's determination is that it's not allowed, I'd ask a second look at that. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Our next uh, public comment for oral communications is in person. Thank you. Welcome. I, I keep stepping forward a little bit early. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Lift the microphone up a little bit. There we go. Thank you. So last week I attended my first city council meeting um, and I was excited to be there and is this re reverberating or anything? Um, and I was excited to be there and see how this all works uh, now in person. And um, I was actually kind of disheartened by what I saw during the first portion of the meeting, um, during oral communications and afterwards, um, because there were so many members of the community that shared out about uh, mainly two topics. Um, and I was super excited to learn about the topic that the other group um, who I wasn't familiar with was talking on, uh, which was about uh, cigarette uh, litter on our beaches. Um, and I really appreciated them. There were a young, lively group of uh, locals uh, who were super energized by that project. And, um, and I felt also that in the response to that public comment, uh, there was a lot of excitement from the council about that project too, and not as much acknowledgement of the homelessness concerns that my peers were uh, expressing. And I just want you to know that there are a lot of young, lively uh, individuals who are also involved in nonprofits and groups around the county who are super excited to um, hopefully work on the project of um, improving the lives of our neighbors who are houseless in Santa Cruz um, and that we will continue to show out um, in the future and that I hope that there's more back and forth on that concern. Um, and I know that there's a lot of history that I've missed um, coming in. I started working with Food Not Bombs five months ago, and it's, uh, I know there's been years of this uh, kind of interaction. So I just hope that uh, we can work together and continue to really like talk about this going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public joining us virtually is I Am Watching You. Hi there. Okay. Uh, I wasn't gonna call in here, but I would mention I went to the Sackers Together meeting attended by council members, and I didn't think anything improper was discussed by them. Member Myers simply explained Measure E, Johnson told her life story some, and anything else said was by other people. I didn't get to speak to item 28, the district elections, because I was fooled by the agenda into thinking it wasn't part of the consent agenda and listed only as a public hearing, but uh, I thought it was identified as a separate item. I wouldn't mind speaking now to that a little. You can stop me if you have to. Uh, in last meeting's oral communications, it was explained why both the six and seven district election plans you finally decided on were probably the two worst variations of possible to present to the people. The opponents of Measure E whine about the lack of ranked choice voting, but ranked choice voting only occurs in 52 of 19,500 U.S. cities and mostly just for an at-large mayor in cities also that have district council elections and ranked choice voting only picks a different winner than the most first place vote getter 10% of the time. That seems like a very weak argument against Measure E. My opinion is uh, what should have happened is uh, something different, presenting not one, but two charter amendments, including a better, more balanced district, equally fair six district plan as described last meeting, but also a novel better seven district charter amendment that ensured a public voting from among the future council members to be a two year term mayor. And then as a default, this kind of seven district plan years uh, uh, should neither of those uh, measures gain the most votes over 50% and at least have a public advisory mayor vote for the seven district default option. All could have been, managed, been manageable with variations of an interim two year period accomplished uh, a seamless balanced full transition by 2024. Sadly, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I believe uh, in public oversight more the better and a two-year publicly elected council mayor with seven districts does that, but that seven district future will only still be possible if he fails. This leaves me voting for the best, least bad option, which I'm not sure what that is right now. Leaving the matter to the 12th hour meant no time was left for further reconsideration. The idea of people with top executive and government knowledge and experience are gonna possibly end um, their high-paying careers to run at large for a short-term lower-paying mayor job are few. 
Instead, the most likely assortment are experienced people like ex-council members giving a part-time effort, some with two jobs, and then the usual assortment of inexperienced, unqualified, radical, narrow-minded ideologues. Maximizing the talent pool and public oversight are both important, and what is presented as a choice either way isn't completely doing that. I suggest that people should eventually be able to elect the mayor either way measure he goes. I point out the current tradition of appointing the recent highest vote getter to mayor in a vote for four type ballot, which is not for mayor, really allows the everybody's fourth choice to actually win the most votes to become mayor. It also excludes the most experienced on the council from being mayor, sometimes appointing total newbies. We can do better. Our time is it's up. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to invite our next member of the public here in person. Welcome. Oh, my name is James. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's been like a few years since I've been here before. Title of the grand juries. All their, 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 all their cases for 2020 was what a mangled web. That is one timeless title. Uh, so during the break, I just went through and found, you know, at least three journals that wrote about this time, shared publicly. Or maybe actually, I wish that I had. Um, so I'm glad I took some notes. Uh, So, where is the city manager? Well, he was on um, the screen earlier. Uh, ultimately, our city and county councils really captured individuals. The folks that voted for you don't realize, and often you folks don't even realize, that once you become a council member, you are actually beholden to city and county managers. And this has really been clearly established before 1915. Yeah, it's 105 years ago. Um, so I'm happy that I was able to make the comments I did earlier. This proceedings is a little bit different, but I'm glad I was here. And it's just like where to start. This is something I wrote three years ago that I shared in this room that I don't have enough time to share. That's okay. So I personally love to be proved wrong. I've thought of doing game shows, what's James wrong about this time? And I had made copies of some information that had to do with the, um, the WEFs making more plans this month, May 22nd through 28th, to have all countries really lose their sovereignty. Um, this has been a plan, 1992, 179 nations signed onto it. And I probably talked to, I don't know, at least 50 people that I looked up to, to when I asked questions to give me an answer. So my friend made me feel kind of foolish yesterday because I actually thought that uh, treaty superseded our um, constitution. <coughs> And my friend, he loves me. You know, he kind of said, you're providing misinformation. And I'm like, really, this is about, this is only about seven pages, but it probably goes into about 21 different areas where treaties don't supersede the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is joining us virtually, uh, Darius Mosinen. Welcome. Uh, yeah, hi. <clears throat> I would just like to make a suggestion that I'm not sure what the um, status of the tenant sanctuary contract is, but um, <clears throat> I have a number of tenants that actually contact me seeking assistance, and there just continues to be a lot of usurious, for lack of a better word, perhaps egregious landlords out there that are still take, taking advantage of tenants, either by um, security deposits, keeping secu security deposits, unnecessarily without good reason, uh, trying to violate just cause. 
uh, for eviction provisions. Um, and one thing I've noticed, and I and I do, and I offer to these tenants is landlord to landlord mediation, and it's quite successful. The next time you try to uh, attempt to stand up a tenant rights, tenant assistance organization, uh, city funded, may I suggest that you engage with landlords to be part of it so they can actually act as peer counselors. That's quite effective and it's a lot cheaper than uh, going, to, going to court. Thank you, that's all I have. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next member of the public is in person, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bruner, and uh, thank you, City Council. I want to once again thank you all for being here in person and allowing there to be public presence here, because um, I think that takes some effort. That would be a lot easier to stay at home and be in our pajamas and leisurely uh, have a meeting. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I would just want to say one thing, actually a number of things I'd like to cover briefly, because I know I have just three minutes, but one thing is, is actually uh, regarding community television, which is broadcasting right now, one thing that I find a little bit offensive is that they, in the midst of every person speaking so far, they cut away to just this screen of phone numbers, which to me is like if somebody takes the time and energy and effort to come here in person, as you all do, that there should be some respect by community television to broadcast who it is and what they have to say, rather than a bunch of phone numbers, because that's what's on the screen when somebody is calling remotely. I don't think that gives people the initiative to be present, and this to me is a little bit of a, more of a democratic process of the council getting to know their community and the community getting to know their council. So I would just like to make that request of community TV. Um, one of the things that I feel concerned about <clears throat> with Santa Cruz at this point is actually some of the developments that are progressing uh, in town. Um, a number of them are on the website for um, the Planning Commission, and um, one of them I will just take as an example is the uh, development that's happening over, well, is planned for where the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union is. I think most of you are familiar with that. I think it's a luxury hotel, or that's what it's being called, uh, with 225 rooms. Uh, one of the things that I feel very concerned about is that they, I think at this point, have and I might, may not be totally accurate, but I think their first meeting that I, that I watched on Zoom, they were proposing that they have five parking spaces for 225 room luxury hotel. That to me is just offensive. And I, I'm, I just, <laughs> it's pretty unbelievable. Like, and their, their explanation was that they would have their valet parking people use the public parking lots that actually belong to the public to park all of the other vehicles in for their hotel. It's, it's just ridiculous, and I, I think, you know, they should be called out on that. And I, I'm concerned that they're playing a game because they've done other hotel developments. It's not their first one. So I feel like they're going to be at a point be like, oh, yeah, you know, you're so right. Yeah, we'll put in 75 parking spaces, and we'll give you $200,000 for some project. Um, that that's still game playing, and I don't think that, I think if they're gonna build a, a large uh, luxury hotel, they should be able to build parking for the people that are gonna stay at that hotel, and I think uh, they need to be called out on that. And I don't know if that's your responsibility or the, the planning commission, but well, I covered one, one issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm just checking our attendees virtually, and it looks like that's it in our virtual room. And it, um, if you're um, not, okay, you're not in line. It looks like that concludes our oral communications. Thank you. Um, before we continue on with our next agenda item, I'm pulling up my notes. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the um, points raised during oral communications and um, one of them was uh, 
from a member, I'm not sure of the name, but um, it was in uh, regards to landlords being part of the process for um, any type of uh, city funded assistance to our nonprofits. And I'm wondering if um, one of our staff can speak to that and maybe it would be someone in um, economic development and housing or uh, perhaps Bonnie Lipscomb or Lee Butler, if either is available. Hi, thank you, Mayor Brewer, Bruner, Lee Butler here. Um, and um, I'd be happy to talk with Darius offline about um, options that he sees um, you know, the tenant sanctuary funding is something that comes uh, through the council on an annual basis. And um, the outreach that we do um, is uh, it, you know, primarily related to uh, development projects and the, the tenant sanctuary uh, funding is, is somewhat separate from um, much the um, tenant and landlord uh, relationship uh, that uh, the city oftentimes doesn't necessarily um, have a, a direct connection to. Um, and so um, th those are the comments that I have, but I'd also be happy to talk with Darius offline and, and um, explore the thoughts that he has. Okay, thank you. And I know Council Member Brown, you had also a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say very quickly in, with res in response to the tenant sanctuary, item um, that is something that the city council has uh, supported funding for the past couple of years and when we initiated that uh, contract we did include direction and they do they do involve landlords in their um, leadership in their on their board so um, tenant sanctuary at least I know is um, set up that way thank you council member Brown okay um, Thank you. I know that there were some other questions brought up, and I know a lot of the information is currently on the city website um, uh, regarding uh, some of these uh, points and questions. There was a question about improving lives of the houseless and our full um, information and homelessness response plan is on the city website. Um, cityofsantacruz.com slash forward slash homelessness and um, we also have various staff and any of us who would be happy to um, talk with you further in a more dialogue situation um, and then also on the uh, potential hotel there was an application for a hotel on front street and that um, all of the updates as it goes through its process is also on the active planning page of the city of santa cruz website so you can follow updates as it progresses through the various stages uh, and i believe including parking concerns um, that have been brought up um, okay Thank you everyone for oral communication and for bringing your concerns to us. And I will bring now, oh, and congratulations to Community Action Board for Community Action Month. I'm really happy to hear that. <laughs> Community Action Board is a, um, has been a very effective and vital part of our community. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. I look forward to connecting with you on that. We are now at our agenda item number 31, homelessness response, our quarterly update. So for members of the public streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, please call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council and then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. 
Public comment for this item will be two minutes per speaker, and we do have one group that reached out for four minutes, and that is uh, Robert Norris with Huff. At this time, I would like to uh, hand it over to our homelessness response manager, Larry Mwale. And uh, I believe you're joining us virtually. Yes, good evening, Mayor Bruner, members of the council, Larry Mwale, homelessness response manager for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and I'm here this evening to provide a quarterly update. Um, and I will share my screen here for the presentation. Sorry, is my screen showing? There it is. Yep, there we go. Thank okay. you. Thank you. It was a delay on my end. Great. Uh, for our quarterly update this evening, uh, there's three broad topics that we'll be covering. The first is um, an update on the homeless response action plan and the implementation. The second broad area is an update on our regional collaboration on homelessness with uh, county uh, partners. And then third, a general quarterly update and progress report on other areas of our homelessness response. So the first topic is uh, implementation of our homelessness response action plan. Uh, at um, the March 8th meeting, uh, we presented the Homelessness Response Action Plan to Council. It was adopted as a guiding document, but in that process, uh, Council asked us to come back at this meeting um, in early May uh, with some specific requests uh, related to uh, additional detail they'd like to see with respect to the action plan and specifically uh, was wanting to see more detail on objectives and outcomes, uh, wanted more detail uh, in terms of support of different homeless po populations and how that's articulated in the plan. In addition, uh, there were city staff positions to support the work in the action plan that council uh, desired to see more information on. And similarly, uh, for some contracted roles that are specified in that work plan as well. So we're returning this evening with updates um, on, on each of those items. As an overview to start, again, the, the homelessness response action areas that were part of the plan, there were five broad areas uh, with articulated goals uh, in the plan, the first being building capacity and partnerships, the second uh, addressing permanent affordable and supportive housing in the city, the third area basic support services, meaning hygiene, sheltering, storage, Fourth area was care and stewardship. And then the final area of the plan uh, was community safety. And so those are the broad areas. The goals were included in the plan as those guided the guiding document. And now we're focusing on developing the implementation details. And so staff has been working on developing an implementation plan related to this that has the detail, um, is beginning from the detail that was requested by council. So um, in your agenda report attached to it was the implementation plan. This is an example from one of the goal areas uh, that uh, to orient you and the public to the information that's contained in the implementation plan that is working on that detail um, to communicate to council and the public uh, based off your request. And so what we've been working on since March 8th um, are the specific objectives and developing outcomes and thinking about metrics uh, where that's possible on each of these areas. So you can see in that detail, each of the goal area articulates a number of objectives that are related to move us towards that goal. Uh, we have identified across the city departments which work teams are responsible uh, for leading each of those efforts. This is the permanent affordable and supportive housing um, 
whole area. So you can see that planning, community development, and economic developments are identified in a number of these, you know, as well as the homeless response team. And so we've done that for each item. We've set some target dates um, to keep us on track um, and uh, where we are currently in process. So whether we're underway, um, if it's something that's moving right now, um, and we'll continue to update those over time. And so we've done that for each of the five uh, goal areas. Um, and I think the other important aspect to keep in mind, that this is really a living, breathing, evolving document uh, that's going to based off, uh, it's going to shift based off of changing conditions and needs, new policy direction, um, and based off as well as what's working. So um, this will be updated over time, um, and we'll continue to bring this back and provide status reports at our quarterly updates on, on each of these items. I think in particular, one of the things I wanted to, to highlight with respect to metrics and outcomes, uh, if you'll notice, um, in many places, there's a level of specificity that's not there yet. It's more increase, expand, decrease, um, depending on what the metric is. And if you look through one of the areas that was articulated in building capacity and partnerships was really addressing the need for data development and the development of regional data systems around homelessness response and working with the county on this process. So presently, there's not robust systems in place to be able to um, you know, measure some of these things in a quantitative sense. And part of the work plan is to really work towards that. So part of the revision we expect to see over time is those systems get developed, our ability to collect data and report out on data, uh, whether it's through HMIS in partnership with the county or data collection that we do for our own programs that may not be in HMIS, um, we'll be revise these and come up with more specific metrics. So uh, at this stage of the development, we're trying to, uh, for the outcomes, indicate directionality. Where there are places where we have specific um, target goals in place, we've articulated those, but much of that work uh, continues to be uh, part of this process. Uh, a second area that council requested additional information on uh, with respect to the action plan was uh, uh, more detail on how this plan supports different homeless populations. And so um, some of the key areas that um, we identify those specific target populations uh, in the plan are with respect to working and coordinating with the county um, on their coordinated entry system. Uh, there's you know, assessments that prioritize vulnerable, vulnerable populations. This includes women, children, families, seniors, veterans. So the extent that our staff and our programs work with the county to get people connected to the continuum of care, it's connecting to a process that, that assesses for some of those, uh, those specific populations. Um, as well as within our own programs that we're starting to stand up that we're looking and, and implementing ways that we're prioritizing those populations in our intake process as well. And so one example is as we're opening up uh, the program with Salvation up Army up at the Armory building, uh, we've identified a list of folks and part of that assessment process is screening for those populations as well. Some of the other things that we're looking at uh, in the plan is that um, the plan calls for the creation of an additional transitional community camp. Uh, and we've talked about uh, having that focus on a specific population. Um, and a couple of the ideas that have been considered are either focusing it for persons uh, with disabilities or mobility issues and or having this particular camp be focused on women only. Uh, in addition, uh, in other areas of the plan, uh, in terms of uh, basic support services, care and stewardship, uh, we've uh, called for expansion of mental health uh, liaison staffing for crisis response to put people uh, uh, more in connection with first responders that are attending to mental health needs, um, and as well as looking at partnering with the county and how we can support the county um, in advocating for the expansion of mental health and substance abuse treatment services. So some of those, those are some of the key areas where, uh, where we specifically look at different homeless populations 
uh, within the plan. Uh, the next area the council asked for um, additional detail was with respect to the staffing uh, that was articulated uh, in the plan to be able to support the implementation of the plan and to accomplish the work uh, that we've identified. And so this slide uh, really represents, I mean, trying to show and illustrate the citywide involvement um, of every department in this work. So just to orient you really quickly with what the different color boxes mean, you can see it in the legend, but uh, the gray colored are really existing positions, existing departments uh, that play a role in this work. Every department has a role in this and will continue to have a role in this. But through this planning process, um, if you can see in the left-hand side, that where we're trying to build capacity to do this work are focused um, initially, at least in these, these areas, and at the March 8th meeting, uh, you uh, council approved uh, an initial set of positions uh, that are in the process of being hired. Um, those are the deputy city manager, the homeless services coordinator, and the outreach specialists, and the community service officers. Uh, there were other positions that were identified and um, at the March 8th presentation that we're going to be brought back to you, and we're bringing back those positions to you today. Um, so this shows a view and where they are. Um, the next slide will drill down on those specifically a, a bit. So just as a reminder of the action that uh, you authorized at the March 8th meeting, those specific positions, um, again, technically added back the planning community development director um, as, uh, as Lee Butler was serving in both the capacity as deputy city manager and planning uh, and community development director. It's moving over back full time to the role of planning and community development director. And there is always uh, in the hiring process for a deputy city manager one uh, that will be uh, provide exec executive level leadership over homeless response among other duties in the city manager's office. Uh, the other actions that you approved were uh, were the home adding three positions on homeless response shelter and outreach specialist uh, and one FTE of a homelessness services coordinator. And really what those that action did is move uh, presently temporary positions to create permanent positions for those roles. Um, with the addition of there was an additional 0.5 FTE in the homelessness response shelter and outreach specialist through this action. Um, and then as well, uh, the addition of two community service officers. So the, the process of recruitment is underway for each of those positions um, and should have those staffed in the near future. Uh, so that has moved forward. Uh, the other positions that were presented to council, but were not presented, were uh, shared with council, but not presented for action at that time. Uh, are the following positions, and we're asking for authorization to move forward with those tonight. And those positions are a half-time building maintenance worker uh, that is going to support facilities and equipment related to the homelessness support services. Uh, the shelter programs that we're establishing um, are going to need maintenance on the structures, uh, the showers, um, and other facilities to make sure they continue to be operational. Um, and then this position will be part of a new division within public works that's focused on homelessness response. So that's the first position. In addition, there'll be two new positions um, that are uh, being requested uh, for a homeless response field worker within public works. This was presented at the March 8th meeting under the title of land and resource uh, management positions. So we've been working through HR and in conversation with Public Works to identify what this role is and give it a more specific title. Uh, but this is the position um, that was called Land Resource Management at the last meeting. Um, in addition, um, as part of that division, uh, they've articulated the need for a supervisor for this crew, a Public Works field supervisor. Um, and then a senior field worker, homeless response field worker, who's more experienced um, and who could be part of a crew lead. Um, so those positions 
uh, weren't presented on March 8th. Uh, they're part of this new division um, uh, to do this work um, and the capacities that are needed to support it. Uh, these will be replacing existing positions that are vacant currently in public works. Uh, and then the last position that was um, also presented at um, the council meeting on March 8th is uh, requesting a half-time community relations specialist to work with the communications manager to implement the community engagement plan uh, for our homelessness uh, response action plan. And in your um, agenda packet, um, you will find a draft uh, communications plan um, that is in the works that will articulate um, the work that this uh, position will be involved in. Uh, the third area that request this, that council requested uh, more information on were some of the contracted roles that were identified in the expenditure plan for uh, the homelessness response action plan. Uh, and this is part of the $14 million allocation from the state of California. Um, so uh, those positions were the contract, not positions, but those contracts that were articulated were first um, a contract expansion of a contract with the city county of Santa Cruz uh, to increase the number of me mental health liaisons from two full-time equivalents to four full-time equivalents. Um, and again, this will allow for expanded hours of county behavioral health staff to assist um, first responders uh, to, to work on a crisis response for persons um, experiencing mental health challenges. Uh, the second area is a planning and proposal development consultant. Again, this contracted role uh, will provide some specialized technical and professional support uh, for the development and evaluation of uh, requests for proposals for the city, prepare operational plans and processes, uh, return on investment ROI analyses, uh, cost forecasting models and templates um, for some of the contracting processes. Um, again, if you can see if, through the reports, uh, given the complexity of the implementation plan, uh, the steps to support this plan um, and manage the various components um, are significant and this additional uh, support to develop that infrastructure um, is needed. The third area is um, a legislative advocacy consultant. Again, this consultant will support the development of our annual targeted state and federal legislative asks and policy reforms and funding related to homelessness response, mental health, and substance abuse disorders. They'll support in tracking legislation and support advocacy efforts for the city on those issues. Um, and they will also support and facilitate efforts to build a statewide coalition of municipalities uh, to advocate for legislative change and funding requests from the state. Um, and that was um, identified as one of the goals um, in um, building partnerships and building capacity in the action plan. Um, in addition, there's a contracted role for land and resource management. This is really to um, provide refuse services to on an ongoing basis uh, for related to encampments uh, and then some special operations related to cleanup of particularly um, large um, encampments um, that require um, external capacity beyond what we can do with staff. Again, we currently contract with a couple of vendors to do this work presently, so this would continue to be part of the plan. And the last uh, contracted role that was identified in the plan was for a, a vehicle abatement contractor to support um, the abatement of abandoned vehicles and inoperable vehicles on the city streets and to work with issues related to um, those vehicles being on the streets. Again, more detail on each of those oops, is uh, included in your agenda report. Uh, the next steps in this process is that we're uh, seeking authorization from council to begin um, pursuing uh, proposals for vendors for these services. Uh, keeping in mind that 
any specific agreements for this work will be brought to council for approval in a manner that's consistent with the city's policies uh, around purchasing and procurement. So the second agenda area uh, are updates on our regional collaboration on homelessness with the county. Uh, and then three broad areas in the updates. So the first uh, is uh, related to our work around implementing uh, the, uh, the work related to the funding from the state of California, the $14 million. Uh, key areas where we're working with the county um, on the, with the, respect to those resources are one, the Hygiene Bay uh, remodel on the Housing Matters campus in the city uh, is uh, release an RFP uh, to do that renovation and remodel. Uh, the bids are uh, close and on Thursday, May 12th. Uh, so we're moving forward with that um, and uh, we'll be moving into contracting. It'll be about a six month project. So I anticipate a contract in June, work starting in July and being completed by the end of the year is the expected timeline. Um, and again, this will um, in addition to uh, remodeling the hygiene facilities, um, there was also shelter uh, space in the, on the upper floor of that building. So um, that remodel will provide an increased level of services on that campus uh, for more persons uh, to be served. Um, the second RFP that we're working on with the California $14 million in funding is a pre-development funding pool um, and uh, we collaborated with the county on developing uh, the details um, and the criteria for this RFP. Uh, and this is really to be a funding pool to make grants to provide financial support to local entities that uh, so they can complete pre-development work that is necessary in order to successfully compete for state and federal funding, like a project home key application. Um, and this will be for uh, those projects uh, that are providing permanent supportive housing, shelter, or transitional housing projects. So there's been $500,000 that's been allocated to this funding pool. Um, uh, we expect to make individual awards in the range of fifty dollars to $125,000. So presently, the, the draft RFP is circulating through risk and legal uh, for review. We hope to release this at the end of the month. Uh, and then begin to receive uh, potential proposals uh, approximately a month later that in June. And so we envision this being a, um, there'll be an initial deadline to review applications. And then if the funds aren't fully expended, there'll be a rolling deadline to consider applications and they come in as long as there's still funding in this pool. Uh, the third RFP that we have in the works um, that is being funded through the state funding uh, is master planning related to Coral Street. Uh, this RFP is on a similar timeline to the, to the pre-development funding. Uh, we're finalizing uh, that RFP. It's being reviewed um, and again expect to have that released by the end of the month um, and then be reviewing uh, applications and uh, awarding a contract um, ideally in June. Uh, and then the final area, this uh, is funding for eviction prevention. Uh, this uh, was presented to council on April 12th. Um, again, in partnership with the county, uh, this is related to the, uh, the end of the moratorium um, on eviction protections. Uh, the county allocated $500,000 to support um, eviction prevention for people who are um, who had submitted their applications for relief from the state. Uh, the city authorized $150,000 uh, to be awarded through the contract that's in place with the Community Action Board to continue to support that uh, eviction prevention work, tenant counseling, uh, legal assistance. Um, and that came out of the California uh, one, uh, $14 million. The other updates are related to our work with the county, um, just um, the Housing for Health Partnership. 
So the Regional Continuum of Care Organization is now called the Housing for Health Partnership instead of the Homelessness Action Partnership. There's this the new government structure uh, that was um, rolled out on April 20th. Um, and again, the role and function uh, remains the same and similar. It's the principal um, planning body, um, develops a strategic plan for the regional plan to, uh, to address homelessness. The city has two representatives um, on the 15 member policy board um, and um, again, participates in the over setting overall policy, providing oversight um, and uh, is involved in the various working groups. So. Um, the former, formerly the Housing Homelessness Action Partnership is now the Housing for Health Partnership. Um, and then I also wanted to um, highlight a new um, county funded uh, grant project the city is collaborating with that um, um, has been in the works. I mean, we're one that just completed and a new one that is ramping up. So the first one is um, uh, a uh, California, um, the governor's 100 day uh, encampment um, challenge. Um, the council, the, the county submitted an application back in December. Council provided a resolution and support. Uh, and this work was, uh, it was countywide, but the city of Santa Cruz participated as well, uh, working to um, reduce the number of persons experiencing homeless uh, in some targeted areas through um, some uh, innovative practices. Uh, so that kicked off in January. Um, they concluded in April. Um, again, the agencies and organizations that were part of this regional homelessness response system worked together, set goals, streamlined six systems and relationships to be able to connect and coordinate with one another to better serve persons experiencing homelessness. Um, and uh, at the end of the 100 day challenge, uh, there were 33 people experiencing um, homelessness, unsheltered who were experiencing homelessness that were placed into housing and another 54 were put on a pathway to housing using a combination of shelters uh, and managed encampments. Uh, and for the city's part, city staff were integral partners uh, in this process, our outreach staff, um, and 29 of the 54 people countywide that were reported to be on a path towards housing were actually participants in the city's 1220 River uh, Transitional Community Camp. Um, and then the new grant project that is coming online is the Cal as a California uh, encampment resolution grant. Um, I believe we mentioned this briefly at March 8th. Uh, the county received $2.3 million um, to fund a variety of positions and some housing scholarships to work with people living in encampments along the San Lorenzo River area. Uh, to provide uh, flexible funding to address barriers and challenges uh, to move people on to a path towards permanent housing. Uh, so it'll be outreach, uh, case management, and these flexible housing scholarships uh, to use in a variety of ways to address the, the needs they have to be able to make progress towards housing. Again, the city staff is working with uh, county staff uh, to help coordinate this outreach. Um, and so we've established those meetings and um, again, sharing information, making those connections uh, to the, from the city who already know persons living in those encampments to connect them with the new county outreach staff uh, to move that uh, forward. So um, that'll, be, uh, that'll be ramping up and um, working to uh, a focused targeted rehousing effort there. Uh, and then the third area now in our quarterly update and progress reports, the first area is um, an update on our existing safe sleeping and sheltering. And the first is our tra the transitional community camp at 1220 River. Uh, it continues to be fully enrolled with 30 participants. Again, the participants have participated in weekly case management meetings. Uh, this program, every participant is enrolled in HMIS, the Homeless Management Information System. Uh, they've had access to on-site county benefits specialists that have actually gone to 1220 River to um, 
and role in uh, for you know public benefits. Um, we've also had special um, uh, resource fair uh, that's connecting and helping support the acquisition of vital documents so that they can enroll for those types of benefits. Um, and then so far we've had six persons um, that have been enrolled in our program that have exited to a more stable housing situation uh, in the four plus almost five months that the program has been up and running. Uh, the next program uh, that I want to update you on is the Armory City Overlook program um, that is going to be operated by the Salvation Army. This is our 20, uh, this is our 24 seven program with meals, transportation and storage with a 75 person capacity. Uh, this program is going to be starting uh, next week, May 16th uh, for an initial 20 participants and we'll begin to add uh, you know, 20 or so participants um, in subsequent weeks until we get to that full enrollment. So uh, we're hoping that will happen in by the end of May or into early June. Uh, so the first week we'll have three different days where we're moving people up and then we'll have uh, two days a week uh, where we are um, transporting folks up and enrolling and then taking persons up at uh, the Armory building. Um, so that was a little bit delayed. Uh, there was, um, because we share the transportation for that program with the county's program, um, there uh, was a positive COVID test that uh, caused them to stop uh, intake. Uh, we were scheduled to actually open this last week, but had to hit the pause button. Um, but it, we have a green light to go next week. Um, in addition to those programs, we're looking at expanding shelter in a number of ways. Um, as we mentioned in March 8th, uh, we are working with Housing Matters on expanding shelter capacity at Coral Street. We're actually working with Housing Matters in the county. Um, uh, in discussions in the last couple of months, um, it now uh, the plan that um, is evolving is that the city will be purchasing uh, the pallet type shelters, uh, the sleeping cabins uh, for the shelter expansion. Um, Housing Matters will stay the operator, but um, uh, it, the county will be contracting to actually pay for the program operation costs there. Uh, we had that cost included in our 14, our expenditure plan for the California 14 million. So those funds could be, um, we can look at using those funds to expand shelter capacity in other ways. And so specifically what we're looking at doing um, is uh, supporting a program inside the armory building for an additional 60 to 80 persons. So continue to operate the city overlook program, which is a 75 person program. But then when the county program ends, it was through, through state funding. So they won't be continuing after June 30th. They'll be looking at other uh, ways to resource shelter, but not at the armory building. So we're looking at moving in and starting a new program uh, that's operating the inside um, after the county exits on June 30th. Uh, and that could be funded by um, the funding that had been earmarked for the, the uh, Coral Street expansion. So that is something that we're pursuing and looking into how to make that possible. Um, so that would greatly increase um, the safe sleeping shelter capacity for the city. Um, the other area is related to the county. Um, again, so the county program will close. The county has been working and focusing on having a rehousing plan for the persons that are currently in the program in the inside the armory building. They're looking at master lease options with local hotels or motels, conversations with a nonprofit operator that would provide the supportive and wraparound services for persons uh, in those. And so city staff has been working with county staff um, to provide information on, on different hotels and different options. Um, so um, uh, we'll have an update um, at the next uh, quarterly update in terms of what develops out of that process. But the county is actively looking at how they can continue to expand um, other shelter opportunities uh, in the area uh, as they're ramping down some of these other programs. 
And then one new development, again, county funded, but in the, in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, is opening a sober living shelter. That's a focused population. You're looking at doing a county uh, parcel adjacent to the county jail using one of the mo mobile trailers um, that is being decommissioned at Housing Matters. So um, I think that just to today's uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, they approved uh, $350,000 uh, to start that program. So that is in the works um, for additional shelter within the city of, of Santa Cruz. Um, update on the status of the city safe parking program. Uh, Tier one is operational at the Santa Cruz Police Department lot with three spaces. Uh, there uh, has not been anybody um, utilizing that space. Sorry. Um, in particular, uh, PD um, in their outreach uh, has been referring folks to our tier two program. Um, so uh, that's where we've been um, having some enrollment. Again, enrollment is still uh, is limited at this time. Um, there's only been two, there's two active participants. We have additional space. There's currently six spaces available um, at our existing lots, four and five that are being utilized for this purpose. We also have additional space at those um, lots when, uh, when the need and the demand arises. Um, as well as expansion plans for other city lots um, in order to reach the 30 spaces that um, were directed by council as part of the uh, oversized vehicle ordinance. So that's where we're in the planning process and the implementation process for tier two. Tier three is the full-time program 24 seven with case management. Um, and uh, presently we're in contract discussions with a prospective vendor and we are expecting a start date in July uh, for a program that will accommodate approximately 20 vehicles. Um, and an update on the oversized vehicle ordinance. Again, uh, in the process of uh, getting the coastal development and design permit uh, through the process, um, again, started off with ZA hearing, then went to planning commission, and then the planning commission was uh, reviewed by council on April 12th. And on April 12th, council reviewed and approved um, a coastal development design permit. Um, an appeal to coastal commission was submitted uh, at the end of last week. Uh, so there will be a hearing with the coastal commission uh, as part of that appeal. Um, that is slated to take place when the Coastal Commission meets in mid-July, either the 13th, 14th, or 15th. And again, keeping in mind that the enforcement of the midnight to 5 a.m. restrictions will only uh, be permitted after that process is complete. Sorry, I keep doing that. And, um, and again, um, the ability to operate safe parking programs uh, in the coastal zone won't be possible until um, the uh, permit is approved as well. So the locations that we're looking at and implementing right now are outside of the coastal zone. Uh, and then uh, with respect to encampment management, we're also in the process for, of preparing for the bench lands closure uh, that we have targeted for July. Um, again, that is a, a fluid timeline setting a target date to begin to drive our planning process uh, and next steps. Uh, but um, again, this will adapt um, and the time is fluid based upon uh, how efforts uh, to connect people to housing and expand shelter are moving forward. So the initial steps, um, our focuses are really on expanding safe sleeping and shelter capacity in the city. Um, I gave you a quick update on where we are in the implementation process and what else is coming online. So our focus is in trying to expand that. And then the other part is uh, working in coordination with the county on connecting folks with services and connecting with rehousing and housing navigation services. So we're working with city staff and county staff on outreach case management and rehousing efforts in that area. 
some specific programs um, and staff that are out there, Healing the Streets program. I mentioned the additional outreach and rehousing related to the encampment resolution grants. Um, and in particular, uh, we're working with county to place a mobile office unit for the various outreach staff and different programs to be able to have an operating office um, in San Lorenzo Park or adjacent actually on county property right at the edge of the park. So this can be their mobile platform to be working uh, with folks who are camping in the benchlands to connect with them around service, service coordination and rehousing efforts. Um, and again, our, our goal and conversation with the county is trying to work with everyone that is presently in the benchlands to develop a housing or rehousing and sheltering plan uh, and work on that plan over the next couple of months um, in advance of closing the benchlands. So that is the goal is to have a plan in place and work that plan for each individual. And that concludes my updates. Uh, the recommendations uh, attached to this agenda report were first receive updates uh, regarding uh, the council, um, the homeless response program services, um, including council requested uh, updates and detail on the homeless response action plan. Uh, the action that we're requesting is uh, to adopt a resolution amending uh, the classification and compensation plans um, by administrative implementing and staffing and staffing to support the city's new homelessness response action plan and appropriate funds for the positions for the state of California, 14 million in the general fund. And third is to authorize staff to pursue purchasing options and appropriate funds for the for services identified in the expenditure plan for the state of California, 14 million, including the mental health liaisons, land and resource management, legislative advocacy, planning and proposal development specialists and vehicle abatements uh, contractor, hmm. and that will return to councils needed consistent with our standard purchasing procedures. Um, so that concludes my presentation and um, I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Larry and Wale. I know that um, this update comes with uh, a lot of hard work behind it. Uh, thank you for um, laying out those categories and breaking it down. Uh, I'm going to bring it to uh, council members for questions. And I did see council member Myers, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Larry, for that thorough um, uh, presentation. Certainly a lot of numbers I have. Um, one couple of questions for you. You mentioned the pallet shelters that Housing Matters um, would would potentially put in, basically program on their, I think on their campus. Is there a count for that at all? That count that campus specifically. Yeah, in terms of how many shelters, how many more pallet yeah. shelters they may be able so, to accommodate there. Yeah. So good question, and then the answer is twofold. And and I apologize. I should have covered that with a little more detail in my presentation. Um, there's there's sort of two phases that we're exploring there. The first is um, that we've been working on a expansion plan for about 15 to 18 pallet shelters on the existing campus within the campus. Uh, so that's phase one, if you will. Um, the other uh, the other approach that we're looking at and exploring and needs more work is um, expanding shelter on what the River Street Shelter site, which is a city property within the Housing Matters campus. Currently, it's not being utilized. And um, really, the assessment is that the cost of trying to renovate it to bring it to a level that would be um, appropriate and useful um, it seems prohibitive. So one of the things that we're exploring is uh, the cost effectiveness, you know, do the analysis on whether it makes sense to demolish the River Street shelter and sort of clear that area and either one dedicate it for additional pallet shelters and or as I mentioned, one of the trailers is going to be that's been used for the demobilize the demobilizing the recuperative care program there, the, the trailers that are being used, K-12 
county is going to use one of those for that sober living shelter, but there'll be, there's still existing trailers that perhaps those can be moved over and reutilized as shelter space on that site. So those are a couple of contingencies. So one would look at additional pallet shelters. The other would utilize those trailers. And so we don't have exact numbers on what either of those would look like um, because part of it is just what the site layout is with, um, you know, the other activities on campus and the spacing that's required for the different type of shelter units. Um, but that's what we're looking at for additional capacity over that 15 to 18 that have already been planned in the works. Great. Thank you for that additional. You, you actually answer, answered one of my questions, uh, although I did have a question about the Recuperative Care Center. So I know that that was a facility. I think it usually provided um, stabilization services and, and housing for, I think it was up anywhere from six to 12 people, you know, give or take. Uh, is that, hopefully that's not being lost in the mix of all the moving around of the pieces over there. I'm just curious about a little bit of an update on that short update. Yes, um, I'm gonna, I apologize. I don't think I have the most up-to-date information. I know we've been in conversation with the county, you know, through our collaborative meetings about how they're planning to continue that. And I know they were planning for that, but um, I, the specific details escape me and I can return with that or I don't know if Lee has uh, his notes with him. Yeah, I can uh, provide some uh, general updates. Um, the county has been exploring um, with Housing Matters how they might be able to continue the recuperative care facility. And the council's aware of the um, 120 permanent supportive housing units that are planned for the rear mm -hmm. of that site. We've entitled that and they're out seeking, actively seeking funding for that. At this point in time, they think that the earliest that uh, construction would begin would be spring of 2023. And so the county has worked with um, Housing Matters and um, various uh, medical providers to, um, they're anticipating that that's going to, that the recuperative care center is going to continue in the mobile units in the back there. And then also um, those mobile units will be utilized for um, relocation of people from the poly loft um, as the hygiene bay is being um, reconstructed in um, the coming months. So actually uh, later this week, the bids open for the hygiene bay um, and that construction is expected to commence in uh, circa July. And that'll be about a six month time frame. So the individuals in the poly loft will be able to relocate to that area. Other portions of those mobile units in the back will be um, utilized for the um, recuperative care. And then once the um, construction starts, um, you know, that those mobile units are gonna have to go. The River Street shelter location is one option for those, um, but it's still TBD um, what the ultimate um, <clears throat> uh, disposition will be of that property. and. The Coral Street master planning effort, the design shred and master planning effort that Larry mentioned, that will inform what we want to do with this site, with, with that portion of the site on a longer term basis. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. That's helpful. Well, yeah. Two quick other questions. The HMIS system, Homeless Management Information System, are most of the people who are being contacted wherever, if they're at the Benchlands, they're at 1220. Are you working to get as many of those folks into that system as possible? And are we having success with that? Yes, um, we are working to get as many people as possible. It's, it's sort of two tier to this. So um, the, the existing HMIS uh, is really dedicated to shelter programs and services. So not necessarily everything that every program that the city is uh, working on or every person in, in each encampment is gonna be an HMIS uh, through the, I guess I'll call it the traditional module. Uh, but what the county is in the works of implementing is a new outreach module to HMIS um, that will begin to collect data on individuals um, outside of shelters that are in encampments. So we'll be able to, be, to begin to get uh, information on who and where they are, um, what kinds of services they may have been in contact with so that we can begin to um, have that information and work on sort of developing coordinated plans. So that is being launched um, 
very soon. Um, my understanding is that there's a couple of uh, existing HMS non nonprofits that are utilizing that system. They're going to be testing out that new outreach module and they'll begin rolling it out uh, more comprehensively uh, soon. So we will have that capacity um, outside of formal licensed users that are contracted to provide shelter uh, and supportive services. And so, yeah, so with the city staff who do our outreach currently, that they do have access to be able to test those modules as, as, as well as use the existing module. That's great. Correct, yeah. So they're licensed users, and we have our program for 1220 River Transitional Community Camp. Everybody has entered in HMIS. Uh, everybody for the uh, program at the Armory, uh, operated by Salvation Armory, that we are opening for the 75, they will all be in HMIS. Um, and also we've uh, talked uh, to the county and uh, when we have a tier three safe parking program that's 24 seven doing case management, participants in that program will be able to be in HMIS as well. Right. And then my last question really is around, um, you know, everything that you just talked about is somewhat overwhelming and I wanna congratulate you on everything that's been going on. I mean, just in rough numbers, I'm adding up, you know, 165 new shelter beds, two new mental health liaisons, you know, 98 people, you know, affected by the 100 day challenge. I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, we have basically leveraged a $14 million investment and we are off and running and people are actually being taken care of, they're being housed. There's more to come, 120 units, housing matters. Two quick questions, uh, one quick question seems like the relationship with the county is going well. We're seeing common areas of leverage, common areas of investment. Um, it sounds like you guys are problem solving together. Um, county's taking responsibility. They got the $2.3 million grant. I believe they helped assist in getting the $6.4 million for the vets homeless uh, housing up in the valley. Um, it just goes on and on. I mean, the numbers are extraordinary and wonderful. Is the count, are you counting the county's cost share in any of these investments? Are we both tracking our investments in, this, in solving this problem? And if so, is there any way that we can at least grossly report that or do you have any idea how to even approach that? And that's my last question. Um, I think there's a lot in that. Um, certainly we haven't specifically talked about how we could wrap all of that up uh, collectively about our respective investments. Um, I mean, we're certainly having those conversations at an operational level. And I think like the one example that speaks to it really clearly is um, the development around the, the housing matters, Pearl Street expansion, right? Where initially we were looking at expanding shelter capacity and purchasing the shelters, you know, the infrastructure and paying for the programmatic costs um, through our conversations, the county is in a position to be able to look at it taking on the programmatic costs, which frees up our resources. So um, we're working at that level. And I think um, I think that could be a next step where we can look at collectively how we're investing, how they're investing, and really how we're, again, leveraging one another's resources, as well as not just in the financial sense, but how we are, you know, through working in a coordinated fashion, are really being able to have a, you know, sort of a co comprehensive response with respect to homelessness and in, in our community. Thank Councilmember you. Myers, if I could dovetail to Larry's comments on there, um, I can't answer uh, confidently uh, because our finance team is developing a really um, intentional uh, financial framework so that we can better track the investments we're making as a city uh, because of the ways the work touches just about every city department. You can imagine it's a complex endeavor, but a, but an important one. And I think along those lines, uh, we're certainly um, going to continue uh, in collaboration with the county to help ensure that the county's investments um, are keeping pace uh, with the major investments that the city is making and that we can more comprehensively report on that collective work across the region. So more, more to come. Um, and there, part of that will daylight as we bring the budget and talk about the ways in which we're planning to, to more closely track those investments on the city side. Uh, but your point is well taken. Thank you. And I just, I'll close. I, I won't comment later. I just want to 
Um, Larry and team, uh, Lee, I want to thank you for housing 38 people. I want to thank you for putting 54 people on a pathway to housing. I want to thank you for seven people who received necessary services at 1220, four who became engaged in mental health assistance, six who got jobs. I want to thank you for putting 15 safe sleeping sites out for people to use. And I want to thank you for getting ready um, another 165 shelter beds in our community. Um, this is really amazing and you guys worked really hard and we're gonna change this dynamic in this town and we're done being hands off and we're more into being active and hopefully helping people get into successful lives from here on out. So these are great numbers, I really appreciate it and thanks. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Are there any other council members? Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Larry, um, and the whole team for all your work in this presentation. I did send a number of questions, and thank you for responding to them um, ahead of time. But I wanted to just um, further ask a, a few of the questions I sent to you in advance, both for the public to hear and for my further clarification. Um, if you could further clarify the city's overlook program at the armory versus the county's current armory program, and as that's going offline and we're coming online, what do those numbers look like? If you could um, help explain that, that would be great. Certainly. So I'll start with our program that we are standing up and opening next week at uh, what we're calling the city armory city overlook which is on the south lawn on the armory property. That will be a uh, program with 75 spaces, tents, so it'll be 65 folks um, uh, full-time, and there'll be 10 on-demand night, you know, night-by-night night, um, spots uh, for people, so a total 75 capacity. Um, and that's what's starting um, next week to fill up and then again, hoping to get to full capacity um, over the next three weeks. Uh, the county's program operates presently inside the building. That's their one remaining program up there. Um, it presently has, uh, I wanna say around 60. Mm -hmm. um, so they're in the process, right? As they're working to wind down that program they're focusing their efforts on coming up with rehousing plans for the persons in that program. And so they will close that program on June 30th. Um, at that time, what we're exploring is how we can establish a new program with new participants um, inside the armory building. And so, um, again, the, the rough capacity is 60 to um, as much as 80 different configurations. There's some side rooms. Some of the issues are questions about distancing and spacing with different uh, shelter features. Uh, the county's capacity of 60 was set by um, COVID. Um, hopefully, there'll be a moment when um, that doesn't become integral to our planning efforts, but that'll be a consideration still as we start. So that's why we're projecting, um, we can uh, open an additional 60 to 80 um, spaces or beds up in the operating the inside of the building. So um, the this will be a new population. Um, you know, the county's exploring its options and ability to have a rehousing plan for most of the people in there. Um, and so they're still working through that, but um, We'll be starting a new program if um, is at least that's our that's our hope and um, intention. Great, thank you. And um, can you share what are the time limitations of these sheltering programs, and what are we doing to support individuals as as they approach their sort of the end of the time limitations to assist them in getting support to more permanent stable housing. Yeah, so this is an area that um, I think we're focusing on and looking at, and this is part of our conversations with the county too, and um, working towards having um, common, if not you know, similar, if not common, kind of uh, 
uh, timelines for staying in specific shelter programs. And so um, the intent is to try to have that turnover to support people to make progress um, towards more stable and permanent housing. And so um, what we've been looking at is something between four and six months, um, at least as an initial period. Um, I actually believe by um, by state uh, code, uh, a shelter is a six month program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of a guiding kind of benchmark. Um, that's what we've implemented, you know, in our first transitional community camp uh, is initial six months um, of, uh, of a time limit, an evaluation based off of progress towards housing go goals. If with extension possible based off of uh, people working their plan, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as well as the prospect of exiting persons in those programs uh, if they are not uh, working on the goals and objectives that are part of the uh, part of their plan that they developed uh, with support from staff. So mm -hmm. again, the goal is you know trying to work with people who are ready to to do that work towards um, securing more permanent housing. So. Um, that's where we're working, looking at now is six months with the possibility of extensions. Um, and uh, one of the challenges uh, too is just there's, you know, there's a number of people uh, in other programs that have done the work they need to do with their case plans, um, have housing vouchers um, and don't have a housing option. Mm -hmm. So that's the tension in this process. But I think conceptually trying to work around six months as a period and then really the work on rehousing plan starts on day one. It's not something that is planned for in month four or month five. That is one of the initial pieces so that people can maximize their time that they've got that space. Okay, great. And so just along those lines, um, I know we're using HMIS for tracking. Um, I believe you mentioned in, in our email exchange, I can't remember if it was in the agenda report, the uh, by names list is... is um, started for the bench lands. Um, how are we tracking across the shelters, at least in the city, if not in the county? I know that's a maybe longer term um, plan that the county's been talking about for a long time, but it seems like now is a really great opportunity to really get a by names list going, um, get folks into the coordinated entry system and then do that pathway to housing. Yeah, I think, you know, with, with the uh, that new outreach module coming online related to HMIS is going to be that opportunity to um, be collecting information um, on, on people sort of at that initial stage before they're connected in those programs. So I think this is going to be the first step into that space outside of HMIS um, with the specific programs and specific shelters. Um, so we do have the ability, we, you know, we can work with the county to get reports um, for existing shelters, and then we would do the same as we develop this list. Okay. Um, they'd be responsible and, and partners in doing the, the reporting and analysis uh, all on that progress. But that's the new functionality is that we'll be able to have that database um, to get information on everybody. And I think Benchlands will be that first first test of that uh, at some kind of scale. Okay, great. And then just two more, I'm almost done. Um, um, great to hear that the safe parking programs are up and running. Um, surprised to hear there's only two participating given that we've heard that there's great need and demand out there. What else are we doing or can we be doing outside of PD outreach? Um, working with county partners, working with nonprofits, working with street outreach workers, uh, to get folks knowledgeable about these spaces and into these safe parking spaces? Yeah, I think one is we can look at, you know, a more comprehensive outreach, you know, plan or strategy, uh, working with partners, as you suggest. Um, again, we've, we've put information out there. Um, you know, the, the PD has been front lines when they go and do um, just normal parking enforcement. Parking is part of that as well, not just PD, but when they go and do normal enforcement, uh, there's informational flyers on the city's program that they distribute. Um, so that's been the principal outreach. So we could look at partnering with other organizations to get that information out. 
Um, I think, you know, one of the other challenges uh, is, um, is uh, right now without uh, being able to enforce in the coastal zone, uh, right now uh, folks, you know, can park for 72 hours without citation. Um, so an overnight program isn't particularly attractive. Mm. Um, because you'll have to move every night rather than every 72 hours. So I, that is, I think, you know, something that is capping uh, interest uh, mm -hmm. presently for a Tier 2 program. Mm -hmm. I think we'll get some good insight onto that when we're able to set up our Tier 3 program and see what the interest is on a 24-7 program where people can be for an extended period of time. Again, we're trying to align the timeline for participation in that program with other shelter programs. So we're looking around six months initially, that four to six month range with case mm -hmm. management. Um, but that might in some respects be more appealing to some folks because it's a 24 mm seven -hmm. location mm -hmm. that you can stay and not have to move. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are some, you know, for the tier two enrollment right now, that might be part of what is explaining it. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly I think we could look at additional outreach to test and validate um, what the reasons are for low, low enrollment at the moment. Got it. Okay. And um, then just, um, uh, I have other comments later, but one point to pull um, from what Councilmember Myers was saying in terms of counting the county investments um, outside of what Human Services, um, Housing for Health, and Health Services Agency Behavioral Health is doing. There's a lot of other work from other departments as well. I just worked with the Public Defender's Office, the DA's Office, probation and courts on a $6 million grant to provide behavioral health services who, for those who are criminal justice involved, many of them who are unhoused. So there's just, there's, there's a lot happening across the departments, across the county that I think if we kind of sit down and dive deep, we'll see that, that we can um, leverage the resources in a more efficient way. So that's it for now. I'll have more comments later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation and a very thorough agenda report. I think as been said, there's certainly been a lot done, and sure, we have a long way to go as well, but um, the process requires us to continue to keep our, um, kind of our foot on the pedal, if you will. I guess I have a couple of clarifying questions that um, haven't been asked already in regards to the, a couple of the proposed positions, and I don't know who, if maybe this might not be for you, Larry, but um, there's two that sort of stood out as kind of being a little bit high to me, and I just wanted to see if I could get explanation, and one is the half-time community relations specialist, um, the budget being over 100000 for that. I'm assuming that's not a, um, a benefited position, and the other is for the Coral Street Master Planning and Design Services amount. That too seemed kind of high, so I was wondering if there could be an explanation as to why those figures are what they are. So with respect to the community relations specialist position, um, and I may defer to HR if there's somebody um, here, but my for that half-time position, though, I think uh, the cost is because it, it is benefited oh, it is on benefited. top of that. So... So at that halftime level, then, you know, there, there's eligibility for benefits that um, are similar to a full-time equivalent cost. Okay. That's, that helps. I didn't realize that. I assumed that it wasn't benefited, but that's just based on my um, other background. So a halftime position at the city is benefited or potentially benefited. Is that correct? Okay. And then um, for the... For the design services, is that something that, like, what does that entail in terms of the work, I guess, the scope of work for that? Right, um, so there's, oh. It, it, go right ahead, Larry, and I, I can just, <laughs> No, I think it'd be great uh, to have right. uh, your planning hat answer all of that. Sure, happy to. Um, so uh, we are planning release an RFP later this month for uh, master planning effort um, and design charrette. And um, essentially that would involve a consultant um, doing stakeholder interviews, gathering background information, holding a design charrette. Typically these are uh, multi-day charrettes. Um, you know, we haven't put that specifically in the um, RFP because we want to um, provide that flexibility for consultants to come up with their own 
um, approach to how they would handle the, um, the work. But oftentimes those are multi-day charrettes where they come in and they um, uh, do information gathering that first day. Um, and then they come back with, with um, uh, potential alternatives the second day. And then they, they mold those together and um, come back on the third day and vet um, some options for how we might um, plan for the different services. And so um, that would involve both identification of the range of services that we need um, with the different stakeholders, our um, nonprofit partners, the county and ourselves with the city, um, as well as then looking at um, some of the um, uh, land use opportunities, um, using architectural expertise to understand um, what um, dimensions are going to be successful for buildings and the floor plate sizes, as well as for the parking needs out there and how that overall um, uh, streetscape and uh, the properties along that streetscape can be planned to um, accommodate all of those uses. And um, what we would anticipate of, as that uh, from that is um, really a um, conceptual plan that um, speaks to here are the uses and intensities of those uses that you um, should potentially be considering and how they might fit together, but it wouldn't necessarily include the, um, the specific land use changes. In fact, I don't anticipate that it would include the land use changes. That would be a subsequent um, effort and that would have the CEQA components to it and the, the real analysis. This is more, how might we, how might we structure our investments now um, and what are the steps that we need to take from a land use and um, design perspective and, and prioritization perspective in order to get there? So um, that consultant effort um, would be um, condensed but intensive. And um, we, we don't know how much that's going to come back at, but we do think that we'll have sufficient funds in there for that particular portion. Um, now, uh, there are also within that um, pre-development funds um, for um, future development um, at, on, along Coral Street, right? So once we identify here are the uses that we want to focus on, we need to start taking those next steps in terms of both the land use changes as well as um, starting to put plans together so that we can go out and secure funding. And so the 14 million includes um, allocations for both of those, the, the initial uh, master planning effort and then the future um, uh, pre-development fund. Great. Thank, you. Thank you for the clarification. I was just wondering what it encompassed, so I appreciate that. Sure. Right. I think that concludes my questions. Okay, Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Larry, for the presentation, and thanks to the entire team for all of the work you've done. I know it's complex, it's, um, it's challenging in many ways, and it's just really wonderful to see uh, so many of the things that I've been advocating for and many of us have been advocating for for decades now, um, uh, both myself as an activist prior to being on the council and during my time on the council to see this kind of coming together is is really heartening um, and having talked with uh, somebody who's involved in the tier three uh, um, safe parking program or, or hopefully going to be uh, managing that um, just you know their excitement enthusiasm um, just really ma made me feel like this you know this is something that's going to make a really meaningful uh, difference in people's lives um, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, since we're talking about the kind of budget for some of these uh, additional um, uh, functions, some of which are intended to be staff, uh, city staff, uh, ongoing, and some are as contractors. Um, and I'm going to just say it again. Um, I, I see um, well, about half a million dollars here for. Uh, you know, planning and proposal development consultant, and then a legislative advocacy consultant. Um, so we we have a very robust administrative and consultant budget. Uh, I'll say that, um, and I understand that there are um, 
good reasons to uh, want to seek out that additional support and um, that there can be a significant return on that investment. Um, so I, but I did just want to ask about um, kind of how you're thinking about that. I see that um, agreements for services will come to us if they uh, meet the criteria uh, for needing council approval. Um, but they're pretty big ticket items and um, you know we spend a lot of time um, on this city council spends a lot of time talking about um, the <laughs> creating uh, accountability and evaluation metrics for our service providers for um, the people who are serving very poor people and marginalized people in our community we make them jump through a lot of hoops um, and so I'm just wondering if um, what kind of um, evaluation metrics we'll put in place for these kinds of uh, functions uh, to ensure that those investments are um, paying off and um, at what point might we, um, depending on the outcomes, determine whether or not it's, it's worthwhile to continue to, to do that. Um, I, I just don't want to see um, another half a million dollars built into our budget for... Um, things that um, may or may not actually add value to the city. And, and I'm not saying they won't. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, ho I'm hoping they will, um, but it's a lot of money. Um, and we obviously have um, sig significant uh, kind of field operation needs. So just would love to hear a little bit more about those. And since you laid out a little bit more about the um, housing matters, the Coral Street campus, I thought maybe we could hear a little bit more about those too as well. Certainly. So I think, you know, um, starting with the legislative advocacy consultants, I think certainly that's one area where we can more uh, readily identify return on investment since part of that scope of work will be um, doing advocacy to get policy changes that may change funding formulas that can bring more money to the city or identify new funding or potential earmarks. And so I think that's from at least from a fiscal sense, has the potential to be more readily um, evaluated in that context in terms of the practice. Of course, that is just a piece of the work. I think the other part is, again, just adding that additional capacity to be able to track the relevant legislation, to give us updates, to work on coordinating that statewide coalition of cities of similar size like Santa Cruz that are dealing with these big city challenges with respect to homelessness, but not having the same kind of seat at the table uh, in Sacramento. So um, there's multiple aspects of the work. And again, there's that's additional capacity that's needed to do that work. And in many respects, it's not just the direct return on investment that sort of we're, we're not keeping pace if we're not able to keep track of um, where things are moving in the legislative arena. Uh, so I think we can with that position there. Um, um, and again, that we'll be able to assess on an ongoing basis whether or not that's a, that's a good recurring investment. I think, too, with the planning, that area of planning and proposal development consultants, um, there are a number of items uh, where, again, we need additional capacity as we're getting this infrastructure uh, to help us work and develop requests for proposals and, and develop work towards a certified vendor list. I think there's sort of one, some one-time kind of tool um, development that's part of that that existing staff doesn't have. We don't have the capacity to be dedicated. In some respects, don't have the specific expertise and experience. Uh, there may be parts of that that there may be an ongoing need, but I see a, a good part of that are really helping develop kind of the infrastructure to get us in place to be able to do our work more efficiently. So um, I would not expect that to be as high um, if it was coming back in subsequent years. Um, and again, trying to figure out the metrics um, might be a little less direct. Um, but um, again, I think we may be able to quantify in terms of, you know, are we successful in, in streamlining some of our RFP processes? Do we feel like we have better better um, fiscal processes or managing where we can look at what our overall costs are and be in a position to make better decisions about how we're investing our dollars through some of the tool development. Thank you. 
I have one comment that I know it's not comment time, but I just I feel like I want to say this because it's come up, and the question was about um, how it is that um, people who are looking for safe parking um, access uh, and interface around the safe parking program. Um, and I mean no impertinence when I say this, but um, I think that um, as Council Member Kalantari Johnson suggested, looking at ways to um, conduct outreach to give people uh, an interface that is not just through the police department um, will make a big difference as well. I think the 24-7 thing is, is clearly, I mean, you, you really hit the nail on the head with that. Um, but I just, knowing um, what I experience and the conversations I have, because I do spend quite a bit of time out um, talking with unhoused people and um, uh, being in, in the encampments, um, that going into the police station to see if they can, if someone can find a place to park is not necessarily something that um, uh, a, a large segment of the population would be um, feel comfortable with. So, and again, I, I just want to say that as a just logistical barrier and no um, commentary on um, how the police department is handling that. Um, I just think we should be thinking about a more uh, um, community-based approach to reaching people. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a number of questions, and many of which have been answered, but um, some some other issues have come up. I'm wondering if first we could start, if you could just define H, I know people have been saying that HMIS, and oftentimes acronyms get thrown around, and maybe members of the public don't know what we're talking about. So I'm wondering if you could just start by explaining what that is and what that system is so that people can kind of be aware of what we're talking about when, as it relates to that. Certainly. So HM, HMIS stands for Homelessness Management Information System. And that is the data collection system for uh, that is uh, administered through the local continuum of care agency, which is the Housing for Health Partnership. And that's where the information is collected on persons who are enrolled in those county um, funded programs that are providing shelter and support services. And so this is a tool, you know, it's part of the case management. It has, you know, uh, the information on uh, personal information, on uh, names, dates of birth, um, as well as then service connections, you know. So every service provider um, that's part of that network um, if they receive us, that person receives a service, case notes and documentation goes in there to be able to track their progress. You can see, you know, um, through that, whether um, what their housing outcome is in terms of if they are successfully find permanent housing, whether that happens or not. Um, and so you can track that and sort of you know, use it as a tool as well for monitoring ongoing performance, but then also looking at outcomes. Great. And I wanted to follow up because I know that myself and um, Mayor Bruner were contacted by a woman about a service called Giseki. And um, the this service was a platform that uses text messaging through phones to connect people to services. And I know we forwarded this information on to staff. I don't know if there's been any communication between staff and um, that individual around that service. So I'm, just wondering if you can maybe speak to that because if that person's watching, just being, and not even if they're not watching, just being able to give them an update on, you know, where that those conversations are, is that a, a possibility of use? Because it sounded like a tool that could be used not only by providers, but also individuals in the field who, if they needed um, to be connected to a doctor or potential employer or what have you, that they could actually use um, this service, which is kind of using an, an um, AI platform to help connect people who need services with those services and so I'm wondering and it also tracks all the interactions and engagement and so I'm wondering if you can maybe speak to that yeah thank you for first for forwarding that information um, I have not had a chance to follow up yet um, but that is something on this to-do list um, once to find out more information about the functionality how it might be useful how 
Um, as I mentioned, you know, one of the pieces that we need to develop as this process is to have better data collection tools and better systems. And not everything that's part of the city's plan may be possible to work through HMIS, just given the, the kind of the, the parameters around how they're collecting data in HMIS. So we may be needing to look at different tools so that we can do some uh, monitoring and data collection of our own programs in some ways. So figuring out that functionality, um, I think will be useful. So um, that's on my to-do list. Great, thanks. And then just so other council members and members of the public are aware, it sounded like the technology can also be used to determine when there are beds that are open versus um, beds that are filled and knowing that that type of communication is something that will be useful, especially if we're trying to move people into beds and into services, it could be effective in that regard as well. Um, the next question I had was related to um, kind of the discussion around the sober living shelter and um, the beds at Housing Matters. Um, one of the things that was brought to my attention, and some of this was answered earlier, but I wanna make sure that the public is aware, um, the County Board of Supervisors on their agenda today um, had an item related to the sober center project um, and the purchase of um, a modular uh, facility that could be used. And one of the things that was mentioned in that um, agenda report, um, I'll just quote it in one of the paragraphs, was that in December 2021, Housing Matters informed the county that they were unable to secure sufficient funding for their permanent housing project and therefore could no longer commit to donating the modular to the county. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we could speak to that because, you know, if I think we're anticipating that Housing Matters is gonna move forward with construction of this 121 or 120 uh, bed facility, but based on this agenda report that went to the county today, um, it seems like it was mentioned that um, in December, 2021, they weren't able to come up with all these funding these funds to make that happen. And so I'm just curious, um, and maybe if we could speak to it so that the public's aware, kind of where that's at and what opportunities there are for the city to help, because I think one thing that we all agree on is that we need more beds. And if it seems like Housing Matters can't um, find the funding to build those beds, what opportunities are there for the city to partner with Housing Matters to make sure that we can actually ensure that those beds are built? We've got three of us on. Who would, who would I was like gonna to say? Hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start, but Matt, if you want to go for it, Lee. Okay. Got the info. All right. Um, so um, back in uh, December of 21, the um, the Housing Matters team was considering um, whether or not they would be able to um, submit for the. Um, project home key round that would um, uh, that had the uh, not technically an expiration but the, the first deadline of uh, January 31st of this year and um, they recognized that um, they weren't going to be able to meet some of those deadlines in particular with respect to the lead time that was necessary for their um, uh, for the um, offsite factory production that needed some more lead time. And so they recognized if if we were to apply for and receive home key funding, um, we aren't gonna be able to meet those uh, criteria. So I expect that that, um, that, that portion of the, um, the board's report from the staff at the county, um, that was in relation to that. So back in December, there was a consideration, hey, we're going to be giving away. You know, they, they had said, we've got these trailers that we're going to be giving away. And then, you know, as often is the case in this realm, things shifted. And they said, all right, well, you know, what could we be utilizing these for? And they're not necessarily going to have to kick people out and move those off campus. And so do we want to continue to utilize them? And might they be a part of our plan? So that's what I was mentioning before with respect to the um, use of those trailers now to house the people from the Pauli loft. And so that has been a dynamic approach. I do know that um, the 
um, Housing Matters team has put in an application for No Place Like Home funding, and um, they have indicated that they would hear back in, um, in June as to whether or not they receive that No Place Like Home funding. If they do not, then um, I think that they would also be um, looking at whether or not um, Project Home Key, the next round of Project Home Key, might offer an opportunity for funding. So they're looking at a wide range of funding. And um, similarly to how the situation is dynamic on the housing matters and the situation has already been dynamic on our end with respect to how we've been um, using and, and planning to use the 14 million um, with the example being that, er, that uh, Larry mentioned um, earlier with respect to the county providing some of the funding for operations of the uh, pallet shelters um, or similar um, sleeping cabins uh, on and around the Coral Street area and us redirecting some of that funding to um, look at a sheltering facility up at the armory. So I think um, we will continue to need to be nimble as we um, understand what the needs are. And, and that is a really key project for our community and one that we absolutely want to see built because um, that's gonna provide um, very much needed permanent supportive housing. And um, that that's gonna be a key uh, component to um, our overall homelessness response efforts. Great. Um, follow up to that. Uh, well, actually, pivoting a little bit. Um, I'm just curious how, if we could speak to how many people are in the Benchlands currently, and kind of what's the plan. I mean, it sounds like you know the there's a June date of demobilization of that. Um, it sounds like there's some flexibility around that as well. Um, there are people who, for example, are in the Armory currently and something's gonna happen with those people, I guess there's no guarantee they'll all get into housing. Um, and having walked past there, you know, a couple days ago, there's a lot of tents and a lot of people down in the Benchlands. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe speak to that and then I have a follow-up question afterwards. Sure. Um, so uh, getting an accurate census is very difficult. Um, and counting tents recently, um, in the range of around 270 to 290 tents. Um, and again, um, there's not always one person, one tent. Some tents are storage. Some of uh, folks have a tent in the bench lands and some other encampments. So it's really hard to get a person count. Uh, but that is, you know, a kind of a useful metric to get a sense of the scale of the number of people that are down there. Um, and that is certainly an increase from the beginning of the year. I think most recently, um, Caltrans closing encampments around one and nine uh, put a significant um, additional number of persons uh, in the bench lands, uh, you know, particularly the group right um, underneath and adjacent to the Water Street Bridge at that end uh, is mostly persons from that encampment. So that is the size of the problem. Um, that uh, we need to work on, um, on, on uh, uh, for the demobilization. Um, so uh, it's a significant number of people that we're trying first and foremost, I think, to expand shelter and housing options. I think that's what our first focus has been, um, as I articulated in the, you know, the presentation. First, working on expanding the shelter and two, collaborating closely with the county and through the additional outreach um, positions and programs uh, through the grant funding they have to be working on the ground there in the bench lands to make contact with everybody um, they can to begin to develop that plan as soon as possible so we have as much lead time before uh, July um, to um, hopefully find alternative housing options. So that's the, that's the initial focus. Um, and we'll see, and like I said, that's the flexibility. We'll see how successful um, these various plans are for expanding shelter and getting additional capacity to be able to move people from the bench lands to those uh, sites. 
as well as what are the other housing options through the rehousing efforts and support services through the outreach and case management over the next two months to begin to work on reducing that number. And um, we'll be able to evaluate on an ongoing basis how successful those different efforts are that will inform the specific timing of when we'll be closing the bench lands um, and then what's required and, and what the plan is for the persons that continue to remain. Uh, we do know that not everybody who um, is there right now is going to be interested in uh, the shelter options that may be available or uh, work on developing a rehousing plan. Um, but our goal and our effort is we're going to have a place um, to the best of our ability for those who want uh, a shelter space to be able to have one available um, with this timeline. Thanks. And then the follow-up to that is, um, you know, the 1220 River Street, I mean, well, one, you know, there's a lot of staff that are being proposed to be hired. 1220 River Street, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do remember in the past that the capacity there was probably around 60 to 70 tents that it could accommodate. And, you know, it seemed like things were actually going pretty well there in terms of being able to accommodate people. Um, understanding that, you know, giving everybody each individual case management takes some effort, but again, we're investing in that right now. And I'm just wondering what opportunities there are to expand the number of tents at 1220 River Street. And this ties into the um, bench lens, and this is somewhat of a comment, but uh, one of the things that um, many people that I've been speaking to are concerned about is that if we demobilize uh, and the bench lens at the end of June, you know, we're getting into fire season. And if we don't have enough capacity and we kick everybody out of the bench lens, there's a high likelihood they're going to go into the Poconip. And, you know, given that we're coming off of, we're still, you know, recovering from one of the worst fires in the history of our community. Um, I think there's a lot of concern about people going into the forest and then that increases fire risk because right now, you know, fire risk would be low in the benchlands. Obviously, we need to get people move, you know, out of that flood zone before the winter. But, you know, the concern around closing the benchlands and then people moving into the forest, I think, is something that's of, of great concern. And so I'm just wondering, you know, is there the potential to expand the capacity at places like 1220 River? I mean, it sounds like we're going to meet the same capacity indoor at the armory. We're going to have 75 more tents up there. There'll be potential for safe sleeping in RVs. And so I'm just wondering if we could use 1220 as additional capacity to try to keep people from moving into some of the more sensitive habitats. Yes, I mean, those um, that those concerns about fire risk are real and, and something that we need to look at how we can mitigate. Um, with respect to 1220 River, um, there is uh, space for additional tents, but um, to do that would fundamentally alter kind of the, nat the nature of the program as it's operating now. The... Um, these smaller camps, maxing at around 30, uh, where they are, you know, we have staff that are there on site every day, but not full day. These are, uh, you know, self, to some degree, self-managing communities, and they're building community, and you can build community uh, amongst your neighbors with 30, but if you start to put more people into that size of space, uh, the ability to create that community and work together cohesively becomes really challenging um, and would make it more difficult, again, for the, you know, providing the case management and supporting people to make progress towards uh, those, you know, permanent and more stable housing options. So it's to some degree a trade-off between um, results and effectiveness and sheer number of shelter beds. So in terms of the pure capacity, you're absolutely right. Previous versions of 1220 River have had more people on that site but with a very different program design. It was a 24-7 staffed camp, is my understanding. Um, so it had a different level of staffing, a different cost associated with that as well, um, and was a very different environment with very different kind of end goals. So um, that is one of the trade-offs, I think, in terms of trying to stand up additional transitional community camps, finding locations to operate these smaller, more outcomes-focused, self-managed camps 
uh, is certainly a strategy that uh, we're looking at implementing. Um, I think is a better long term um, in terms of trying to move people successfully through that pathway towards housing. Um, but it means fewer people in those sites. Great. Um, thank you for that. And then I guess my last question, um, just doing some kind of back on the napkin calculations, looking at kind of year two, um, just focusing on services, it's about $5.6 million um, moving forward. I'm wondering if someone can speak to, you know, what we anticipate should the revenue measure move forward, how much annually we could anticipate generating from that um, based on kind of current projections and how that, um, you know, how much of that generated revenue would go towards these services. I know this is something that the community cares deeply about. I also know that um, there are a lot of competing needs in the community around infrastructure, um, employee compensation, you know, new equipment, what have you. And so I'm just wondering how much of this is going to, how much of the revenue should measure F pass, how much of that would actually go towards, um, you know, kind of, maintaining these services because this is all one time in the um, the sheet that we have and um, you know 5.6 is unfunded moving forward so I'm just wondering if someone, if someone could speak to that yeah, Larry I can take a crack at that uh, thanks for the question Councilmember Cummings um, so our most recent estimated um, revenue for measure F that um, our finance team put together was approximately eight million dollars annually what we anticipate that measure to generate based on today's figures and uh, where the economy is currently going. Um, your question as to how much of that would be directed towards homelessness response will be a future decision for the council to make. Um, it's true that the homeless action plan as it stands now does not have a number of the positions funded in year two and year three. So there will be future decisions um, around how best to use the Measure F funds if uh, the community decides to support it. Um, and I think you know the, the burden is on us to continue exploring what other funding options we might be able to tap into as well. The governor, as part of the, the state budget proposal just over the, the past couple of weeks, has made a major commitment to continuing to expand funding. Uh, for homelessness response as well as uh, mental health and substance abuse programming so that is um, encouraging and our hope is we continue moving through this including the statewide advocacy that larry had mentioned earlier this evening um, that the burden wouldn't be fully placed on our general fund and we continue to explore those other options so um, time will tell all right that concludes my questions thank you very much uh, Council Member Golder. So I just want to say thank you, Larry, and I support um, um, your microphone. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Larry, and to the rest of the team. I do support. I do support um, the idea of having advocacy at the state and federal level. I think this is obviously an issue that's bigger than Santa Cruz, and we won't even make a dent without that level of support. Um, and I also think that any money that we invest now in in um, in this will hopefully offset some of the money that we've been spending out of our general fund in other departments and um, it will save us money in the long run is what I'm hoping to see. Um, I do appreciate all the work being done at the Coral Street campus, uh, but I'm a little apprehensive about some of um, having so many things on one site. And specifically, I was thinking throughout the presentation, like um, having you know families living amongst people recovering from hospitals, and then in addition, adding in the uh, the permanent supportive housing. I just wonder if, like you said, having so many people at one site will make it less of a community for certain groups or isolate certain groups. And so then I started thinking, and I, was, I know you were talking about the pallet shelters, but I have a question, and I, and I don't expect you to answer it tonight, but I know when my husband goes on strike teams with the fire department, they sleep in, like, these sleeping trailers that hold, like, up to a dozen people and have a little bathroom and a washer and dryer, and you can move them around. They're, like, the size of a, a semi-trailer. And so it wouldn't necessarily, I don't know how much they cost in relation to a pallet shelter, but I was just wondering if maybe you could look into that as a possibility. 
Yes, certainly. There's there's a number of different um, shelters, sleeping cabins, tiny homes. There's um, there's all all kinds of products on the market these days at various costs with various features. And so, yes, yeah, certainly we're we're looking at multiple pallet shelter is one type, and it's one that's familiar um, to describe kind of what that is. But um, we're looking at other ones, and there's different features in terms of particularly in small spaces. Uh, and uh, significantly is sort of the fire rating of some of the, the units. And that requires, uh, if they don't, if they might be more inexpensive, but don't have the same kind of fire rating, it means then you have to space them further apart. So you can't get as many units in a space, but then um, higher quality units with better fire ratings are much more expensive. Um, you know, so those are the trade-offs, but there's a variety of products and we're working and doing research on, on some different products to fit what, what the needs are. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking, because those are so mobile, you could put it real, really anywhere at any time. And um, my, own, my other question is re in regard to the housing choice vouchers. When you're helping people get those, do you also help them with, um, and this might be a stupid question, but what got them into homelessness in the first place? Like, help them not repeat that cycle? And with like credit repair and like getting their bank accounts and their identification and all that kind of stuff, so that when they when they have that voucher and they're out there competing against like other people in the really competitive rental market, that they're successful and able to get that housing. Yes, certainly. In, in in good quality case management, trying to understand kind of the genesis of what brought people to their current situation and how that might identify, you know, a work plan moving forward is it's integral to case management. Um, not speaking about any particular case, but just generally, you know, a lot, some of the research shows that it's often some small, relatively speaking event that tips somebody um, over the edge from having stable housing to homelessness. It's a medical issue, loss of employment, these kind of one-time things that then uh, because there isn't an effective safety net um, allows people to continue to uh, you know, have um, a unhoused situation. And so, you know, ideally, if we could figure out how to get in front of those and make those more preventative focused, I don't mean us as a city, but just collectively society, we could find the right moment with the right intervention uh, with each person. It would be a lot cheaper to work on these because a lot of these are just there are events that uh, many of us experience in our families and just some families don't have the resources and support systems around them to be able to uh, work through those bumps and as a result they become homelessness, homeless. So um, yeah, un understanding and uncovering those and helping people circumvent them, that's, that's core to case, good case management. And then my final question slash request is when you're out there and everyone's out there, you know, boots on the ground and there's kids out there, can you please make sure that those kids are in school? That there's personal accountability to the parents that the kids are in school? Because if they want to get out of generational poverty, if we're not ensuring that the kids are in school, how can we you know, expect that to happen? Yeah. Partnering with the schools, that's it, my last thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Golder. I had a couple of questions, and thank you, uh, Larry, for answering some questions prior. Um, so one thing that has come up, and um, I just kind of want to get clarity in explaining what um, a hygiene bay is, and you know it's really um, explained in terms of new flooring and new um, moisture barrier that's all laid out here but it doesn't really define what the hygiene bay consists of and um, is there only one these are some of the questions that have come up so thank you for that question so fundamentally in the hygiene bay is really it is a showering and restroom facility um, on the campus for for a multi-person use i think um, I apologize, I might be off the numbers, but I think uh, the plans for this include 12 shower stalls uh, and a number of, of, of toilets. Um, but uh, in addition to that, though, you know, the remodel is working on the entire building. Um, and uh, so it's also 
um, going to require significant, you know, HVAC, um, you know, for heating and cooling and moisture movement so that um, you don't have uh, kind of the, the uh, impact on the building and the degradation of the building related to all the moisture that was in the old uh, hygiene bay. So uh, the focus is on the hygiene Gene Bay and rebuilding that, but there's a lot of infrastructure to the building and shoring up the building that is part of that process. Um, and again, those services are integral to around thinking of the number of people that are sheltered on that campus, the day use uh, of services that they have there and having that facility available uh, to, uh, to improve the quality of life for persons experiencing homelessness is, is uh, essential. Thank you. Um, that was also my next question follow up with that is that is it a shared so it's a facility with showers and toilets and it's shared amongst the entire housing matters campus not specific to one community there larry it's yes uh, um we actually had a, an agenda report in february of this year so um, and it was for the public works request for proposal release. And according to that report, it prior to being shut down served about 100 people daily before its closure. And as Larry talked about, it is a full on restoration of not just the showers and the toilets and sinks, um, but it also includes upgrades to the ventilation system and the existing building facility and then the um, moisture barriers, the air conditioning, et cetera. We've got a full agenda report related to that. Mayor, if, if we can also forward that on to you to pass on if you'd like. Thank you. You're welcome. The next question um, is, it, what what are the facilities at the armory in terms of showers and toilets and hygiene bay? So for for the program that we're starting, there will be a shower trailer um, that is available, um, and then we'll be having portable toilets and hand washing stations up there. Um, there is uh, some within the armory building, which we will not have access to immediately. That would be after the county program closes. There are, um, there are restroom uh, facilities and a shower, although it's a shared shower um, that kind of limits use. So um, while the county has been operating the program, they've done it similarly where they've had a uh, shower trailer with multiple shower stalls and portable toilets uh, and restroom facilities up there as well. So that's the infrastructure that we'll have uh, for our program. And uh, the safe parking sites and gray water dumping, what's the progress on that? Yeah, so similarly at all, um, any and all uh, safe parking locations that the city operates, there will be restrooms and hand washing stations. There will be refuse containers uh, for garbage. Um, and uh, we are working in the process of looking at how we can support um, safe dumping of RV gray and black water tanks. And it may be through a combination initially um, the plan for the tier three program is to, to work with at least initially United Site Services that services the porta potties to see if they can do that as well. We're also looking at other mobile operators that can go to the sites periodically and, um, and provide dump services. Uh, and then we're also looking as part of the plan about trying to find a location to establish a dedicated uh, dump station in the city that people could utilize, independent of being part of a safe parking program. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the update on shelters across the county progress? And, um, you know, I know you spoke a lot of um, the collaboration and efforts um, working together, the city, um, and the county working to provide services and some of the programs, the behavioral health, 
the mental health liaisons. Um, but I know there was early on with this plan kind of a collective effort. A lot of our unhoused folks come from across the county and there was um, kind of a look at identifying uh, countywide sites and working together to establish some of those smaller um, shelter sites and uh, again around that 30 people range to have the most effective uh, <coughs> outcomes for people and so I was just wondering if there was continued progress in that area. Yes, yeah, so uh, I don't have an updated uh, shelter capacity number from tonight from the last report, but I can uh, contact our partners at the county to get an updated number. Uh, but to the other part of your question, yes, we continue to be in conversation collaboratively about trying to work towards, you know, the countywide goal is to have 600 uh, shelter spaces. And so when we have our collaborative meetings, uh, we talk about sites, locations, programs, funding. Uh, so we're actively working on that. I think a good example is the county um, partnering to support expansion at Coral Street is one example. They're continuing as they're um, winding down their program at the Armory and looking at, again at other shelter options through master leasing. So um, they're active efforts, and again, we're sharing information um, to be able to work towards that end. Thank you. And developing a housing plan for everyone in the Benchlands, that That's is an amazing, goal. amazing goal. Um, and has that's it sounded like that started now slowly. Um, that process and um, the county, it, it, I'm just clarifying that the county will have a uh, case manager set up there um, at the Benchlands to um, make those connections and services and reach each person there. Um, is that correct? Correct. That is the goal. That's where we have not started that phase formally yet. You know, we're we're talking with the county and pulling together the different um, programs that are doing outreach work there. Um, it's it's happening, I guess, in a little less coordinated way right now. So you, we do have outreach that's going on there, but we haven't come together specifically around this goal of having you know a rehousing plan for everybody. That's in the works. We're bringing people together to plan that. You're right. Uh, we've t we are working with the county to be able to place a mobile office unit there for okay. the outreach staff across multiple programs to be able to do that work. Um, as well as the first phase um, is, you know, our our city outreach staff has uh, has had a list and has worked on a list of potential participants for the city armory program for months now. And so we're going to be implementing that. And so that'll be there for 75 people. That will be their initial rehousing plan is, is moving from bench lands up to the armory. So pieces of that are already under the way. And uh, we're working uh, with the county to be able to do that in a more coordinated and intensive effort over the next two months. Thank you. That concludes my questions uh, at this time. I will bring it out to the public for public comment. Let me pull it back here. So if you're interested in commenting on agenda item number 31, if you could remain over in line, please, sir. Oh. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. If you are interested in commenting on agenda item number 31, homelessness response quarterly update, um, now is the time to call in. Using the instructions on your screen or in the agenda, the order of, um, you can press star nine on your phone or select the raise hand feature on the webinar controls of your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. Members of the public who are joining us here in person, 
in the chambers, please line up on the right side of the dais. You will also have two minutes to speak, and we ask that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name. However, it is not required. And again, I have approved for extra time. Four minutes for Huff. Robert Norris, I'd like to begin with you. Welcome. Members of the community and council. Um, the big issues here, as raised by Mayor Brunner, are in fact the real issue of how many people are homeless in Santa Cruz city area and how are they being treated at the moment? How are they likely to be treated in the next year, given all these new resources which are supposedly available? Now, when I hear the kind of I don't want to call it gobbledygook, but it's sort of abstract talk and uh, possible things that may soon be happening. And we're working and planning on this. And indeed, uh, as Councilmember Myers has pointed out, uh, there may be, again, what, 160 beds available for 1,000 to 1,500 people. And the real issue is m my concern as a member of this homeless civil rights group is, what about the majority of these folks? Not so much do I expect this council to provide shelter and services for everybody, but I expect them not to be dumping their money into the pockets of consultants and legislative analysts and more fund grabbers that don't really produce services for the majority of the people in this county. And the idiotic and, I think, misleading claim that you are looking for a pathway to housing when the housing does not currently exist is very misleading and deceptive and tiresome to hear from the, the city council. But, I mean, my purpose is not so much to berate the council. I know that's going to be what you're continuing to talk about, all the affordable housing that isn't really affordable and all the shelter that isn't really available for most people in this county, and all the money going into enforcement that really is what this is all about. You are trying to find a way to enforce the OVO and the CSSO ordinances. At least the OVO, uh, although I don't see that you actually passed this where it said you're not going to enforce it until the Coastal Commission reverses its 2016 decision, but the CSSO uh, has no such provision here once there is affordable shelter or whether it's once there is uh, shelter that you have certified. And you've declared the bench lands, or at least your, your go-to guy, the city manager, has declared the bench lands to be that shelter. And yet at the same time, as I pointed out at the last council meeting, this is about to be dispersed in July. Oh, I know, it's, it's flexible. Well, that's very nice, but that's not much comfort to the people either living in the benchlands who can't make their any plans about what they're doing. Remember, people do independently try to get other resources and other housing. They really do, believe it or not. They don't really love being in the benchlands. That's not what people like. And the notion that you're helping 150 people and how wonderful that is, it's not wonderful considering the massive resources that you've had over the last five to ten years. It just isn't. And people who are watching this know, the grand jury knows it, uh, I think and particularly homeless people know it. And I realize that when you're in an insulated position like this council is, you don't really feel it except in the most abstract way. And that leaves the community to have to take the action here. And as usual, I hope that we will as we did in the winter of 2020 when we stopped your old city manager from disrupting the lives and stealing the homes of the people in the bench lands. But it's really hard to tell. Maybe, you're, maybe things will go uh, like they were that then, maybe they won't. And I, if I weren't so tired, I would have perhaps given a better presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I will now go out to our virtual hands raised and 
Uh, let's see, our first name is Serge Cagno. Welcome, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, uh, the city council. Thanks for uh, giving me time to speak. Um, I wanna very much uh, show my appreciation to Larry and Wally and the very uh, informative presentation. Um, I'm hopeful that the services um, will continue to make a change uh, for Santa Cruz. Um, as we are currently in Mental Health Awareness Month, and as I'm a member of the county's Mental Health Advisory Board, I have a few comments and three questions. Um, first, I think forcing people into shelter is not necessary to fill our shelters. Designing our programs to be more welcoming and more appealing from the participants' perspective is the missing piece in these discussions. What I don't hear mentioned is trauma-informed care. Designing care from the perspective and behavioral health needs of the participants. In the participant agreement for the Tier 2 sleep, Safe Sleeping Site, and I suspect in the 12, 20 encampment site, participants must agree that they have no expectations of safety. I'm confused on how we're expecting our city programs to be appealing if we make no promises of safety. I have a question. Um, it, for the shelters and the safe sleeping sites, how would enforcement of the CSO and the possible enforcement of the OVO affect those people in city shelter programs who get kicked out for behavioral health issues or leaving voluntarily due to anxiety or other behavioral health issues? Since there's not housing for the thousand plus people experiencing homelessness in the city of Santa Cruz, and many do not qualify for housing vouchers or have a means to pay for housing, what happens to, sh to those participants at their end of their limited stay um, with regards to enforcement of those ordinances. Those are my questions. Uh, I'll say one last comment. Uh, Larry referred to a sober living shelter. Um, I'm confused about that. I don't know if Larry is misinformed or um, trying to label it as shelter. That sober uh, program is just about people who are getting arrested. It is not a shelter at all. So thank you for your time. Um, and I hope that we continue to support people with behavioral health needs. Have a good night. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public, I will invite forward here in person. Welcome. Thank you, my name is James. First, I wanna thank Serge because although I have eight things on my list, number six has to do with an accept a grant allocation that the county passed today. So instead of um, law enforcement engaging with every issue that goes on in this county, they've allocated 7.5 million for alternative sources. I think that's excellent. Uh, hmm. There are a few places where brevity is more important, is less important than foreplay. Um, it was a lot of talking, wow. Uh, free minor to William Shakespeare, much to do about nothing. So if there's $14 million that has been advocated, 2.3 million apparently has already been spent. It'd be interesting to see what that stuff was spent on. Um, and there are, it seems like there's a bunch of housing for people with vehicles. That's really promising. Now, I too took a walk. Um, through the bench lands and wow, there's at least 370 tents there. Uh, there's no telling how many people. It seems from the numbers I have heard, maybe there's accommodations for 180. But they're like 1,800 homeless people in this county. What is gonna go on? Um, I wanna thank Danny Brown for bringing up some good observations and Justin Cummins for bringing up some good observations. There were a lot of good observations, particularly about fire safety. You know, I spoke in the county, not so much here, about those directed energy weapons. My comment is going to be there are frequencies that literally put out fires. But what's going on on planet Earth? There are fires everywhere. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next. Uh member of the public is uh, in our virtual attendee room. Reggie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi there. Great. Hi. Um, I'm going to kind of like make a narrow comment here. Um, as I've noted in past meetings, the oversized vehicle ordinance is not really a safe parking bill, despite how it's advertised. It's a bill to criminalize folks living in vehicles. Safe parking is not even defined in the ordinance. Only one subsection of OVO even talks about the establishment of safe parking. And it simply states that the city manager is given authority to operate, support, or authorize sites. Um, but this is something they were already able to do, which was admitted in the drafting session of OVO, where uh, there was discussion about safe parking sites at the police station, safe parking sites being supported by our city at AFC, um, and safe parking sites being authorized on uh, commercial lots. So why am I bringing this point up again tonight? Well, I just heard Larry Mwale admit that the city is making progress on developing safe parking sites despite the implementation of OVO being delayed because of the Santa Cruz CARES appeal. So I think this is a really important thing for the public to hear. OVO is not a safe parking bill. It is not stopping safe parking. It is not delaying safe parking. Safe parking is 100% moving forward. And it's uh, in all the ways that the city manager wants because it already was able to do that. Um, and I want to make another note because it's very concerning to me that what I just admitted that OVO is not a safe parking bill. Um, in the info to voters sent out by the city about measure F, I want to say it is the sales tax. Um, they note that there is a ordinance that was passed that is a safe parking bill. They are referring to OVO and that is untrue. And I think it is very disturbing for the city to release propaganda which is just provably false. So Your I would like that to at... be corrected. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know if you heard the, ti the timer. Okay, our next person is in person. Please welcome to the front. Thank you very much. Um, council members and Larry and Lee, I first of all just want to say I really appreciate your efforts to address this really difficult problem in within the realm of capitalism. And um, I really sincerely mean that. Um, it's it's really tough, and I can see the work you've put into it, and it's, it's deep and profound um, and very complex. I just really sincerely want you to know that, because now I am going to completely <laughs> criticize this. And I just want to say, from the perspective of somebody who was a domestic violence victim and um, had to become homeless because I was so incredibly harmed by mental health uh, professionals, um, that I decided to take my investigation into homelessness very seriously from a firsthand perspective. And so I have been in the River Street Shelter. I wanted to see how hard it was to walk around all night looking possibly for one tree or bush where you could sleep under it and maybe get away with it without getting harmed. There were none in Berkeley where I could do that. And so I would walk around all night. I could go on and on, but I'm also somebody who is trained in the mental health profession. I'm just gonna leave it at that. What we need in this city and in cities all around the country, first of all, is a continuity person because it's ridiculous that politicians come into these um, bodies like our city council and um, and I am saying you're well-meaning but you are politicians that's what you are you are city servants maybe so it's ridiculous that we have politicians come in who go out and then we're asking the same questions over and over decade after decade the HMIS system does not work for many homeless people because people are very suspicious so what we need to do is to count the number of beds in actuality. I want simple presentations that tell us how many beds and where, because we need to make sure that the people at the bench lands who have a city, who have a home, who have a place to live, can go to those beds. And if Thank they you. cannot, we up. will protest, we will demand
Thank you. Good night. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next caller is in our virtual attendee list. The name I am watching you. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. As regard your homeless response update, it seems to assume incorrectly that Santa Cruz has a perfectly normal size perpetual homeless condition, the solution to which is a larger and expensive perpetual welfare just here in the city in the form of emergency shelters, parking areas for live-in RVs, and lots and lots of perpetual staff expense. I see nowhere an actual stated numerical goal of a reduction in homelessness and dependence with yearly measurable metrics that we can then judge the worthiness of such expenses and effort to return to something like approaching a California average homelessness. It just seems like a bigger, more expensive government welfare program with no end game. You seem to be embarking on a pure welfare commitment with without full funding or even a guess at future funding expenses or sources. I note the footnote on the two a footnote on the two year and three year plan blank HRP plan quote funding will need to come from general fund new revenue sources or reductions to other services end quote no one would lease a new car without some idea of how to pay for it besides the down payment only an unscrupulous car dealer would allow someone to sign such an agreement apparently you just forgot to mention what those other reduced services might look like as they become a lower non-priority than this new welfare system Welfare is a tricky business, largely the responsibility of the federal, state, government, and charity. People can be just as trapped in the welfare state, not daring to dig themselves out of it for fear of lost benefits, even if we're quite capable of doing so. Such is the fate of millions of people. You wouldn't hold up the citizens of Santa Cruz to blow the whole 14 million in one year and mandate funding of future programs for astronomic numbers of homelessness here by threatening the loss of taxpayer services or else, would you? Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Be we, let's see, are there any other members of the public here in person that have not spoken? Okay. Are you, are you, Okay, great, come forward please, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, I'm going to be uh, reading this because I it's that way. And um, when, I, when I heard about having a community relations specialist, I thought what an opportunity that is to change the narrative we have about people who are houseless. This is in the wrong place, huh? There we go. Better? We need to change the current narrative because we have t othered homeless people. They have, we tend to believe they are not like us. We're different. So we can choose the ones who deserve help and the ones who do not deserve help. And we don't have to feel bad because they got there because of something they did wrong, an individual failure. Houselessness is seen in this country as an individual failure, but it is not. It is a failure of our economy, our structure, our financialization of land and of homes, our housing crisis. And we have got to change that for the public because the fact that most of the mistreatment and the, and the hate and despising that goes on in the public for houseless people is because of that belief, the misplacement of blame. Um, so I hope that I want to encourage this community relations specialist to focus on that because it is an opportunity to change how we see the members of, well, our other residents who live without homes. Um, and I know as a renter here, 
of 22 years, I know how uncertain my future is and how unstable it is. And I know I am just like them. And they are like us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public for comment is virtual hand raised Darius Mosman. I, uh, I, I, I too agree with Justin and the concern for just the uh, bench lands uh, at the height of just at the height of really the beginning of fire season. Uh, it's we know from his we know from past experience these folks will wander back into the Hell's Trail, Pogonips, you know, high <clears throat> uh, fuel areas. I would personally I would like to see somehow that the bench lands stay together. I go I've been there probably four or five times. I've spoken to people, I've seen it's yeah, the conditions are abhorrent. There's a lot of lot to be <laughs> a lot wrong with it. But you have, uh, you know, close to 300 homeless folks that have been spread out through the community, spread out into these fire-prone areas, all in one spot. It's not visible. It doesn't have the, the blight that Ross Camp did. It's, you know, below grade, so to speak. You've got two full-time folks there, Jeremy Leonard, Chris uh, Monteith, I believe, that have, been, have basically become the corporate knowledge for Santa Cruz City's homeless after uh, how many months of working there and getting to know everybody. Uh, on the other hand, I appreciate the comment Larry made about groups of 20 to 30 being kind of the ideal sort of size for uh, managing encampments. I've seen that model in Eugene, Seattle. I've seen other spots uh, up and down the West Coast. I don't know if there's some way to break the camp up, if you will, into different you know, micro encampments, like we had Brent Adams do with his agreement camp at one point. Um, I would, I, I think that the public actually benefits from the camp all in one spot. I think, I believe uh, crime is down. Some petty thefts and other kind of crime in the city and elsewhere is down. It's all, unfortunately, uh, it becomes homeless on homeless crime in the bench lands. But, uh, you know, that's the nature of the beast, perhaps more policing, more, uh, more folks like Jeremy and Chris uh, at, uh, with Your different shifts. Your time is up. I don't know Thank if you heard the timer. Thank no, you. Thanks. Let's see. Our next attendee is Colin User 3. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome. Hi, my name is Marilyn Garrett. I'm a retired teacher, and I used to have a bumper sticker that said, it will be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. The point is, over half our tax dollars, or approximately that, go to the military budget. And we've just seen huge billions of dollars going to the Ukraine and uh, all these wars, forever wars. What we could do with that money, not only for school, but provide housing and parks and libraries and you name it. It is a problem of capitalism. I have an image here in front of me. I wish you could see it. It shows a medical person in his white shirt taking notes. And it says, feeling sad and depressed. Are you anxious, worried about the future, feeling isolated and alone? You might be suffering from capitalism. Symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of powerlessness, fear, apathy, and the list goes on. Loss of free speech, incarceration, suicidal or revolutionary thoughts, death. Another, and, and 
people commenting on uh, mental health services. I have a friend who was picked up on a wellness check, so called by sheriff deputies, four of them, who grabbed her out of her home. She's 66, injected her, took her off, held her for days against her will. She was harming no one, but they were harming her. And so when I hear about mental health services, I Your time is have up. questions. So um, I think, yeah, we need a different structure of a system that provides for the well-being of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Let's see if there are any other hands. It looks like that concludes our comment from public comment period. I will now bring it back to council for action and deliberation. We have um, a recommended motion. Let me pull up my notes. And council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I did want to make a motion. I had um, some comments, but I'll go ahead and make the motion first. Um, and that is to move, um, is here, move staff recommendation to receive updates regarding council directed homelessness response programs and services, including council requested homelessness response action plan implementation details, objectives, and outcomes. And Second part, adopt resolution amending the classification and compensation plans by administratively implementing staffing to support the city's new homelessness response action plan and appropriate funds, appropriate funds for the positions from the state of California, 14 million in the general fund. And then I've added a third piece to the, to the recommendation and that is to authorize, oh, excuse me, no, the third piece is there, authorize staff to pursue purchasing option and appropriate funds for the services identifying the expenditure plan for the state of California, 14 million, including county mental health liaison, land and resource management services, legislative advocacy, planning and proposal development, and vehicle abatement, and return to council as needed consistent with standard purchasing procedures. I've added a fourth component, and I forgot to email it to you, Bonnie, but I'll read it and then I'll email it to you. Um, request that the mayor submit a letter on behalf of the full council to the county reiterating the need for transitional facilities, bridge housing, including safe parking across our county. Prioritization, a prioritization of county funds for these purposes and the need for us to continue to work together to address the continuum of housing, address the continuum of housing needs in our community. I'll go ahead and email that to you. Um, so that that so it's staff's re recommendation with that last piece of the mayor writing a letter to the county. Okay, so we have a Second. motion uh, by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. The staff recommend recommended three part motion with a fourth uh, part added, and that will come shortly. We have a second by Council Member Myers. And now we can have discussion. Great. So I just had um, a few comments and I'll, and I'll keep it brief. I, I wanna thank people who showed up tonight here in person and folks who stayed on the line and um, provided public comment. This is a really important issue and clearly our community really cares and is invested in us moving forward. Uh, we've heard tonight from Mr. Mwale that we've made some great strides and we do have reason to celebrate. You know, the establishment of comprehensive data collection and data sharing mechanisms across our jurisdictions, that's a really big deal. We've been working towards that for a long time. Um, HMIS is not perfect, absolutely, and it doesn't work for everybody, I know that. And we're making some incremental steps towards data sharing and, and using information so that we can get folks housed. 
um, we are stronger in our connection to the county. Our city counter partnership has not been this strong in a long time. We're on the state's radar. They gave the 14 and a half million. They're watching us, and there's real opportunity for us to receive additional resources. We're standing up more supports for this population than we have really in the history of our city or in recent history, not counting COVID, year 2020, when state mandated that we stand up shelter in place sites. And as Council Member Myers stated, this has resulted in people moving into stable shelter, people attaining housing vouchers, um, getting substance abuse treatment, getting mental health supports, uh, support, obtaining employment, and, and ultimately stability and health. That's, that's what we are trying to achieve as a community. Um, so I know a lot of work remains to be done. This is a drop in the bucket. Uh, this won't cover even a, a quarter of, of the population that we need to serve. And we need to think bigger than our city. Um, like I said, we have really strong partnerships right now with our county. Let's continue to work on that. The county has expressed, not expressed, the county is committed in their strategic plan that they will also provide bridge housing. Um, they've expressed interest in helping with a safe parking. So let's pursue that. Let's think beyond our small city with big city problems and think not only countywide but regionally, what can we do to bring in additional resources, lever our, leverage our resources, and provide these supports um, throughout the jurisdictions throughout our county. So I think I'll just keep my comments to that. I want to just thank again Mr. Mwale, um, Lee Butler, and all of the departments. This takes work across our departments, all the departments and all the staff and all the organizations in the community who have so far worked with us and are partnering with us. A lot of work to be done, so I hope this partnership will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other council member um, comments or discussion before we have a motion on the table? Council member Cummings. I just want to, <clears throat> I'm wondering if we could first see the language because I just want to, you know, and I think it's for the public to be clear what this additional motion language was. Because um, I might have a friendly amendment to it, but I'd like to see it. So, um, but in the meantime, I will make a comment where <clears throat> I just want to thank um, the staff, and not just the staff who's been working on this, but all the staff that's been working on this over the many, many years when, that we've been trying to address this issue. Um, before I got on the council back in 2018, um, in December of 2018, um, I know that back then. There have been efforts where they first stood up 1220 River Street as a shelter model. And it's been the attempts at this safe parking programs that have been implemented historically by the AFC throughout our community that we've been able to, and other types of shelter programs, including um, winter shelter warming centers, that you know we've been able to demonstrate to the community uh, what is effective and what we can do that has minimal impacts on our community and what is needed uh, in order to make sure that we have um, homeless services uh, that have minimum minimal negative impacts on the community. Um, so I want to thank all the folks who have put in the hard work to make these services happen and to help us demonstrate that um, you know we are able to stand up services <clears throat> that um, have positive outcomes. Um, along with that, uh, I just think that, you know, as we're making the decision tonight, this is a very um, big decision that we're making. Uh, it's, you know, I think one of the things that's prevented us from being so effective and being able to stand up services in the past is not having funding. And I think that, um, you know, we have a lot of positions that we're funding this evening that we don't have long-term funding for, and my hope is that these positions, some of these advocate positions that we're funding um, will allow us to seek more funds and that moving forward, if these programs are effective, we'll be able to demonstrate to the state the need for more money to invest in these programs. And so um, I'm cautiously optimistic, but, I, but based on our ability to be effective in the past, um, I'm hopeful that we will be able to um, stand up these programs and demonstrate effectiveness moving forward. 
And I will say that, you know, the one thing that also has, you know, resulted in us being where, we're, where we are today is the fact that, you know, Martin versus Boise really made um, our city and many other communities start to really have to take a serious look at um, addressing homelessness. I mean, before this, there were lots of laws in place that just pushed people around. And what that law did was say that you can't just do that anymore. You have to provide beds. You have to provide services. You have to take care of people and co you know, commit to that and do so adequately before you can start criminalizing people for being homeless. And so I think that's also been a big contributor to helping us get to where we are today. And my hope is that the state, county, our local government and federal government will continue to do what it can to not only alleviate getting people off the street, but keeping people in their homes and making sure that we're providing housing and jobs to where people can actually stay in their homes. And so um, the fourth one, transition facilities. I don't have any further comments and uh, just want to um, also ask that um, if we can get an update, and maybe this is to the city manager, but I'd also like to see if we can get an update on um, you know, the funding and progress of the Coral Street, the 121 beds, because if they're continuing to apply for housing or for funding and um, you know, if they're not able to get that funding, it would be good for us to kind of know what progress they're making and what opportunities there are for the city to help step in if necessary, because what's gonna make us really effective at this is getting those beds online and other beds online as well. And so, and I guess the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, as we're moving through this process, I think it would be great if staff could, you know, document when possible and when there's consent the stories of some of these people and document, you know, how these um, different types of uh, sheltering models work because part of what makes us effective is being able to demonstrate to community members what works, especially when we're going to stand up new shelter. That's what was helpful when we stood up the armory and when we met with community members in Prospect Heights back in 2020. And I believe that that's what will make us effective at being able to stand up shelter more shelters, and especially some of these smaller ones as we move forward. So I just want to thank everybody for the hard work on this, and um, we'll see how it all goes. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I just noticed a typo and emailed Bonnie. It shouldn't say country. It should say county, although it, we, it would be good for us to stand <laughs> it up throughout the country, but it should say county. <laughs> Across our country, safe parking across our country should say safe parking across our county. The oh, the oh, added the bullet, one. the new direct the mayor to submit a letter on behalf, yeah. I mean, we can send a letter to Panetta as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so thank you again to our staff for this presentation and update. Um, there were a lot of pieces. I really encourage everyone to dive into the full agenda uh, with all the information and numbers that were presented to us. And again, I, I, I believe those updates will all be uploaded to the city website as well as available here at City Hall for those that would like to access some of the information. Um, city staff is also available to answer any further questions. Um, and really want to uh, thank the, the collaboration is huge for the city and the county as many of us uh, you know, brought up because the county is where our health department lies, where our behavioral health department lies, where our human services department lies, where our housing for health department lies. And as a city, as a municipality, we are small but mightily treading forward with great, great efforts to really put infrastructure in place, getting us to work more efficiently to help folks. 
um, and continuing to move forward to support our community, to support those that are unhoused, to support our environmental impacts, to support our neighborhoods, to support everybody um, that's affected by this uh, housing crisis. And I'm really hopeful over the next three years with um, the amount of low income and um, uh, very low income and affordable housing online and housing vouchers in the pipeline. Um, we're slowly making steps towards what we can progress as a city, as a municipality. So thank you for all the updates. And um, I'd like to ask the clerk to please uh, call roll on the motion, please. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brenner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here in person with us. And those of you who joined us via the virtual world, um, we will return May 24th. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned.